Okay, everyone, welcome to the um, April 21st, 2023 meeting of the California State Bar Committee of Bar Examiners. My name is Paul Kramer. I'm this year's chair of the committee. Um, the first thing we'll do before we take public comment is take the roll. Devin? Dr. Bolton? Robert Brody? Here. Dr. Cow? Here. Alex Chan? Present. Jim Efteen? Absent. Kareem Gangora? Absent. Judge Guerra? Here. Dolores Heisinger? Here. Larry Kaplan? Here. Paul Kramer? Here. Alex Lawrence? Here. Esther Lynn? Absent. Bethany Peake? Absent. Ashley Silva Guzman? Here. Vince Reyes? Here. David Torres? Absent. Dr. Wilcoxon? Absent. Um, and back to Dr. Bolton. Here. Did you hear me? Yes, thank you. And Kareem Gungor is here, present. Thank you, Kareem. Uh, we have a quorum. Okay, and I think uh, Mr. Torres will be with us in a little while. He had a 8.30 court appearance. Um, with that, um, before we take public comment, um, let me note that uh, for those of you who are viewing this meeting via Zoom, closed captioning of the video feed is available. Uh, to view those, hover your mouse over the lower part of your screen where the Zoom toolbar is located, and there you'll see a section or a button labeled CC. Select that option and then uh, select show subtitles on the pop-up menu. Uh, for those of you who don't need closed captions, I recommend leaving them off because they do cover a good part of the screen. And as we're projecting uh, documents and uh, charts, um, they, they are more difficult to see um, if you have the captions on. If you're still having technical difficulties, please don't hesitate to contact State Bar staff for further assistance. If um, somewhere after today you're viewing this meeting recording, um, the YouTube player has a similar function to turn captions on and off. Uh, the Board of Trustees has adopted a public comment policy, which applies to all bar committees, including this one. Its policy statement says the State Bar of California welcomes public comment at all of its public meetings and appreciates listening to a wide range of viewpoints that reflect the diversity of California. These public comment rules are designed to ensure that members of the public may exercise their right to be heard, as well as ensure that the State Bar is able to fulfill its obligation to conduct business on behalf of the people of California in a timely fashion. Written public comments uh, may be submitted to the email address on the meeting agenda. We encourage you to submit written public comments at least 24 hours prior to the start of our meeting. Comments received less than 24 hours prior to the start will be distributed uh, the following business day, which would be Monday in this our case here. Um, for oral public comment, persons were encouraged to sign up to speak in advance of the meeting and will be called in the order that they signed up. Uh, persons attending the meeting today remotely will be called in the order that they appear in the Zoom attendee list. Uh, speakers cannot cede their time to another speaker and it is not guaranteed that all who wish to speak will be able to do so. To facilitate hearing from as many persons as possible, we encourage you not to repeat points that were made by previous speakers, but simply say that you agree with them. To allow the committee time, uh, the time needed to deliberate on the important topics we will be discussing today, we will be limiting comments to three minutes per person. Law school deans or a designated school representative may choose to speak at the time their items are heard by the committee following staff's presentation for up to five minutes. 
Others who wish to speak in support of a school must make their comments during this public comment window that we are about to open. If you're on Zoom and want to speak to make a comment, you need to raise your hand unless you're already on the sign up list. To do so, click on the hand icon icon at the bottom center of your Zoom window. If you are participating by telephone, you may virtually raise your hand by pressing star nine. That's the star key and then the number nine. And you would do the same thing to unraise your hand. Um, our coordinator will call minute members of the public, starting with the pre-meeting signups, then the Zoom list in the order that they signed up or raised their hands. Staff will enable the microphone of the speaker and start our on-screen timer when you begin to speak. If you cannot see the timer and want us to tell you when you have 30 seconds remaining, please let us know when you begin speaking. Uh, I understand we do have some people wishing to make a comment, so I'll turn it over to uh, Devin to uh, call upon them. Our first public comment will be from Benjamin Cohn. Hello, thank you. I wanted to continue with the comment from last meeting where I didn't get to all of my concerns with the proposal you're advancing on the testing accommodations rules revision. I left off mostly with uh, my concerns about the absence of the two week processing time limit for staff to respond to the initial decisions of the petition, but I think there were also some misunderstandings about suggestions on the deadlines to appeal and a couple other things. The deadlines to appeal uh, are actually in two parts under the current rules and still in the proposal there is a hard deadline that doesn't where it doesn't matter when the decision was made and then there's a number of days after the decision uh, and the way it, it seems to operate is it's a sooner of so the working group said 30 days would not be feasible for a uh, instead of 10 days, even if the State Bar made its decision within two weeks, because that could lead to appeal deadlines after the next exam cycle, uh, it, it, even if for a timely submitted uh, petition. Uh, but that sort of skates over the sooner of first business day of the month of the exam deadline. So all this would do to make it 30 days is that, the applicants who apply sufficiently early, say at least 44 days before uh, the uh, filing deadline uh, would have a full 30 days once they get their decision to gather responsive documentation from their doctors, uh, confer with legal counsel and all of those things. Cause this is not a notice of appeal like courts usually have you start with the deadline. Uh, this is a completed appeal submission. Uh, it, so if, if there was enough time, there wouldn't be some artificial constraint uh, uh, saying 10 days, uh, even if 10 days is a lot sooner than the first business day of the month, uh, that would, that artificial constraint would be limited to 30 days. And that uh, I think was the intent of the comment and 14 days instead of 10 days is really not enough. If it, it, it should be 30 days if the applicant applies soon enough to get a decision in time. That also depends on the two week processing time uh, that they, that applying 44 days would get you a decision at least 30 days before, but that would all work together that way. The other concern I have is that even your forms uh, are not reflecting the best insurance level playing field standard. Now a doctor to recommend an accommodation needs to attest to your exceptional needs standard uh, for the accommodations you've designated for exceptional need. And that is very inconsistent with best insurance level playing field. Um, Mr. Cohn, I would encourage you to remake those comments in writing as a part of the public comment um, that is or will be solicited on the revised rules um, to make sure that it's considered. Our next public comment will be from Todd Hill. Good morning. Uh, thank you all for the opportunity to speak today. Uh, Can you increase your volume? 
Is that better? Yes. Hi, right, thank you very much, Mr. Kramer. I apologize. Good morning, my name's Todd Hill. And uh, I am uh, currently, unfortunately, engaged in a, a suit against the bar uh, related to uh, hopefully either the uh, grant of my degree or the uh, replacement of my education. In December 2022, the People's College of Law was placed on probation by the State Bar of California. And my argument is that in doing so, it subsumed, meaning that it took on the obligations of the school at that time. Uh, currently, it is April 21st, uh, almost six months that I've not had a class, uh, that I've not been able to uh, graduate. Uh, I applied for a, an exception under Rule 5.6. Uh, I believe that exception actually should have been granted because it's an unusual circumstances exemption allowed by every school for 10% of their population to basically for uh, really the way the rule is written for whatever reason. In this case, I will say that it, I believe it's uh, malfeasance uh, on the part of my school, of course, and state actors, uh, but that should be granted, but it wasn't. I was denied due process. And because of that, I've had to sue. When the state bar's mandate under section 6001.1 is protection of the public as the highest priority, no matter the public of interest, no matter the conflict of interest. And I ask, why should I have to sue the bar for it to meet its obligations? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have no additional public comment at this time. Okay, well, I want to thank those two gentlemen for their comments. Um, and we will uh, close public comment and move on to our next item, which is approval of the March 24 uh, public meeting minutes. Um, I noticed one thing. Um, you know, I haven't, I can't say that I've had a lot of time to review these, but um, uh, would it be better, um, let me ask the group, for us to put this off until the end of the day and give us a little time to review them perhaps? Uh, they were only posted uh, yesterday afternoon. Does anyone object to that? No objection. Do you have to take a motion for that or do you just reorganize the agenda? No, I'm just reorganizing the agenda by fiat. Okay. <laughs> Understood, Chair. I'm I'm all good with it. Okay. Um, so let's do that and you know, uh, take a quick look, um, maybe uh, committee chairs, especially to see if your items appear to be right. Um, I do have one change. Um, it's a minor change, but uh, we'll get to that later. So let's move on to the next item. I need a wider screen. Um, and it's pretty wide already. That's the chair's report. And I'll just note a few things. You know, one of the, one of the things I talked about in our uh, points of consensus, you know, when we were discussing what were our expectations were of the chair, and that was to kind of keep an eye out for other things that are going on out in the, the bigger world of the bar and, and perhaps even the, the big wide world itself, uh, just to note, uh, uh, for for your information, and I have three of those this time. Um, the proposed fee increases for admissions uh, services that we discussed at our March meeting, they are currently out for public comment. I think the comment period expires, I want to say approximately May 15. I may have that wrong, but um, uh, it's a relatively short comment period. Uh, they're presented in a different format than what we saw. Um, and as for many fees, two options, one that would balance the revenue and costs for the particular function, and another that somewhat closes the gap between revenue and costs. 
but does not uh, completely cover the costs. And, and that second option is recognized as, um, well, not being sustainable, I guess, is one way to describe it over you know, the long term. Um, if you want to look at those, if you go to the bar's homepage, there's a what's new box that's kind of in the lower third of that page. And it, it has a link to that, uh, that comment, um, uh, comment on the fees. Uh, next is to note that the Blue Ribbon Commission on the Future of the Bar Exam is meeting next week to consider public comments on its draft report and uh, presumably to finalize it to be submitted. I think it's gonna go to the Board of Trustees and then to the Supreme Court. Um, doesn't come back to us again. Um, and then finally, uh, there's a state auditor's report out um, uh, for which the Board of Trustees has said publicly that they, they agree with its its findings and recommendations. And, and of note in that, I haven't had a chance to read the whole thing because I kind of got busy in the last couple of days on other things, but um, it does recommend a relatively small increase to attorney dues, licensed attorney dues, um, to help um, rebuild the uh, general fund and make it stable. Um, as I said, I didn't have time to read the whole thing, but I, I do not think that they said anything about the admissions deficit. So. Uh, um, at least in that report, it doesn't appear that um, they're taking up the idea that we sort of kicked around last month, that maybe uh, the attorneys, as the licensed attorneys, could kick in a little bit money of money to help um, uh, with our budget. Um, so those are the um, the items that I noted to report to you. Um, we really can't discuss the merits, I don't think, but if if somebody has some questions or comments, uh, Audrey? Oh, I just want to make sure everyone knows that the public comment on the fee proposal closes on May 15th. And then what uh, the comments for the Blue Ribbon Commission, um, the meeting next week, they're posted in a dashboard on the agenda item. So if uh, folks wanna see, look through a dashboard of the comments, uh, we receive close to 900 comments on the report, um, 900 individuals making over 1400 comments. So uh, discrete individuals are around 900 and then some of them had multiple comments. So you could click through and look through that dashboard as well. Just wanted to add some color to what you were saying, Paul. Okay, did anyone have any questions about that? Okay, um, the next item is uh, under examinations. We're no longer using the, um, the descriptive format of numbering each item O for open, C for closed, and then uh, and then a number, um, which makes it, for me at least, a little more interesting in trying to organize these things as I download them. And um, But the first item is uh, Roman numeral 2A, revisions to the grading rules, adjustment to public comment period, um, and uh, to be presented by Robert Brody, uh, Dolores Heisinger, and Christina Dahl. Um, and I do have, just for your note, I had one suggest or a couple suggestions maybe since this came before me and I, I went and read it again um, about things we might want to uh, slightly tweak. Um, but uh, let one of you start, whoever's, whoever's gonna present it. So I am taking this one. Um, Dolores and Robbie were on the um, working group for the grading rules. This is actually a carryover. We talked about this as a committee uh, last um, meeting at March. Uh, this is just a request for the CBE to amend the public comment period. So last meeting in March, we asked for a 45 day comment period, public comment period. We are now asking for a 60 day public comment period um for the rules to be publicly posted and that will keep us on the same timeline as some of the other rules that are going uh to the board of trustees from the emissions department um does anyone have any comments about this or questions and if okay so i ended up reading this again because i was looking at the eligibility rules that we're going to talk about later and they had this rule 4.62. I'm going to share my screen here too, so we can look at the words. Um, 
Uh, let's see. Is that showing up? Yes. Okay. So here, uh, and is it big enough for people? Yes, it's huge. Yeah, that's oh, good. Okay, good, good. Now it's too oh. big. Oh, it's, sorry. It's fine. <laughs> Robbie, you're very fussy. Yeah. <laughs> um, so um, it occurred to me, so I saw this in the, um, the eligibility rules and it was the old version. And I said to myself, you know, at first I had to, I was vaguely remembered we had done something to this. And then, so I went and looked it up and realized at our last meeting, we had in fact done something. And then I re remember that it was on today's agenda again. So what I, um, Christina, I have, first I have a question for you. The, the reason that um, after 30 days, they, have, they can no longer download their answers um, from the portal is that you need to take those files off of the portal in order to make space for other things, correct? That is correct. It's a space issue. So, um, but so do you do you keep the 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 files that are in the form that's not on the portal indefinitely, or do you flush those out of the system after some period of time? So our retention policy has us holding on to the exam materials uh, through the last administration. So for almost one year. So even though they're not available on the portal um, for the applicant to themselves access, the applicant can actually fill out a document request form, pay a nominal fee and get a copy of their answers um, up to almost a year later. Okay, so I have two thoughts here. One is um, rather than this phrase after this allotted time, why don't we just say something more simple and direct like after 30 days? Because that's what we mean, right? Absolutely. And then um, I think it would be good to tele telegraph um, to people that, you know, it's not 30 days to the end of time or, you know, when, when the Disney Corporation no longer governs itself. Um, but it's like a year. So shouldn't we put in just to be fair to people, let them know that you've got to ask for this thing within a year. That is what is meant to be conveyed by, um, from the last administered exam. So it's not quite a year because we have to, um, clear out the space prior to, um, for example, prior to July, 2023's exam, we have to clear out the space. So maybe in May they will disappear. So it's under a year that's available. Oh, okay. It's I see. The last, yeah. It's the last exam. So not the most current exam being February, 2023, but it's the last exam. July, 2022 is currently available. That is a little bit confusing, obtuse, but yeah, I wonder if, I mean, it's not a big deal to me, but I just wonder if we couldn't be clearer about that, but okay. I'll, I'll let that one go. Um, <laughs> so um, does everyone, like the idea of saying 30 days instead of this allotted time? Does anyone not like it? That's clear. Uh, yeah, I don't have a problem with that. This is Robbie. I, I did work on this with Dolores and Christina. You know, we're, we, uh, the goal was clarity uh, and efficiency for mm -hmm. applicants and the bar. So I, I don't have a problem with that. Christina, do, do you? No, I'm not at all. I will be happy to make that um, change prior to it going to public comment, if that is what the committee is wishing. Okay. Um, and my other question is, administratively, this is, this is um, one section. And uh, would it be better for us to just include this in the eligibility package that we're also going to talk about? Um, and not have two separate public comment. They're all they're all going as one um, to the board and one item to the board. Okay, but then um, and you would come would you combine them for the purpose of soliciting public comments? Yeah, they'll all they'll all be in one item to the board of trustees in May. Okay. Um, all right. Um, so there was a proposed motion, right? Um, it was pointed out last meeting, I think that Rosenberg's rules of order actually say that the way we should 
conduct our uh, review of items is to have a staff report and then put a motion on the table and then have our discussion. Um, oh. And so I would like to experimentally try that. I think it's kind of awkward, frankly, but, um, uh, and so let's make this the first, actually I've, I've sort of blown it already because I had a discussion now, um, but the idea would be that we, the staff makes a presentation and presents the proposed motion, and then we discuss it. Um, I don't know if we need a, Gene, do you think we need a, a motion in a second um, before we have the discussion? That's what Rosenberg's rule suggests. Um, okay. Okay, so we so we put up a motion as kind of a stalking horse, but the idea is not to to um, um, prevent discussion. Um, so I think we need to be careful not to, you know, play the game of let's call for the question right away to to uh, uh, you know eliminate uh, people's ability to discuss things. Well, that's I... that's the one place where I think we could you know we could have some problems. Um, Paul, yeah. um, one thing I just want to point out is that uh, each of the agenda items contain a motion. Would it be beneficial that when the staff starts the discussion, uh, we can point to the uh, motion that's in the agenda item uh, and then start the discussion? Uh, um, might even be better to put it up on the screen. And just to be clear, the, the purpose of putting the motion up is so that it can help focus the discussion. So um, it, it's a little bit different order than we've been doing historically, um, but that is that is the purpose. Yeah. Uh, so this is Robbie. So we have kind of blown it on, on this one, uh, but uh, I'll make the motion. You know, it's just one sentence. It's in, it's in the... Uh, staff recommendation and then we you know again this is a continuation of you know a hearty discussion that we had at, at our our last meeting we're really just uh well let me just make it then um uh, i'll i'll move that the committee of bar examiners amend its recommendation to the board of trustees to circulate the proposed rule set forth in attachment a as as modified this morning for a 60 day public comment period. That um, is the motion. Would it be better to to actually say change the phrase, uh, changing um, whatever it was, uh, I'll find it here and read it to you in a minute. Um, time allotted to 30 days, I think would cover it. Uh, uh, oh change this allotted time to 30 days. Um, wait, you're, you're in section A where? Uh, yeah, A, it's, it's the red. Um, right, I'm just looking, where do you want to? After this that? allotted time. Uh, oh, I see. Yeah. Well, I, I don't have a problem with it as it, as it is. If if you have strong feelings about it, that's fine. Well, I'm I'm all for clarity. Yeah. yeah okay. That Christina, is that uh, meet your sniff test? This is great. Okay. So then that would read after thirty days. Yes. Okay. So that's your I'll. Motion? I'll I'll make my motion then uh, that we uh, circulate these rules for a 60 day public comment period uh, as amended by uh, uh, the CBE uh, this morning. Okay, is there a second? I'll second that. Any further discussion? Does anybody have any questions uh, to help their understanding of what the motion means? Okay, uh, Devin, take the roll. Dr. Bolton? Yes. Robert Brody? Yes. Dr. Cow? Yes. Alex Chan? Yes. 
Jim Efteen? Kareem Gangora? Yes. Judge Guerra? Yes. Dolores Heisinger? Yes. Larry Kaplan? Larry Kaplan? Alex Lawrence? Yes. Mm -hmm. Esther Lynn? Yes. Bethany Peake? Ashley Silva Guzman? Yes. Vince Reyes? Yes. David Torres? I'm going to abstain. Dr. Wilcoxon? Paul Kramer? Yes. Back to Larry Kaplan. The motion passes. Okay, now we move on to operations and management. Um, you know, Tammy or I don't know who's going to lead. But I'll let you, you um, present all three items in order. Good morning, everyone. So I will present the exam administration rules revisions. Um, I do have a PowerPoint that I'm going to go through so that everybody can kind of see what was recommended uh, for revisions and not for revisions. Uh, this was worked on with my working group, which was David Torres and James Efting. Uh, James Efting was not able to be here today, but David Torres is here and will be able to um, participate in discussion with us with regards to this. Uh, so we'll go ahead and get this started. Uh, Viviana, if you can change slides, please. So at the time when we looked at the exam administration rules, we were looking at statute, the admissions rules, as well as any committee of bar examiner guidelines and policies that had been put in place previously. The following areas we reviewed were exam application dates and deadlines, examination attendance policies, chapter six conduct um, out of conduct at examinations, allowed, not allowed items during the exam, withdrawal of exam applications, uh, refund of fees policy, and now something that we're gonna review is rejected payments. Next slide. Uh, so under the exam attendance and application categories, some of the policies reviewed that were not recommended for revisions were things along the lines of availability of the applications and the related de deadlines. That includes, um, when the application opens up, timely filing deadline, final filing deadlines. And then of course, we looked at uh, various withdrawal deadline aspects. Uh, we also uh, looked at the fact that there is no statute that specifies specific deadlines for the first year law students exam. However, we do uh, follow the same methodology as the bar exam with what we do with the first year law students exam. We also looked at the attendance policies, which is uh, that an applicant is required to attend every scheduled examination session and that they are no longer allowed into the exam after one hour of the exam has already started. So those are some of the things that we felt were still good and did not require any revisions. However, what we did wanna open up for discussion once I finish this PowerPoint is uh, we wanna discuss flat fee penalty fees for no-show applicants. Uh, go ahead and go to the next slide, Viviana, please. Under chapter six, conduct at examinations, policies that were not recommended for revisions was uh, we have guidelines that we attach to this agenda that govern the interpretation and application of chapter six of the admission rules, as well as the procedures for chapter six administrative hearings that are conducted by state bar staff. And then on top of that, we had the ones that we did wanna um, recommend for revisions is we have a few changes to the allowed, not allowed items in the exam room, such as water bottles and religious headwear, as well as chapter six rules um, were cleaned up with language. Uh, we expanded on what constitutes an electronic device. And we also made updates uh, based on pandemic related changes and technology updates. Uh, and then the last aspect is that uh, will require revision uh, after we move past this agenda and get it all cleared is that we will need to update the chapter six administrative hearing outcomes decisional matrix, which is the document that guides staff on how they make decisions for specific exam violations. Next slide, please. 
Um, this is a continuation uh, of, I'm sorry, I duplicated that. Uh, go ahead and continue on. And if I'll just throw in there, I am under the weather right now and I worked on this under the weather yesterday, guys. So forgive me for that duplication. Um, so policies recommended for dis uh, discussion under withdrawal of exam applications are late fees not being included as part of the refund for withdrawal of applications and that there is no specific statute for this, that it is silent on this issue. Next slide. Uh, under refunds of fee, refund of fees, we have recommendations for revision to include ACH e-check payments. Uh, now that we're in our new system, we have 90 day deadline to submit refund requests and that's pertaining to the 95% family member medical emergency or calamitous occurrence. And then under that 95%, uh, discussing what is considered an administrative cost. The statute does allow for a refund to applicants who have something in this category and that we are allowed to charge an administrative cost uh, out of that before we pro provide the refund. So what is that administrative cost and what should it include? And is 5% enough to cover those costs in 2023? Uh, also, something that was reviewed back in 2017 with the committee was for applicants who start the exam and have a medical emergency, say if somebody has a seizure uh, during the afternoon session of the first day, they're not able to return after that um, for the exam, do we want to provide a 50% refund uh, for those applicants being that they were not able to complete the exam for a medical emergency? Um, and then we also provided an update to uh, give everybody an understanding of what an immediate family member is considered. Next slide. Um, and so there are the definitions of immediate family members. We did look at this from the Family Leave Act for the state of California. So this is taken from similar um, aspects of that. Um, and trying to really just be fair in how we look at all of these various categories, because we know that, you know, there are steps and grands and great grands and things along that line. So uh, next slide. Uh, under rejected payments, this is something that is new that we're bringing to the committee. And that's we receive rejected payments due to return checks, declined ACH payments, and even people who will do a credit card chargeback um, that they've requested through their credit card company. Um, when there's no payment on file, an application is actually considered incomplete. And a complete application is it's been completed in full, all documentation is received as well as payment so that we're able to say we've received everything that is necessary for an application to be considered complete. Uh, for those applicants that do have rejected payments, there is an insufficient payment service charge that's assessed in the amount of $20. Uh, when the past practice has been, if there is a payment that has not come through successfully, as we are trying to collect on that, the applicant is still able to be in the test center. They've been able to go on and take an exam um, and we continue to try to collect this money. We'll try to collect it for the next exam. Uh, if somebody owes money and then they pass the exam, uh, then we're trying to um, get the money collected before they'll be allowed to be placed on motion. Um, the other thing that now the way our system is set up, they're actually reserving a seat while we're doing this process. Um, and that's reserving a seat, of course, while the payment has not been completed, but it is putting other applicants at a disadvantage for a test center such as Pasadena Convention Center, that's very popular with our applicants, that test center will be maxed out. And there's an applicant holding a seat and has no payment and we're trying to collect it and we're not able to collect it from them right away. And there's this other applicant who has submitted a test center change who has successfully put in payment and application who wants to have a seat there, but now they're on a waiting list to see if a seat will open up. So this new payment policy would require that an applicant resolve the payment issue within 14 days from us notifying them of the insuff insufficient payment. Uh, if they do not resolve that within the 14 days, the application would be deemed abandoned. And there is a relation to this in another part of the rules 
um, that speaks to abandoned applications not having everything they need. Um, and if we abandon that application, that would require them to resubmit that application again after you know, they would come back and have to redo it. So that is what the rejected payment policy kind of covers. Um, next slide. And that's the end of my PowerPoint. Uh, at this point, we're gonna open it up for discussion and Viviana is gonna go ahead and share the motion slide so that we can see the motion and then we can open it up for discussion. So, okay, so the first slide here is referring to the revisions to the admissions rules pertaining to conduct violation exam rules. Um, that's probably not in the right order for us to do that um, because usually we have discussion and then we present motion because I'm trying to follow this new guideline that Paul just discussed. It's kind of throwing things out of order. Let's go to the next slide, um, Viviana. Um, okay, so here we can look at, uh, we have a motion that the committee of bar examiners approve the proposed revisions to the refund of fees policy. So let's touch on that. Um, we just discussed some of the refund of fees policy. Hopefully you guys have been able to read the agenda item. Um, and I think at this point, Jean, right, we can open it up for discussion. Yes. Perfect. Is, is this the item where you had some policy questions that we had to resolve? Yes. So this is where we open it up for everybody to discuss these. Okay, um, so it's one thing to discuss proposals you've made in a concrete sort of way by providing the revised language, but um, I think it might be useful for you to go through those, to highlight those questions where you need guidance from us. And then my question is, are you gonna be able to create the rule regulatory language on the fly today? Or are we gonna need to to put this over to the next meeting. Um, yeah. So, um, I mean, I guess we can try to create it on the fly uh, as long as we can get through it. Uh, or we can actually take that, uh, that information and come back with a rule. Um, I'm not sure, Audrey, uh, Jean, do you guys, is there any particular way that I'm supposed to handle this? So well, this is a policy, right? That committee policy? Well, it's it's also sending out chapter six revisions to um, to the uh, Supreme Court, but basically right, right now we're on the refund of fees policy, which is a CBE policy. Right. So the the refund of fees policy we can discuss and revisit because it's a committee policy in June. But if there are things that you want to go before the main board of trustees meeting, those obviously if we move them forward today, they go to May. If they move forward in June, they would wait till the November Board of Trustees meeting. Okay. So let me get to the refund of fees. So if we're gonna have discussion about what was re proposed for revision, one of the things was the ACH payments uh, that we now accept e-checks and it was just updating language to say that. Um, and maybe, you know what, Viviana, I hate for us to jump back and forth, but because we're trying to show motion first before discussion, um, it might be beneficial uh, for us to open up the attachment for the refund of fees policy, so that way we can look at it. Uh, do you still have that refund of fees policy handy for you to open up? Um, no, I just have the, the slides that we have. Okay. Let me go ahead and open up the refund of fees policy with the changes and then I'll share my screen. Uh, so that way you guys can see it. I think that's gonna be the easiest way for us to do it. Okay. Um, okay, so this is the refund of fees policy and what was updated uh, for everybody to look at and discuss. Uh, we did some language cleanup. Uh, I've tried to add some stuff in, such as credit card processing fees are not included in any refund of application fees. That's mainly because of the fact that those fees that we're charging are not fees we're keeping. Those are fees that the bank charges for us to process a credit card. So if we are allowing a credit card uh, processing fee to be returned, we're actually losing on that. Uh, here, again, we cleaned up language just to make it a little bit more clear with regards to how the withdrawals and the refund uh, work with the different amounts that we allow at different points in the time of the application. Which attachment to the 
that was posted to the agenda is this? I am on attachment D. Oh, was that just posted yesterday? Uh, was it yesterday? Because I, for some reason, I don't think I downloaded it. It might have been yesterday morning, oh. but I don't remember. This, was it, this was posted on Wednesday. Wednesday, okay. Oh, maybe I got confused and didn't download it. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. Um, here we've added some additional items such as stopping payment on a check, dishonoring a check or disputing a credit card charge does not constitute withdrawn from an exam. So we've tried to get everything in line in one area with regards to the withdrawals for the refunds. Uh, here, only timely submitted withdrawals will be considered for the refunds. Withdrawal requests must be submitted through the applicant portal. Just some odd and end things to put up there and make sure it's all very clear. Uh, we are specifying refunds will not be processed for these two categories. So that's requests for refunds filed in excess of 35 days after the deadline for timely filing by applicants seeking to repeat the exam having been unsuccessful on the exam, immediately preceding the exam into which the current admission was sought and requests for refunds filed in excess of 45 days after the deadline for timely filing by first time applicants and applicants who have previously taken an exam, but who did not take the most recent exam. So they would not be considered an immediate repeater. Um, again, just some language quest, uh, cleanup on here of changing percent to percent and the request to add any requests received after 30 days will not be entitled to a refund. Here with registration, uh, we just moved some of the language around, cleaned it up to make it clear for applicants uh, that the registration form can be submitted at the same time as an application. However, the application and fees will be returned if the registration is not approved within 10 days of receipt of the application. A registration will be deemed approved when the requisite fees, signature, properly executed declaration, and all required documentation verifying eligibility have been provided. Uh, here, this has always been there, but we've moved it around. Registration is deemed abandoned if we don't receive everything that we need within 60 days, and there is no refund issued for an abandoned registration. Uh, we move into the attorney's exam. We cleaned up language. Uh, with that, there was no change to the actual policy. General bar exam applicants, same thing, just cleaned up the language, no changes. First year exam, same thing. So here's where we have the 95% refunds. This is where there were changes made uh, with regards to excluding credit card processing fees. Um, and basically cleaning up language, removing, moving things around. And this is where we come down into where the immediate family members uh, is spelled out into the policy so that everybody can be on the same page of what that entails. Um, one question about that. The sure. last the last item there, all of the above include in-laws. Um, isn't that already covered in some of the the bullets above or? So we do have in-law under uh, the, like the parents and the son or daughter and brother. I think the biggest aspect here is that we're trying to say it's gonna be of same or op opposite gender. So that way that is, you know, being recognized that that's the, what we're trying to entail there. We do say opposite gender under spouse. Um, so if that is something we want to try to just include on every line, but we just felt that this right here would help cover that as a whole. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Well, it's just confusing to me. Um, maybe I was reading this too precisely or, okay, thanks. Do, do you guys have, does anybody else have any comments with regards to that? I mean, is it something you want to reword or just keep it as it is? Well, it's real hard to do on the fly. Um, I'm, I'm really on the verge of saying pursuant to our uh, consensus of uh, from the planning session that um, 
we need a little more time to consider all this. Uh, uh, but but today we should certainly talk out the policy issues. Um, but as you know by now, I read these things for the details and to see that um, the po a particular policy that's described in one of the documents is is implemented in the operative language as I expected it to be. Um, and really, I have not had time to be able to do that um, for this set of regulations this week. I don't know how others feel. Um, is there any particular urgency to um, getting these approved today, other than uh, that the Board of Trustees apparently has decided that they only want to consider uh, rule revisions twice a year for place sending them out for comment? Yeah, I mean, that is the only factor, Paul, is that the Board of Trustees only hears these rules in May and November, but the comfort level that the committee has with putting things forward is, is the most important thing. So that should be, you know, how we guide the discussion for sure. But I think I would add to this is that this is a refund of fees policy. This is a CBE policy. This does not have to go to the board of trustees yeah, for sure. unless I'm missing something. No, 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 no. This, I think you're talking more globally, Paul, about the packages yeah. before the committee. Correct. Yes. So if it helps for everybody to understand what's going to the board of trustees, the only thing that would be going to the board of trustees right now is going to be the chapter six conduct violations. So uh, we can go through this and review it. And if there's any pertinent questions at that moment, you guys can ask those questions. I can definitely bring refund of fees policies back again next time. So you guys have more time to review it. I'm open to whatever you know, we need to do to make sure this is successful. Um, but I think the chapter six conduct violations, that would be important for us to really try to dive into and see if you guys can review that right now and see that it maybe is okay to go to the board of trustees just because we are working with that timeline. Um, if that sounds good to all of you, I'll just continue through. And then when we get the chapter six, maybe we can spend a little more time there than what we're doing with everything else. Okay, let's try that. Okay. Um, so again, we're just doing rule or um, policy language cleanup here. Same thing here, official documentation has always been required. It's just language cleanup to make it sound more clear to everybody. Uh, nothing was really changed with regard to service in the armed forces other than language cleanup. And here, application abandonment, uh, no real changes uh, with other than language cleanup except for uh, the policy about rejected payments. We did add that in here. So if at some point the policy does uh, get approval, then this is what will be in the application abandonment uh, language for the refund of fees policy. Hey, uh, Tammy, can I jump in? This, this is Robbie and yes. I'm gonna kind of uh, pick your brain with your institutional knowledge here. When, when there is a problem with the fee, whether a check is returned or a credit card is denied, does that usually get resolved by the applicant? I mean, in in most cases. Uh, yeah, in most cases it does. But again, because we don't take any action on their application, uh, a lot of applicants, sure, they'll come back and try to rectify it as quickly as they can. But there's also a group of applicants that won't do it right away. And that's why we wanna make a policy about payments that says that we can abandon the application because our financial analyst, he will go around and around with some applicants trying to get payment um, or he won't hear from them right away. Then he'll let them know what's going on once he does and then he won't hear from them again. Yeah, we collect payment from them at some point, whether it's the next application that they submit for the bar exam that we tell them they owe the money, or at the very latest is we'll say they can't be put on motion. However, again, we're spending a lot of time spinning our wheels trying to collect payment from applicants who don't rectify it very quickly. And we are putting other applicants at a disadvantage because there's a line of 
applicants on a sheet of test center changes that are wanting to sit at that place, but we can't let them have a seat, but yet we have a seat that has an application that has technically not made, been made complete yet. I, so it's I just get it, looking at that. I just, uh, you know, I, I don't want to unduly prejudice any applicant who may have some financial concerns or restrictions. I mean, it, it, it is, you know, very expensive. And, uh, uh, you know, I certainly get our process, but I wonder, is there any way if a fee is not paid, is there any way to sort of hold that application in abeyance somewhere rather than requiring that applicant to resubmit? That's what it looks like this language says. Uh, given that it sounds like, Tammy, most people ultimately get it together, mm -hmm. it seems uh, a little unfair to require an entire new application for the bar, uh, which, uh, you know, for those that don't know, it's uh, yeah, it's a pretty uh, uh, extensive undertaking. So can we hold those applications? Um so I don't know that we can put an application in abeyance just because it is going through the process of being worked on for eligibility um, aspects. So if we put it in abeyance, I don't know how that would work. That's something we'd have to look at in our system. Um, and that eligibility really is working on that application to clear people. That would make it very difficult, I think, in another way also to put it in abeyance. Uh, however, I can say if applicants do reach out and say that there was some kind of financial difficulty with that payment, you know, we do work with people. It's not that we're just automatically, you know, cutting them off. However, it's they have to communicate with us. Uh, but when ultimately we need to receive that payment um, as soon as possible. So for that, what that's worth. Right. I, I just feel like the current language that says that a payment is not received within 14 days of notification, the application is abandoned. And then I guess it's sort of deleted from the bars system. Is that essentially what happens? Well, the application is there. We've just oh. changed it now to being an abandoned application. And then they would uh, be required to resubmit a new application and make their payment so that it is able to continue to go forward. And in most cases, uh, it's probably too late to do it for the bar exam that they had applied for. Well, not necessarily. Well, no, we did, I don't think so. I think we did I add that think. if it was right near the final filing deadline, we're still going to give those people, an, you know, 14 days to to resolve their payment issue and not abandon them. But obviously if they don't make their payment and the final filing deadline is passed and they don't make the payment, I mean, now yeah, then they're not gonna sit for the bar exam. So, uh, but we are trying to say, look, you know, if you submit your payment on the last day that the application is open and we receive notification, you know, there's a delay in how quickly we receive notification that this payment has been declined. Um, we're going to still give those people 14 days to resolve that payment, whether the application is closed or not. Um, but it is just a, you know, having applicants make sure they get those payments in within that 14 days. You know, Tammy, I'm just afraid that I, the only reason I can think of that somebody might have this problem is, uh, you know, an inability to pay. Uh, get, if they've done everything else, so I feel like I'm just looking at the rejected payments section. This is on page eight. I would propose that we take out that sentence. If acceptable payment is not received, the application will be deemed abandoned. I mean, the rest of it's fine. You have to resolve the payment issue within 14 days. An application who's an applicant who still wishes to sit for the exam will be required to submit a new application and pay the late fees and et cetera. But, uh, you know, because I can't think of any other reason that this might occur other than maybe, you know, financial distress or, you know, trying to pull the, the money together. Am I right, Tammy? It's a, almost a thousand dollars. So there's various reasons as to why applicants, could that be a reason? Yes, of course. 
However, we also have applicants when they do ACH, they enter the wrong um, account information. And we reach out letting them know that it, it didn't go through and it's a matter of them going back in and trying to resubmit payment to us because they didn't enter the correct uh, account number when they did ACH. Uh, another um, area is applicants who do chargebacks on a credit card. You know, they basically charge it onto a credit card and then there's a chargeback done. And sometimes there's a reason as to why they did it that doesn't have anything to do with this application per se, but those are other areas where, is it because they don't have the finance, the finances to do that? What, what is the reason for the chargeback? But, and there's been a lot of different cases out there. I can't speak of one off the top of my head, but you know, sometimes it's just, they don't, they are, they're disputing something else. And so they decide to do a chargeback on the credit card. So there's a lot of reasons, but yeah, sure. There are, I'm sure financial stress situations for applicants as well. Um, Robbie, are you suggesting that somebody would be allowed to take the bar exam without having settled their um, account? No, I just, okay. uh, I, I would say that we not consider their application abandoned. I think that is, uh, that language is a little bit too strong for someone who, as I say, I, I can't think of any other reason other than, you know, financial distress. Everything else in that paragraph, I'm, I'm fine with. Uh, so mandating that it be resolved in 14. I just don't want to call the application abandoned. It really isn't. Um, well, okay. But so somebody um, applies for the bar exam, their payment um, doesn't make it through for whatever reason. And we're coming to the bar exam. Um, they're not going to be able to sit for it. So we, at some point we have to say, uh, saying it's abandoned is one way of saying you can't take the exam. Um, may, are you maybe wanting the deadline to be closer to the exam? Maybe like they have to make it good at least 14 days before the exam is given or something like that? Well, is, no, is that I, think it, you... I think it goes without saying that if you don't pay, you're not gonna be able to sit for the exam. I mean, well, uh, as a regulator, we need to say it, though. Uh, I mean, that's important that that be clear. We shouldn't. Maybe we the. I don't want to have to imply it. Maybe better language would be if acceptable payment is not received, the applicant will not be eligible to sit for that uh, bar exam. And then staff may say that that causes them some grief because they have to plan for this person actually sh oh. being able to show up in it, you know, and when they don't, they've, um, uh, well, we're not going to order water anymore, but, um, you know, they've, they've reserved space for them that then, you know, is a sunk cost. So, yeah, yeah. I don't know where that balance is, but um, I guess because this is the policy, we don't have to resolve this today, but we've certainly right. highlighted it. Is that fair to say? Yes. And, it, you know, given that we may be, moving to a remote administration of this exam. Uh, I'm not really persuaded by the idea that this is uh, prejudicing another applicant. I think that we should be mindful of, you know, the, the primary, if not the only reason that a, a fee might not be paid is an inability to pay it. And I would not want I would like any application for the bar to remain uh, uh, in our records and, you know, re revivable upon payment for that exam or, or the next one. I don't know. I mean, Amy, is there any reason why we couldn't hold them until we get the money, either for that exam or the next exam? Well, um, the... Uh application process is very different um, from one exam to the next. We we, oh. we do not hold applications um, that way. But oh. I think the bottom line is like um how much no how much time do we want to give somebody um no you know given that right now our application period closes um how much how long do we want to hold on to this before we need to really um, decide on that application that is approve it abandon it um uh uh you know um oh. I see. Or deny it. Uh, uh, some decision has to has to result in this application before we get to the exam. 
So the question they, if they haven't made payment, we're still working the application. We're still proving them to be eligible or possibly ineligible. If they are eligible, uh, whether we're in person or online, we are still paying stuff out for these applicants, whether whatever way you want to look at it, we are holding a seat. We're ordering exam materials for them. There's a lot that the state bar is going to be paying for and letting this applicant sit, but we have not received payment for the services that pay for those aspects of putting on the bar exam. I see. Yeah, if they were abandoning and they were losing money they had given us, that's a different matter than, right. than having paid and lost nothing. Uh, I. Okay, I'm getting a bit a clearer picture of it now. I guess, I guess I just didn't like the idea of someone having to start all over again because they didn't have the money at the time it was due. But would it mitigate some of the concerns to extend the time frame from 14 days to a longer time period? I don't know. Can we do that? realistically, Tammy, up until they have the fees must be paid within, I don't know. So what kind of time frame do you want to look at? I mean, obviously, once we close an application, we're moving on, right, planning the exam. We're going to order our exam materials usually within a few weeks after the closing of the application. Um, and then, of course, once we get closer to the exam, it makes it harder to try to fix or change these things at that point because we're actually running our answer inventory and our rosters that shows who is eligible to be at that exam. And that's what our staff will reference when they're on site. So uh, I think it's, you know, there's a proposal that can be made and just keep those aspects in mind with what proposal is being made. Well, and, and I think one thing to keep in mind too is that the deadline to apply for the exam is statutorily mandated. And so it has a clear open and closed period. Yep. And um, and to say uh, registered for the bar exam, that includes the, the receipt of application and fees. So if somebody had the application and no fees, that's not considered registered for the exam. Right. Not a complete application. Okay. All right. Well, you know, look, that is the purpose of these mm -hmm. meetings. And I appreciate that the Committee of Bar Examiners is, you know, involved in, in in making the policy but uh uh i think you've you've addressed my concerns um okay and is there any other concern from any other cbe member before i move on in the document just one question robbie was referring to page eight so is this theme repeated somewhere else uh robbie are you looking at the agenda item Yes, I am. Yeah, he's oh, okay. on the agenda. I have the actual gotcha. refund policy up. Okay, because yeah. I just hate it when we try to um, speak about the same concept in two different places. There's always the opportunity to to uh, say something subtly different um, that right. gets us into trouble. Yeah, the agenda just has so much more information. So I shared the refund of fee policy itself because that's literal for us all to look at. Yeah, and I appreciate that because I'm most focused on the you know where the the rules hit the ground that you know not the summary in the staff report but the actual rules we're proposing or policies we're proposing to adopt okay all right so i'll continue on then if everybody's okay with that um as you can see here there were no changes uh in the net refund amount it's again just language cleanup uh again and again it's a matter of if there's any outstanding fees uh and there's a refund issued. We're going to subtract those outstanding fees uh, from that. So it was the policy's always been in place for the net refund amount. It was just cleaned up to make it a little bit more clear and straightforward. And that's pretty much it for that refund of fees policy. So mm -hmm. I know, Paul, that you wanted to have a little more time to review this. Uh, is that what you would like to do still is to table this to come back again in June? Or is everybody here feeling like they've seen it, they understand it, they're okay with it? How, where do we stand? Well, I think there's one, maybe one question we still have to discuss. And that's, or at least I'm not clear on, um, the idea of the administrative costs we could deduct from a refund. Yes. Currently 5%, which does sound low. Um, but I, I maybe we need a question for for both you and council, 
when the statute speaks to what they, I believe the term they use is administration costs. Um, do, is that meant to include all the, the money we've spent along the way to the point of the refund? Or is that, is, is that interpreted as just referring to our costs of processing the refund request? Because that would result in two very different numbers. Now I can show you the statute here. Let me just open it on my computer. Um, and see if I can share this here. I think this is it. And while you're doing that, I would think that if we if we um, took off our costs that we had expended to date, it would be at least 50%, but probably more. Because um, the, you know, for instance, we're not, uh, the obvious costs that we're not paying for somebody who doesn't take the exam are whatever it costs for grading. And I don't know if you even have a number for that cost because um, they don't have to be graded. Um, that is correct. We would not room... grade for that person if they did not take the exam. So I have it up on the screen. This is what the statute says with regards to uh, allowing refunds because of the death of an immediate family member or the serious illness or disabling injury um, of a family member. Uh, it does say a deduction may be made from the refund for administrative costs. So there's no definition included in there with that. Uh, it does say the board shall adopt regulations for the administration of this subdivision and that the subdivision shall not be construed to prohibit the refund of fees in instances other than those specified. So there's not a clear definition there. That's where we would need to be the ones to discuss what do we want to consider those administrative costs um, and is 5% still uh, the right number? Yeah, if it said administration costs, it would seem to me it was broader. Uh, yeah, it's uh, Jean or Carol, any thoughts about? Um, this is something that we would have to analyze, Paul, but um, what I think is clear is that it has to be, there has to be an analysis of what the administrative costs are. It can't just be an arbitrary number selected. So um, I think that would require probably some assistance from our finance department in, figure, in, in taking a look at this. I think it would require additional analysis. But it probably would allow us to come up with a kind of an average. So for instance, we don't have to account for how far along in the process any particular person got. Um, you know, on a case by case basis, I would hope. I would hope that um, some financial modeling by finance might be able to help us with that. Um, but I think that that is an approach. And but then that begs the question, do we want to, because of the circumstances, I mean, this, this is due to a, you know, a, a unpleasant um, uh, event that occurs in a family's uh, situation, do we want to do we want to try to recover our costs in that case? Or, um, you know, because we have, as we've learned recently, a need to make sure that we are um, you know, obtaining sufficient revenue to support our, uh, our operations, or do we want to give them a break? Um, maybe if we resolve that question, uh, it will be unnecessary to ask the accountants anything. Um, so are, does anyone have any thoughts about whether we, um, could you put the, that um, statute up again, uh, Tammy? In a circumstance of the, I forgot the phrase already, but uh, you know, a significant family health event, um, do we wanna try to recover the monies we've actually spent or are we willing to say, just take 5% off and return the rest. Okay. May I make a comment on that, Paul? Sure. One of the things that was considered by myself, uh, Jim Epting and Tammy, was the tremendous amount of work that's undertaken by the bar staff in putting together um, an administration. And it, it, from the get-go, as soon as the, the bar is taken in uh, 
in July, and once everything goes, gets processed and we open up registration, again, the ball gets rolling with respect to everything that needs to be contracted, making sure that everything needs to be set in place uh, with the actual administration. And there's just a, a significant amount of work done by the bar and, and, uh, and, and the staff. That's one of the things that we took into consideration and why we considered um, these particular fees or certain percentages that were deductions that would take place. But we did give it a lot of thought. We did give it a lot of discussion with respect to the actions taken. And I think that it would be difficult to, to assess some type of percentage of what they've done up to that time. And I believe in the agenda, I provided an example just for context was a general uh, bar exam application is just that fee in itself is $677. And I don't have it right up in front of me right now because I'm sharing my screen, but 5% of that I believe was $33.85. So if that's any context to see what is covered for 5%, 33.85 and there you know is a lot to go into what we put on for that bar exam and to make this happen and process a refund at the end and and so on and so forth so that yeah that doesn't cover it obviously um what the, the monies you expended to the time of the withdrawal um uh, but but i think it's useful to have to have an accountant to be able to um you know explain a methodology that's reasonable that does arrive at a higher number so am i hearing that the um the committee thinks we should try to recover our our reasonable expenses rather than just a token amount uh, uh, and, uh the this this is Robbie, and I'm sorry, David, uh, Mr. Torres. What did you think about this? Well, why not just say you know a hundred dollars or something that probably better approximates yeah, the I, bar's cost? Tammy, what was uh, I know we we discussed this one. I thought that uh, we discussed a lot of options on this. Do you recall this was the uh, on this particular issue? So during this discussion, uh, there wasn't a flat rate fee of say 100. It was based on a percentage. So of course, currently we do 5% and the working group in discussion, it was mentioned, should it really only be uh, instead of a 95% refund, should it be a 20% refund? Right. That okay. was one of the ideas thrown out there based on what it is that we've already spent to put on the SABAR exam for this applicant to be there, although we you know, are completely compassionate to the circumstances they've experienced. So it was a matter of throwing out a different number, but really that's where this is open for that discussion, but we never really said, oh, just a flat rate of like $100. That's right, okay, and that uh, jogged my memory because we talked about fees in different uh, uh, scenarios, yeah. but with respect to this one, I recall, it was Jim that, that talked about 20% because we had uh, discussed other percentages. But again, that's when we talked about the amount of work that's done by uh, the, the staff. And, and you gotta figure that when we have an administration like the February administration, which attracts a, a lower number of, uh, of applicants, you know, there, there's a lot of work that has to be done and, and providing a significant amount back or returning a significant amount back is going to obviously have an effect on the bar. So I think that when we considered everything that is all the all the work that is performed by the staff, uh, that 20% would be something that may be reasonable uh, at the time if this if this situation were to occur. Would, would staff have time between now and the next meeting to to maybe try to put a, a, a more precise point? Uh, yeah. up for us, uh, you know, some analysis of costs. It could, I, I don't know how many of these cases there are. Maybe it could either even be, um, have several milestones. So if you, if you withdraw right after you apply, when we haven't done much work, maybe that is a higher percentage 
of refund than if you withdraw bef the day before the bar exam? Well, there are the withdrawal deadlines leading up to the bar exam already. That's for just anybody who wants yeah. to withdraw from the exam. So this is specific to applicants who apply for the 95% yeah. uh, refund af usually after the exam is already over. Okay, so we only know about their withdrawal when they don't show up. Right, right. you know, something happened. I think um, okay. calamitous yeah, originally... occurrence is one of the words in the form. <laughs> Yeah, they originally flagged as a no show if they don't show up and they've not withdrawn prior to during that withdraw withdrawal deadline. Um, and then we only know that they're actually like withdrawing with a 95% until after the exam has happened and they submit it. And that's another uh, one of the revisions that was proposed is that we set a um, deadline for those. I can tell you right now in the past few weeks, I've had I haven't reviewed all of them yet, but I've got roughly upwards of 40-ish 95% uh, refunds that I have to go through and review. So I don't know what all of those exams are, but we do have applicants who ask for a 95% refund a year later, three years later. We've had somebody do it five years later. So that is another part of this revision is to propose that there is a deadline put in place that says they have to request this within a certain amount of time after the exam that they did not attend for that reason. So that's another part, but right now with regards to this, um, I can definitely try to put some stuff together and work with finance. I just gotta, I have to identify what finance's availability is to work with me on it, but we have a little bit of time here that I can try to see if somebody can work on it. I can also ask our financial analyst to help jump in there and work on it. And we can see what we can bring back to you guys in June to see what that looks like and to better make a determination if that's what's needed. Tell me if uh, you'd like participation but with myself and Jim Ethney, and I think that, that that would be something I would be interested in discussing with them as well. Okay, and being the, you guys are the working group, we can definitely bring you back in again and we can go over this together and just really make sure that we dial that in to see what that looks like. Yeah. And, and, you know, because, go ahead. And, and I see your point, Paul, and, and, um, and I, I get it where you're, where you're coming from. So I'll make sure I uh, discuss this with Mr. Epley when he returns. Okay, great. Yeah, the better the, better the um, Transparency. financial analysis behind the number we pick the the better off we are okay i didn't want to say science but um and, okay and Ta tammy and david just so i know what what you're requiring is that the applicant provide the death certificate or is the, is that the kind of paperwork that you have to review Yes, they have to provide official documentation, whether it would be a death certificate. And I believe that the rule also states that it is, let me open that back up again, is um, a death certificate showing that somebody passed away within 30 days prior. Let me find that on the document real quick. All right, let me share my screen again with this one. Okay, um, here it says um, that occurred after submittal of an application for the exam, but before the exam is administered and which death, illness, or injury is certified on the request for refund of fees form or verified through the provision of a copy of the death certificate. And in the case of physical incapacity, the refunds are available only in instances of severe unavoidable in incapacitating circumstances. Um, if it's a medical emergency, they do usually provide documentation, a, a note, a letter from the doctor on their letterhead that says this is, they had to be out, they couldn't sit for the exam. So it is official documentation that needs to be provided. Um, hold on, go back there. Oh. So I see one issue. It's, it, it literally says that they could either certify the fact on the request or verify it through a death certificate. Um, do you really mean to let somebody just swear to it as opposed to having the death certificate? No, they're supposed to provide documentation. Okay, well, you see how it doesn't quite say that? Yeah, I see that one, which death, illness, or injury yeah, is- Yeah, highlight so that for request. your future review. Okay. And then somewhere else you referred to official documentation in here. Yes, uh, let me go down. Um, 
Um, so applicants serious disabling illness or injury. Uh, it's at the bottom. Metal. Okay, let me keep going. There um, it is. Would it be good to provide examples, official documentation such as, like okay. a death certificate oh. or um, a doctor's certification or whatever? Okay, so we'll expand on this. Um, I'll just add this in as a reminder for me to do it um, on this yeah, part. It, this just helps people get their document, get the right documents in their initial request, which um, reduces your workload. Yeah, and it is included on the refund of fees uh, request form, but we can expand on it in this as well. Oh, okay. No, that's actually the having it on the form is probably the best place. Okay, so I do just you didn't want me to that. not yeah. put it in here then? Well, no, you can. Okay. Okay, and here is that part where we brought up the deadline. So the proposal is that requests must be received no later than 90 days after the exam for which a refund is being requested. So if you took the February, 2023 exam, you have 90 days after that exam to request for that refund. Um, and then if not, then past that deadline, it wouldn't be able to be done. Um, and that probably should be on the form as well. But is 90 days, that seems kind of short to me. It's, I mean, I see your point about one or two or five years. That seems like a long time. Um, but, you know, it's, as we hear often, you know, people seem to be um, quite often, you know, very debilitated by the events of this sort. And it takes them a while to recover and get back to business. So I wonder if there's any problem with, say, making it six months or just not five years. You're, you're right that that's too much. I am. Um... I mean, I'm a hard person about a lot of things, but I don't see this needing to be that. Yeah, I, I'm not sure I agree. I think 90 days is, is plenty of time. And, okay. And David, uh, Torres, again, you, you like this idea right of of giving money back to people that i mean it's who who don't show up for the what their seat is reserved their place is there and they don't show up well albeit a limited percentage. yeah i mean and it's what, not going to be what what we had expected in the past i mean we're we jim and i talked about 20 percent if that yeah, uh, because yeah, of it's going to be a lot of less. Work. Right, I, I know because of the amount of work that uh, that is done. Almost uh, all the work. And all Tam, Tammy, can you, you know, I, again, it's so hard at these meetings to put these things into into real life context. How often do you get these requests? Is it like one or two per year? No, they're ongoing. They're all the time. You know, it's just usually right after an exam, there might be a larger amount of them but they are ongoing um, throughout the year. It's not just one or two a year. And you said you had a stack of 40 on your desk, right? So since I since the beginning of April, there's roughly, I think it's about 40-ish. I've reviewed some of them already, but I have some that I still need to review. So I think it's approximately around 40-ish that I am trying to review right now. Uh, honestly, Paul, I think 90 days. So. Tammy, if that 90 day time frame was imposed, how many do you, would you guess you could take off your desk? More than half of them? Oh, I don't know if it would take any off the desk other than people would just now have to make sure they submit them, you know, in a timely fashion. I don't know that it would take them off. And, you know, I will add that not everybody's request is approved. We do uh, deny some and push them back to say they either didn't provide official documentation um, or just deny all the way around because what they do have is not meeting the requirements. I don't think it would lessen how many we receive. It would just make it where now we would be able to receive all of them within 90 days and get them done and move on to the next exam versus them rolling in throughout the year for an exam that happened you know, a year ago or whatever it might be. Right, but um, my question was, how many on your desk were submitted more than 90 days after the administration of the exam? 
How so many? I, that again, I have not finished reviewing and I did not take note of all of them so far to see what that is. Um, so I wouldn't be able to give you an accurate number on that. And currently there is no limit. Then there, yeah, that's exactly, there is no limit. Here's one more suggestion, Tammy. Um, we, they were doing this in, uh, I think in eligibility because the examination can, for some people is more than the two days due to uh, testing accommodations. They changed the definition from the last day of the exam. That was for the five-year rule um, to the first day of the exam, because that's, mm -hmm. that's a, you know, a fixed, um, uh, uh, standard. It never varies um, to avoid any ambiguity about whether the, you know the last day was first day plus two one or three. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So I think in here you should say after the first day of the examination for which the refund is being requested. So we're going to leave it at ninety days. Yeah, the, the others talk me out of it. Okay. And then we'll add the after the first day. So that way it specifies that. Yeah, okay. Um, let's, we better move on because. Um, yes. Um, I think it's fair to say, folks, um, and, and I made my dinner plans on this basis that we should not expect to be done before five. We'll try to so get what five. I'll do, sorry, Paul, what I'll do is how about I'll do this analysis and we've made these changes. When we come back in June, we'll have the analysis. I'll revise this to show the changes we did this time. And then we can bring this back and we can move on to our chapter six since I know you're concerned about the timing of where we are right now, Paul. Right, go ahead. Okay, so let me stop sharing on that. And that way we can move over to chapter six. Uh, let me open that and share the screen with you on those changes. And I'm, I'm hopeful that this one will go a little bit quicker for you, Paul. That way we can get these moving. All right. So the area that we're looking at is the chapter six conduct uh, at examinations. This is rule 4.70 through rule 4.74. This is the uh, item that needs to be approved by the BOT to go to public comment for 60 days. And we did a lot of language cleanup. Uh, one of the things that we did is to really expand on what is considered an electronic device because it was very vague before and we needed to expand on that just from experiences of what we've had in previous exam administrations, uh, just to be clear. So we've added that it's any type of electronic device or battery powered device and we're giving more um, examples, cell phone, digital clocks, and digital timers, fitness trackers, digital watch, and basically other than the applicant's authorized laptop or approved medical advice. So it's saying that any electronic device that is even battery powered, of course, is not allowed in the room other than your authorized laptop or approved medical device. So that was one of the things that we really made a lot of change to. Approved. Um, what's that? Approved medical device, how is it approved? Do we have a list or? Uh, it, well, it's either obviously somebody would be approved through a testing accommodation process, but we also do, for example, um, we do allow in the exam room TENS unit devices. So that would be a device that would be allowed because it's on our allowed list. So if it's not on the allowed list, it would have to be approved for TA. And if not, then it's not allowed. So do you have medical implants on that list? Like um, some people have stimulators for various parts of their body or um, uh, pacemakers? Uh, we do not have that on there. Um, but literally we, this would apply to those? Yes. Although they are no danger to the security, but. A TENS unit is one of those simulator, stimulators. Yeah, some people have them implanted in their pacemaker. bodies. They now have one for sleep apnea even. So, I, I mean, for me with a pacemaker, that's something that's under their clothes and that's a medical, I, I don't know. That one's to me, like we're not gonna ever know that person has a pacemaker really. Um, I, I don't know if that would be going down a little too far into that, but you guys can weigh in on that. Uh, do we have the uh, list of medical devices, correct? 
I have. I mean, we could, um, you know, perhaps we could just refer to whatever page those are items are listed on. I, I'm not necessarily certain the the page maker is what we're talking about. We're talking about items that are easily accessible in order to uh, access any material that can be used to assist a, an applicant uh, during the course of the uh, of the administration. So you know they're going to pull out a watch that where they can look up a contract question or elements of a certain crime then those are the issues that we're talking about yeah no i understand that's our intent but have we said that clearly sure. i mean i just don't want to cause um anxiety for an applicant you know yeah. reading this um you know if they're going to be great lawyers they're going to spot this issue so on our list we have hearing aids and tens units um, again, things that are able to be seen by our staff. Of course, we can't see a cell phone if it's in somebody's pocket, but if it rings or it becomes noticeable, we then were able to say that's not allowed. Um, so is that something that we need to consider adding a pacemaker to the list of allowable? Or again, is it really just based on um, objects that are not attached to your body per se? This is Michael, may I make a comment? Yes. Um, maybe maybe the term we could use so that we don't have to say specifically, you know, a laundry list of medical devices to say implantable medical devices, which implies that it's inside the body. And then this way would kind of cover pacemaker, which is Paul, what Paul is alluding to. And also at the same time, David kind of making a very excellent point is, you know, the we, we want to know about the devices that can potentially be used as opposed to things that are implantable, which, um, you know, they're not going to be able to access anything that's implanted inside the body. Imp implantable or external though, right? Because you're talking about hearing aids and TENS yeah. units. That's a great point, Audrey. Thank you. And then medical devices. Um, I would say instead implantable or approved external medical devices because uh, we're not proposing to put the implantables on the approved list. So, so you say laptop or implantable or approved external medical devices. Okay, so say that again. Implantable. Move a, or implantable or approved medical devices. Approved external. Did not work. Did not work. Oh, no pressure here, guys. Okay. Um, <laughs> okay. So, Im or implantable or approved external medical devices looks good. And can I add mm -hmm. one, one point of clarification? I think um, that's really important for everyone to understand. So, when an applicant applies for the bar exam um, and they are approved, uh, shortly before the exam, uh, they get an issued an admittance ticket, and, um, uh, and that's a ticket that they physically have to print and bring to the exam. And along with that, they get a um, admittance ticket bulletin that in, contains a whole bunch of information about the schedule, about what's or what they can bring to the exam and what they can't. And so I, I bring this up because um, uh, this is something that we also make those changes to that bulletin, but. Uh, uh, applicants are made aware of all of the uh, acceptable uh, devices or unacceptable uh, things that they could bring to the room as well um, uh, prior to that. So I just want to highlight that as well. And one of the attachments that we provided for the agenda is the February 2023 um, bar exam admittance ticket bulletin so that you could see where the list of allowable items are located. And like Amy said, we will, once we finalize everything, all of that can be updated accordingly as needed. One quick question. When we say approved, what are we referring to? Where can the applicants reference the list of approved devices? It's on that admittance ticket bulletin. And okay, it's also so, included in the application instructions, sorry. Yeah. So they get okay. it twice. They get it twice. 
So should we perhaps put a asterisk with footnote there to point to what those devices, where those devices can be found? Because when you say approved, I have no idea where I can find a list of approved devices other than they're approved. Um, we could, we could reference that. Maybe just put a line in that these uh, approved items are included in the uh, admittance ticket bulletin. Could just do yeah. or right. footnote. Yeah. Well, that's not something they can access um, prior to making an application, though. Right. So you probably should refer to the application. So there are, and again, so there's the application instructions that includes that same list. So at the time they apply for the exam, there's application instructions that gives it to them. And then when we give them their admittance ticket, we give it to them again in the admittance ticket bulletin. So they can see it at the exam application point at the end of that closer to the exam and then actually i believe it's on our website as well so we we give it to them in different places okay well i think what we're getting at is how can they where can they access it before mm -hmm. they've decided to apply because it, i don't think anybody's going to not apply because of these requirements but right. um you never know but they, and, they need to know what before they apply and Audrey, what did you say? I didn't hear what you said about how to reference it. I mean, we could put a footnote, but it's it's on the website, and like you said, it's on the it's on the website for but all of our exams too. So I don't know how that it's. I don't know that we're hiding any kind of what's approved. The list is is pretty public, so. No, but the maybe you could just say on the website, uh, listed on the bars uh, website. Something like that. You, you could figure that out later. Yeah. Just to, you know, the admittance ticket is is not the most accessible source. That's all I'm saying. Yeah, but yeah, the ticket isn't, but the bulletin is on the website. Okay, so am I adding a line or am I not adding a line? Um, You could say parenthetically, maybe after devices available on the bars website. Does that work, Alex? Yeah. Perfect. On the state bars website. Does that look good? All right. Thank you, Tammy. You're welcome. Okay, so let's move on. Uh, more language cleanup. Uh, we decided to break out, it used to be just one big paragraph kind of melting all together. So we decided to break out the information regarding uh, applicants who engage in unacceptable conduct. Uh, we wanted to make sure this was its own designated area so that it would be clear that if there is unacceptable conduct, including abusive behavior, both verbally or physically towards state bar staff, proctors, other applicants, or even our facility staff, that it will be subject to dismissal from the examination test center. So that is something that we just broke out and added a little bit to make it more clear with the verbal or the physical um, aspects of that. Um, so you're referring to abusive behavior, but, but you only, is abusive behavior also unacceptable conduct? Yes. And you could issue a chapter six for? Uh, yes, definitely so would think, come with a chapter six. Okay, so I think as a matter of drafting, you should first define abusive behavior and then, um, and then just say applicants who engage in unacceptable conduct will be removed or as it may be removed in the case of some of the other conducts. But you haven't literally defined uh, abusive behavior as unacceptable conduct, except by this. You know, I, I just, uh, I'm being, uh, you guys are really going to start to hate me if you don't already for, for being a stickler for good drafting practice. But um, do you understand what I'm saying? You should define it first before then you say what the consequences are. Um. Yes, I understand. And I can definitely rearrange that. 
Okay. Um, but I also see we are saying who applicants who engage in unacceptable conduct, including abusive behavior, verbal or physical. So I feel like we are defining that. I can rearrange it and say abusive behavior includes this and then say it's unacceptable. But would that be kind of putting the cart before the horse to say abusive first before we address that it's unacceptable conduct? No, I think you define it as... Uh, we can work on this later if you want. Yeah, I, I think um, that's why we all uh, put in abusive or physical, uh, right? Yeah, yeah. Be verbal or physical, so that we. No, I'm. I'm. I, I'm not. I know you're looking for a definition, but I. That can, all right. So, if I may make a suggestion, so I have seen a lot of these provisions uh, in other bar administrations, and one thing I often see in the word that is typically used is disruptive. Disruptive behavior, in any form, is probably not tolerated. And also, I think it's important for us to indicate that it is the administrator of the bar exam who has the sole discretion to determine what constitutes this disruptive behavior. Because I think just by saying, you know, any abus abusive behavior, you don't really have sort of guideline by which to measure whether, you know, a certain behavior is disruptive or abusive for that matter. So I certainly believe that we need to be pretty explicit as, as far as who makes that determination. Um, and also that, you know, I, I think here we were saying the applicant will be subject to dismissal. Um, and I, I, I hear um, what the chair has to say. And I think, you know, we could put in some uh, May language where if we dismiss you, you may not return or allow to be returned, which could result in your exam being um, not scored or things of that nature. So anyway, so this is just a long winding way to say perhaps disruptive behavior will be um, would be better but instead of abusive behavior because uh, disruptive about, isn't necessarily abusive. How about disruptive or abusive? I'm fine with that. Yeah, yeah, I'm fine with that. Yeah, yeah. and do yeah. we mean do we mean that uh, they can be uh, removed, dismissed from the test center only disruptive. for disruptive for this behavior, disruptive or, and not for um, you know the other kinds of unacceptable conduct that are uh, defined above? So, yes, I, that's mainly the biggest thing. Um, we are not dismissing applicants if we confiscate a cell phone from them. We're not okay. dismissing applicants for other violations, but with regards to their behavior, that is where there needs to be some kind of line drawn in the sand to say that, you know, you are going to be dismissed from the exam if this type of behavior happens. And we have had cases like this happen in the past year or so. So it's, you know, something that is fresh on everybody's minds. We could add to this uh, a sentence that says that they would not be allowed back into the test center. Um, and if they don't finish the exam, it's an automatic no grade because you wouldn't have a full set of exams. So there is that component to it. Plus there's sanctions that are, you know, involved as well. Yeah. So. Okay. Um, Tammy, why don't, if nobody objects, you and I, I, I'm not objecting to the concepts here or anything. I'm just uh, trying to get our regulations um, in the best possible form as I understand drafting of regulations and you know i've just been doing it for so long in my career that um that uh you know i have definite opinions about what's appropriate and literally here right now we we have not defined unacceptable conduct you don't define it by saying it's included in it um uh you define it as unacceptable and then you then maybe in this case we say applicants who engage in a, it's disruptive not obstructive is what alex wants um or abusive behavior but um with if the committee is happy with it i'll work with tammy to fix this um offline because it's coming back oh well no actually it isn't you would like to um to put this out today or put if, this to bed today if the committee wants to move it forward then that would be today to the main board meeting. So it's 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 up to the committee. Yeah. I, I prefer um, going through with this now because I think the next administration is coming up right in July. And so I think it's better off that we get this approved sooner rather than later. Otherwise well, it'd be out yeah. in July. It wouldn't meet that time frame regardless. Exactly. 
Oh, okay. Why is that? Because it has to go out for 60 days. For public comment. comment. Yeah. And then okay. come back to the board. Um, and are they only adopting reg packages? Uh, in, no in November and May. Yeah. I think I may have to have a conversation with them about the um, restrictive nature of their approach. Um, so, okay. So, um, Tammy, if, if what I would do is where you crossed out abusive behavior um, in the paragraph above, mm -hmm. I would, I would, um, I would remove the strike out there where it says or abusive behavior at the end. Okay. And then I would say, or disruptive or abusive behavior. And I would um, copy the copy all that uh, from the sentence below. Okay, so are we going with disruptive or obstructive? What is the word we want disruptive, to go with? Disruptive, right, Alex? It's, it's disruptive. disruptive. Do, do you want to go disruptive and or abusive behavior? Do we need and or? Or just disruptive? Disruptive or covers them. Or abusive, okay. E lawyers. Yeah, well, that's what we get um, not paid for at my point. Um, so we're going to go with disruptive or. or and then you okay. could copy the abuse, copy all everything from abusive in the, the next sentence, um, all the way to staff. No, no, the next staff. Okay. Copy that up there. No, copy it. Oh, okay. Go like ahead. That? Or yes. abusive behavior. That's what you want right there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Period. And then, then you could now all you say is, and the next one is applicants who engage in disruptive or abusive behavior um, will be subject to dismissal, et cetera. Uh, from the test center or whatever you said. And then you could add and um, the, the mention of the consequences for their, their um, testing effort. If we want to, what somebody have that in mind? What we said a minute ago, was it you, Alex? Um, you want to step in and provide some words? You said uh, something about non grading of the uh, exam and then uh, the disruptive and or, or disruptive and behavior. and their exam will not be graded. Or um, about a chapter six notice will be issued yeah. and could result. And you guys can change this as I finish it. And could result will. Well, I guess may. I don't know if there's a preference. May, could, will, and may result fine. in a sanction, non grading of exam answers. Um, and test else? failure. Yep. And what else? And test failure. Um, is that, okay, that's what it looks like in its organic form here. Alex, would it be a test earlier, or would it be more accurate to say that, or just, I guess, you can get a zero score on one portion of it, that might be issue, right? Or is this saying that if you're disruptive, then immediately you're getting a zero score on everything? Well, isn't the point they're not going to be let back in? So I guess if unless they do this during the last session, um, there's no way they're gonna make it, right? Right, so if they're dismissed in, let's say the Tuesday PM session, 
they would not be allowed back in for the next session unless there's something that, you know, somebody I, I'm not aware of, basically. Okay. So is this um, good? Alex, you had a, you had a, uh, a phrase as to who is going to determine this type of conduct? Yeah, I was whoever the site administrator would be, but Tammy would be in better position to answer that. So normally the process is in a situation like this, the staff are going to reach out to me and they're going to let me know what's going on. And at that point, uh, we would have discussion about dismissing the applicant. Uh, if something was to happen that was just extreme, then staff might need to do that at that very moment. But usually they're going to reach out to us first on the management team and verify, should we dismiss them or what's going on? But if somebody starts, I mean, I don't know, extreme, somebody starts hitting people, then you know our security on site should automatically eject those people out and there wouldn't be any time for any of that to happen. But in most cases, there's gonna be communication before it happens. How about dismissal shall be um, determined by the site manager? Sounds like they need flexibility though. So can we assign it to one person or one role? Um, on site manager? You have on site, uh, which is correct. Well, I, I don't know that we would say the on site. It would be with basically regards to probably Audrey, I guess you might want to weigh in. Do we want to say, the director and or their designee like we've done in other places. Do we, we need to get that granular about who's dismissing them from the test center? I think Alex is trying to make the point that it's, um, you know, it's a discretionary decision and and sort of insulate us from uh, second guessing. So by state bar down staff. the road, by right? State bar staff, staff it's fine, yeah. okay. And, and then one more thing after that, Tammy, I've got. Um, because the matrix talks about um, a score of zero and not a test failure, do you want to change that? Because that's that would be congruent with how we have it in the chapter six matrix. And what part, Audrey, are you referring Where to? Where it says test failure and a score of zero, because that's how it is in the, the matrix with the sanction. All right, there we go. If that's all right, Paul, I know that was your wording. Yeah, yeah, I'm trying to help others. We all good here? A uh, second sentence, you might want to eliminate due to dismissal from the takeout test center, the uh, test center, test center, and it should say dismissal from the state or dismissal from or by the state bar staff. This well, um, subject to dismissal. Um, I think you need to say where though. Oh, from right? the dismissal test center. Okay, I get from the. If it's an online participant, I don't think they can disrupt or abuse. Okay, no, no, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I, I see where. Okay. Try as they might. I'm good. I'm good. By the way, I'm just curious. Under these circumstances, do applicants um, apply for a refund or are they allowed a refund when they're dismissed? I would, I would think no, but I, I just wanted to confirm. No, there would be no refund. I mean, it would be even any applicant, if they were to leave an exam in the middle of the exam for whatever reason, other than what we were talking about under the 95%, of course, um, they're not entitled to a refund once the exam has started. And I'm just curious, are there any rules that or are there any rules that are explicit about this where if we were to dismiss an applicant, that applicant is not eligible for a refund? Oh my gosh. Where is me trying to think off the top of my head at this moment? I'm not sure where it is, but I, there is something out there. So there that would be in the refund policy, right? Um, well, the refund of fees policy doesn't really speculate on that, but I mean, obviously we could put something in there. Like we can add that and well, I can look it, and see where it's at. Unless it's already in the rules somewhere. Um, sounds like- I don't because I'm only asking because I don't remember seeing it and I think it's gonna be a point of contention when something like this happens. I mean, you might wanna include that. It, it may result in a sanction, comma, non-grading of exams. 
and exam answers, comma, score of zero and non, uh, non refund. Yeah, that's um, a good alternative. Yes, B. Of examination fees. You right click on, there you go. Yeah, it didn't give so, me examination. Yeah, isn't that? <laughs> There we go. Um, the Non-grading of the exam, maybe Tammy, uh -huh. instead of exams, answers. Non-grading of the exam and or a score of zero of the exam, yeah, and or a score of zero. Or, well, I guess we already have an and. Oh, another one. So just leave it like this. And then maybe it's two sentences. Any applicant dismissed from a test center under this rule will not be entitled to a refund of any exam fees. Maybe maybe this is two sentences now. Sorry, Tammy. Yeah, because- okay, Now you just lost me. <laughs> so a chapter six notice will be issued and may result in a sanction. Um, a chapter six notice will be issued and will result in a sanction, which may include non-grading of the exam and or a score of zero for the exam period. And then a second sentence, any applicant dismissed from a test center under this rule will not be entitled to a refund of any exam fees. I, I can put it to you in the chat. Yeah, why don't we do that? Because yeah, you're you're going faster than I can actually process and type it. <laughs> okay, does everyone understand that change? And sounds like it's acceptable to everyone. Any dissenters? Nope. Okay, let's let's roll on, Tammy. All right, let me see. Okay, she's sending stuff through. So let's move on and then I'll go back and, and update that accordingly. Um, okay, so 4.71, uh, mainly just language cleanup. We did reduce this from 30 days to 15 days. That just states that the state bar affirms the chapter six notice and that the applicant must be notified of its proposed sanction within 15 days of the state bar's decision to affirm it. Um, and then sanctions may include, of course, a reduce of a score for a question session or entire exam. That was added as well. And then we also added, uh, according to the chapter six matrix, that one of the uh, processes for some of those violations is a referral to moral character. So we've updated this to uh, match all of that. Uh, here again, just... I think you have it in the item too, but just because that's um, the change of prior to the release of results versus no later than the first committee meeting, the timing of that change. Um, oh, yes, you you're right. Elaborate Sorry. that for the committee. Yes. So we used to hold all of the grades, all of the results for an applicant who was issued a chapter six and it was affirmed and they were entitled to a hearing. We would hold those in abeyance. Um, and the process used to be, if you go back before the Appendix I happened, is that I would prepare the bar exam report. We would provide to you all of the applicants who received a chapter six, and this committee would go through and affirm and agree on sanctions. And then if they had a hearing, we would just hold their grade in abeyance. Well, now that the determinations for the chapter six notices are made at the staff level, we're not holding them in advance anymore. And this really took place during the pandemic that we were having you know, changes that we made based on the online exam and the way things were going during that time period. So we determined that now that we no longer hold any of the stuff in advance and any of the scores, uh, that there's no reason for us to say by no later than the first committee meeting because the committee will hear it on appeal. So at this point, we're saying just that, you know, we're going to take care of this prior to the re release of results for that exam. <laughs> Any questions about that before I continue on? I'm hearing none. All right. Uh, here we changed the language from undisputed to indisputable uh, because there was a thought that indisputable was a better word for this. So we've converted that from undisputed to indisputable. And uh, we added unauthorized electronic into this sentence. It used to not say that. Again, change of words. And here we've cleaned up the language, added some different uh, wording in there or rearranged it. 
Uh, again, added the word sanction to make it clear what a conduct violation sanction. And then here we added, uh, this is where we come into play with the pandemic as well as just outdated technology. So first is that we're doing all of the hearings on Zoom now. And that started when we were in the pandemic and we weren't meeting in person. So we're going to continue to do these by Zoom. And in order for us to point out the fact that this is how we're gonna be doing it, we've added this absent a showing of a compelling reason, all hearing, hearings will be conducted remotely. Uh, if we do have to do it in person, they're gonna to have to be able to provide a compelling reason as to why, uh, because there are other aspects such as now we've got to travel to different offices in order to conduct these in person. Um, That's what we did for moral character recently as well. Okay, so then that aligns with that as well. Uh, we used to do tape recordings. We no longer do tape recordings. Uh, we do audio recordings. So we've updated that language as well so that it's more um, reflective of our current times. And then other than that, uh, that is it. There were no other changes to the rest of this. So this is the proposed chapter six notice of violation policy that we wanna put forth. Uh, let me pull in what Tammy? Audrey sent me. Huh? Tammy, uh, one quick thing. Under uh, 4.71 on reports of conduct violations, I just want to go back to uh, the modification here, the suggested, um, this is under 4.71A. Um, the state bar considers reports of the chapter six notice that have been issued to applicants during or following the administration of an examination or uh, as soon as practicable and prior to the release of results. Um, an applicant uh, uh, must be notified uh, of its proposed sanction within 15 days of the state bar's decision and so on. Here, um, when we talked about prior to the results of release, um, that, uh, that happens um, because of the, the what you mentioned that we had to change from the, uh, when uh, for the in-person exam, uh, we needed to allow more time. I'm wondering here, um, because we wanted to also get results to applicants a little faster, right? Um, uh, that what if we we modified this a bit? You know, I know this is eleventh hour, um, but we part of what we're also resolving here is that uh, sometimes we are notified about a, um, a potential cheating incident, uh, you know, after um, a bar a committee meeting as well. Um, and I'm wondering if we should uh, maybe give uh, the applicant more time, um, a little bit um, of this notice, uh, contingent of those situations, you know, the, where we have people who get notice, for example, um, a month um, after the exam or two months after the exam, we're notified from the National Conference of Bar Examiners, for example, about potential cheating incidents. So here, I'm wondering if we should, um, modify this just to grant a little bit more time uh, that we'll issue um, the um, inf the uh, the feedback. Well, sorry, hold on, where is this? So you, you're saying that you don't wanna be limited by this. So if for whatever reason, you don't learn about it, something in time to, to give them the notice prior to the release of the results, you don't wanna be precluded from doing so. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, and to have the proper due process for the applicant. Um, um, so well, I just wanted to, sorry, one, one quick thing just about the, the wording of this that I think has always been confusing and, and maybe is worth tooling with a little bit more is rule 4.71a talks about the reports of the chapter six notices. What this is really talking about is that incident reports and chapter sixes that used to be issued on the day of the exam. Now chapter six notices are issued after sometimes if it's like video review that leads to it or sometimes NCBE lets us know of an anomaly or something like that. Um, but the rule could use some cleanup in terms of just explaining like the differences between incident reports, the initial chapter sixes, what is meant by affirming a chapter six like all these things, because I just I think A, B, and C are a bit 
confusing and they don't really make the timeline all that clear for applicants um, or even for the CBE to consider like what the effect of these rule changes would be. Okay, and that's the bigger rewrite than just addressing Amy's concern that we would be precluded if we can't get it out before the release of the results. Um, but Amy, is there really a time where we wouldn't be able to do this before the release of results? I mean, you know, with the NCB and stuff, we do receive those before the results come out. I'm suggesting that I think we can commit to doing it sooner. Yeah, but, but do I we... think the due process was um, part of that concern too. So I agree with Caroline. Like, well, okay, so that, but um, I think we could address your initial concern, Amy, by just saying, um, and where possible prior to the release of results. So that would allow us to issue it afterwards if we had no, you know, ability to issue it before. If if that's what you want to make sure we allow for. But Caroline is is suggesting it sounds like a rewrite to make this more informative and clearer to well, everyone. And and that's I don't know that we could do that here on the spot. I think I, it would be difficult. I mean, because here's what I, I guess. So so for the February exam, for example, results are released in July. Is that right? It's May 5th is the release of results. May 5th. Okay. So for for this means that people would get a chapter six, initial chapter six notice, potentially for, for a February exam sometime before May 6th. Then th it's not clear within what timeline the state bar has to affirm that chapter six. There's no deadline, there, there, there's no timeline for that. So that doesn't really provide a lot of information. And then it doesn't talk about how the applicant has 10 days to respond to the chapter six notice either, which they do in practice, but it's not in the rule, but it should probably be in the rule. So I'm suggesting that, yeah, there be a little bit more uh, working out of some of these issues to avoid confusion um, down the road. Sounds um, reasonable. Um, that'll, that'll push it back to June then. Um, I don't have a problem with that personally. Does anyone else? Because it'll give me a chance to review these things in more depth and then I've been able to um, and provide my notes to staff so they they and the working group can consider those as well. That makes sense. Yeah. Agreed. Okay. Um, nonetheless, to inform um, that additional work, are there any other major changes here we should or policy questions we should resolve? Um, so that we're not, you know, at this again um, in June to this level of depth. Uh, Tammy, that's for you, I guess. Uh, I'm, I'm good with what I have so far. And so other than coming back to make those changes, I think that's it for the chapter six. So at this point, um, I will revise refund of fees policy items. We can come back and discuss these further in June, um, as well as the chapter six conduct violations. I think that's covered everything, I think. Okay, to be continued then. Um, yep. We do not need a motion for that. Nope. Um, does anybody else have anything they wanna just highlight before we move on to the next item? Okay, Tammy, uh, you wanna move on to, let me, it's um I think it's actually Amy is oh you could be right. Yeah. Um, oh and it's break time, it must be right. Sorry, I'm I'm uh I would be bad in court because I as a judge because I would really stress out the stenographers, but um does anybody not think we need a break about now? two hours and 15 minutes into the meeting. Okay, let's take a 10 minute break um, and come back at 11.25.
Okay, let's uh, start coming back, folks. Okay, Amy, do, do you wanna get started on the next item? Sure, um, I, let me do that. Uh, Viviana, do you have the PowerPoint presentation that you could put up, please? Thank you. And so um, let me just start by um, no noting the motion. Can we go to slide 10, please? So uh, this is uh, the proposed motion from the uh, report itself. And that's that the committee of bar examiners recommend to the board of trustees to circulate the proposed rules set forth in attachments A through P for a 60 day public comment period. Okay. Okay, go ahead and- All right, so let's start. Sure. So let me start with, um, can we go to slide two? So I worked with three uh, volunteer committee members uh, that included Kareem Gungora, Bethany Peak, and Jim Efting. Uh, the three of us met uh, three times over the uh, past, uh, well, over a two month period. It wasn't um, that recent. And so as we were looking at the rules, these are some of the considerations that we had. Uh, were there any contradictions between the rules of court, the statute and the state bar rules? We wanted to make sure we're clarifying any ambiguity that was either raised by staff or applicants. Uh, we uh, wanted to re revisit the rule with an eye toward access and fairness. Uh, were there any or are there any unnecessary hurdles that exist in the rules right now? Do they further public protection and also consumer protection? So uh, in preparation, can we go to slide three? In preparation for the review, staff met with different stakeholders um, to consult with them on, on these rules. And just as a reminder, some of these rules we had already looked at in 2018 uh, and, made, and proposed some changes to them. I'll discuss that uh, a little bit as we're coming up. And um, in 2019, some of these were implemented. So we already had some contact with some of our stakeholders. So here, uh, we met with, uh, as you can see, represent, representatives from the Association of Corporate Counsel, a registered in-house counsel uh, with legal aid employers, as well as uh, legal aid attorneys and the Legal Aid Association of California, and then also members of the Military Spouse JD Network. Um, and so uh, with these stakeholders, we gathered feedback uh, and we brought it back that's how we organized some of the discussion that we had with the working group. And I wanna be clear, um, next slide please, on what uh, each of the programs uh, that I'm going to describe, uh, what are the parameters of those programs specifically? So I'll be talking about these four programs, registered in-house counsel, registered military spouse attorneys, registered legal aid attorneys, and foreign legal consultants. And to start, uh, just to give you a sense, registered in-house counsel are attorneys that come, uh, licensed attorneys in another jurisdiction, and for all of our categories, they, uh, these attorneys have to be uh, licensed and active in at least one of the jurisdictions that they're practicing in, uh, in order to qualify to uh, serve in either of these uh, positions. For registered in-house counsel, they have to work for a qualifying institution. They cannot hold themselves out as a licensed attorney. Uh, uh, they must reside in California. And as I mentioned, their scope of work uh, really lies in serving their qualifying institute. And they're not allowed to make court appearances or provide personal or individual re representation. Registered military spouse attorneys are uh, attorneys that are coming uh, to work in California as a result of their partner being stationed in California. Some of the program requirements around this is that they cannot practice for more than five years as a registered military spouse attorney. They must reside in California 
Um, obviously, if their partner's being stationed uh, and, the, and the, it results in them coming here, that is a basis of their um, of permission to practice here. Another um, requirement is that they cannot have taken and failed the bar exam within five years immediately preceding the initial application. I'll talk a little bit more about that because that is one of the areas that we're proposing change in. And there's a stricter level of supervision, and I'll be talking about that uh, shortly. For registered legal aid attorneys, they uh, must work for an uh, eligible legal aid organization. I'll talk about th what that includes. They're not required to reside in California. They also cannot practice more than five years as a registered legal aid attorney. And uh, like the registered military, marry, uh, military spouse attorneys, they cannot have taken and failed the bar exam within five years of immediately uh, preceding the initial application. Um, for foreign legal consultants, this is a different practice altogether. So these are attorneys that are licensed in other countries. Uh, there's no, they don't have a supervision requirement. What they do is that they uh, provide a service here in California that limits their ability to uh, uh, provide legal service based on their uh, the law of their home jurisdiction. So uh, we conduct you know moral character. Um, we ensure that they are licensed and able to practice in their home jurisdiction. They're not required to live in California and cannot work on California law. So those are the parameters of those programs. And I wanted to mention um, that in 2019, we made some changes to some of these rules. And so at a broad level, I want to let you know that uh, the changes that we made back then included the fact that um, uh, uh, we allowed, the rules were modified to allow the MJPs to participate in pro bono work opportunities. Um, you know, back in 2018, when we were reviewing these rules, we were reviewing them with the same, with a similar intent that we have today, which is to identify, back then we wanted to identify whether changes were needed to support increased access to um, legal services. And so I mentioned the pro bono working opportunity. So specifically registered in-house counsel, we made it, um, the rules were revised to authorize them to provide pro bono but they had to do that for an eligible legal aid organization, or they could do it for the institute that uh, institution that employed them or employs them. Uh, and then also we made the rule explicit for registered military spouse attorneys that they could provide pro bono services. And it was permitted under uh, ensuring that they're also being supervised by California attorney. Um, all of the application procedures were revised to eliminate uh, the need to submit two applications uh, you know, for well, specific to registered in-house counsel, but we revisited to find um, the procedures themselves to find ways um, to make them easier to access and use by our applicants. Also for registered in-house counsel to promote pro bono work, uh, we required only one application and one set of fees rather than two, one for the pro bono work and one for registered in-house counsel. Also for the registered in-house counsel, um, the qualifying institution uh, used to require that it had at least 10 employees um, uh, or one full-time uh, California attorney. In 2019, that number was reduced to five. The qualifying uh, legal service provider definition also was broadened to extend it uh, beyond, uh, beyond what it was in, in incorporated in the rule. And now anybody that it used to reflect that only those eligible for IOLTA funding were included. Now we include nonprofit legal aid entities and nonprofit law schools that provide civil civil uh, legal aid. Um, also the registered legal aid attorney rules uh, had a maximum of five years and uh, we, I'm sorry, three years and we uh, increased it to five years in 2019. Um, and also we allowed registered legal aid attorneys to work in more than one legal aid or more than one legal aid entity. And the last thing that happened too is that in 2019, we only had uh, two programs under the uh, military uh, MJP. Uh, the registered military spouse attorney was introduced in 2019. So it's a relatively new program. So it's a really good opportunity for us to revisit and uh, look for potential uh, improvements in the program administration. 
So slide five, please. So as you can see here, uh, we're making changes to either uh, clarify or address uh, specific specific uh, issues within the uh, rules that need addressing or that have been pointed out to us by stakeholders or staff. Here, uh, there's three points um, or three proposed sets of changes that affect all of the MJP categories as well as the foreign legal consultants. Here, we want to clarify the eligibility requirements. Right now, I mentioned that the rules read that uh, an applicant has to be in good standing uh, in at least one of the jurisdictions in which they practice in. There have been cases that have uh, come to us um, as we're processing applications where the person may be in active standing, but they're not eligible to practice law. Um, and so what we want to propose in the rule is that we add, uh, clarify that, and we add that uh, the fact that an applicant needs to uh, remain eligible to practice law in at least one of the jurisdictions in which they practice in. And we would do that for all of the MGP categories, including the uh, foreign legal consultants. Uh, the next proposal has to do with uh, suspensions. So MJPs and FLCs uh, can be suspended for a variety of, of infractions, um, such as like failing to register or pay their annual dues. And so, um, so once they're suspended, uh, there's no method for determining what an applicant's intent is. Uh, that is, is their intention to stay in the program and address that infraction? Is it that they want to just uh, terminate out of the program altogether? So we're proposing that we add uh, a, uh, a reason under the terminations uh, for terminating, uh, the ability to um, terminate someone for not addressing uh, or taking actions to address their suspension matter. So, uh, so MJPs and foreign legal consultants would need to take corrective action to resolve their uh, matter, the matter that led to their suspension. And the idea here is that they fail to do that with after six months, this would lead to termination from the program. And the reason this is important is applicants right now that are suspended are not permitted to practice. So uh, terminating someone after six months uh, will also ensure that um, this person has not continued to work while in suspended status, which we believe uh, furthers public protection. And the other thing to keep in mind is that any MJP and FLC who wish to be reinstated after being terminated can do so by applying for a new application. Uh, in that instance, also if their moral character application has expired, they could submit that as well. But the idea here is really to um, ensure that um, we know what um, some, what to do with someone's application once they have been uh, uh, suspended. Um, the last item here is um, there's been confusion on when. Yes. Um, I, it's not clear to me how terminating them if they're currently suspended um, offers any enhanced level of public protection. Um, they could still uh engage in unauthorized practice either way um I, i'm just not making the connection there well um if we if they are suspended um and there's a termination that's uh forthcoming because they have not addressed that a suspension matter most likely we would be sending notices to find out you know um uh prior to that uh termination process so prior to the in, within those six months um, figuring out if, they should, if they're going to address this matter, and then um, and ensuring that they are getting ensuring that they are getting notices that they are not uh, working um, while in this suspension status, and so um, the idea is to terminate them to uh, to ensure that they're no they're no longer practicing. So I think Paul, what this would do is allow us to. Um, uh, uh, submit a notice and also to um, it's a, another way of ensuring that they the termination is another way of ensuring that they don't continue to practice. I mean, I can see it clears the books and uh -huh. and relieves you of the obligation to keep an eye on them. Um, mm -hmm. um, but I don't. Yeah, it seems more for administrative convenience. I'm not saying that's a bad argument, but I'm uh, I'm saying I guess I would buy that one more than that there's some kind of enhanced public protection. 
but okay, thanks. <laughs> All right. Right. The last item then is um, clarifying an, on the uh, that an applicant can start once an application has been approved. There uh, is um, MJPs and, and foreign legal consultants I mentioned are required to submit a moral character application, which has created uh, contributed to confusion about when an applicant could start a practice. So here the rule change is to clarify that an applicant um, in, in these categories can start practice once their application is approved, and they can also practice while awaiting their moral character determination, which is different from our regular life, uh, you know, any, our uh, regular uh, admission applicants. Here, um, MJPs and FLCs, it's not a rule change, it's a current rule, are allowed to work while awaiting their moral character determination. So this is, um, I don't know, perhaps what Paul will, like another a technical clarification that we'd like to make to applicants, because it does come up often. So it would be adding language in the rule uh, to reflect that uh, they could work, they could practice while awaiting their moral character ap application, and once the application has been approved. And I have a question related to that, which sure. is, um, let's say that um, their moral character application hits a snag or staff staff um, is at the point where they have to call them in uh, for a um, uh, informal conference. And they have reason to believe that there is a problem with this particular person's moral character. At what point would they be suspended or otherwise prevented from practicing. My concern is that they could, through the appeal process, they could uh, avoid a final determination that their their moral character is, um, is not going to be approved for quite a while um, and continue to practice when we've gotten some kind of, you know, uh, severe or serious inkling that they should not be allowed to practice. Mm -hmm. um, the rules don't seem to address that at all. We we had something, I, did, I don't have it in front of me, but for the uh, uh, PLL program, we wrote, uh, we wrote some provisions, I believe, that would uh, trigger their suspension at some point in the uh, moral character process prior to um, a final determination. So give me one second, Paul. Um, we do have... Um something that speaks to their their um let me their ability to practice if there is a um one of the reasons for termination sorry let me um is uh any for uh, upon imposition of any discipline for misconduct um and so um and also upon receipt of a negative moral character determination. So in answer to your question of like, what happens if the moral character application itself is in the process of being uh, referred to uh, moral uh, to an informal conference, uh, the issue is this, it really matters like at what point um, the um, item or the, um, I don't know, uh, uh, the, um, I don't know, the uh, matter that uh, makes them, uh, uh, brings them to the informal conference because remember they've already had to um, have past moral character um, in another jurisdiction that makes and they have to be active in at least one of the jurisdictions and most people are coming from one jurisdiction so they've passed moral character in another um, in another state um, so that's one of the um, uh, I think uh, public protection that uh, they that is in in uh, involved involved here. But the question is, if they um, in the process of applying here have a new issue that brings them to moral character, I think um, that will um, uh, that gets triggered in this termination of uh, registration. It's one of the reasons. But it looks right. like Eric has her hands up too. Okay, go ahead. Amen. Amen. Pierce, what's the rationale behind allowing these types of applicants to practice without first clearing the uh, the moral character application? I think the rationale is that they've already passed a moral character uh, process in their home state, and they're in good standing coming into this program from their home state. We as well. I think there's assumption being built there. So. Just because someone 
has good standing. Well, first and foremost, what, do we require them to submit a certificate of good standing from the home from uh, the Supreme the Supreme Court in the home states? Yes, we do. Okay, and and what's duration? Is can they submit a certificate within thirty days or up to a year? What's duration? Uh, the certificate has to be good within uh, the first six months. It has to be six months. Okay, so within those six months, right? If they move to California. You know, there's always a possibility that something could have gone merry or something could have happened. So what we're saying is we're just assuming that nothing had happened during that six months. So by definition, by submitting a certificate of good standing six months ago, we assume they would still have the same standing in California. Is that the assumption being built into this? Yes. And I want to remind you, Alex, we're also adding this component that they have to be eligible to practice law. So if they're no longer in good standing, uh, we would uh, that would be identified um, if they are no longer eligible to practice law, because each of these ha uh, attorneys are required to register with us on an annual basis. OK, I think the only issue I had is a lot of times when you apply, even even for pro hoc or, or, or you know, when you litigate, I think the, good, the certificate standing is only valid for either 30 days or, or a very short duration, but definitely not up to six months. So if we were to consider this, I highly would recommend a certificate standing that is in a shorter period. Uh, this six months gave me a lot of discomfort in a sense that we're just assuming that the, the, the applicant behave you know, the way that they should be within that six months. I, I can't build that assumption into this. But anyway, thank you for sharing that with me. Sure, no problem. Um, and then Paul, oh, sorry, uh, Tara, were you, you were going to say something. Oh, I just wanted to add uh, two things. Well, one was I just wanted to clarify so that uh, as it stands currently, foreign legal consultants, they are not allowed to practice until after they have a positive determination um, compared to the MJP. So that was just one. And then um, also how it currently stands, if someone who is MJP gets a negative determination from staff, um, their status goes, I believe, it's just a su suspended status. They're not allowed to keep practicing as MJP um, going through the appeal process. So it stops at the point that staff issues that negative determination, if it were to be reversed by the committee, then they would be reinstated. But is that in the rule somewhere? Um, because that's before they appeal um, the negative determination, correct? We're talking about that point. So, so they're suspended. Um, if uh, if they do appeal, they don't, they're not terminated from the program necessarily, but they're given the opportunity. I'd have to look back at the RHC rules to see if it's actually captured in there. Yeah, I was, um, I could have missed it easily because I didn't have a lot of time to dig. But um, uh, yeah, I, I just see a very simple statement in these rules that um, they can start to practice before they get their determination. And, and, um, and the ref, if the reference to um, uh, being terminated for an adverse moral character determination is to the final outcome, um, after appeals and all, you know, which can take a while, then that, you know, that that is us allowing somebody to continue to practice that we um, at least initially believe should not be practicing and troubles me a little bit. Well, but Paul, um, there's also under the suspension rules, uh, one of the reasons for being suspended would be failure to comply with the laws or standards of professional conduct applicable to a licensee of the state bar. So imagine if whatever infraction occurs, um, you know, uh, between the time they've been um, uh, deemed eligible to practice law in their home state and then they start here, that would um, suspend an app, a, a, any of these MJP categories. Okay, that doesn't refer to the moral character process. So that refers to new disciplinary uh, behaviors. And does that require that the disciplinary um, matter be fully litigated before it causes a, a, a suspension? The rule's not that specific. It's just failure to comply. Yeah, which suggests, um, you know, reading that in in the applicant's favor that it's only after it's been finally adjudicated. Um, whereas sometimes we, our own bar members, we would suspend if they've if they've done something very bad, um, and while we are resolving, um, you know, their discipline, right? No. I'm also concerned, you know, by 
you know, any potential clients that may be represented by these applicants, if somehow they submit an application, if they start practicing representing clients, litigating in courts, and out of nowhere, you know, their more character application gets rejected and they're suspended at that point in time, well, what would happen to those clients? They're effectively in the limbo. Well, but most of them are being served by an, either yeah. legal aid or the corporation's counsel's office, right? So they would, and they, the attorney supervising them would have to take over. Am I wrong about that? Yes, they do. Uh, that is, um, I'm going to talk about the supervision uh, requirements in a minute, but that's one thing that we want to add is that the supervising attorney would take uh, uh, responsibility for those cases. And that's more relevant also to the registered legal aid attorney and registered military spouse attorneys because they would have clients, remember, registered in-house counsel um, uh, do not appear in court or reading something at the same time. Okay. All right. So um, before we go on, any other questions then about either addressing the suspension matter or clarifying uh, when an applicant could start an application? Um, and Paul, I, I want to go back to uh, one of your concerns, and that is that um, uh, you think that um, perhaps the um, the uh, w this the the way that the moral character um, reference is made here that it's not sufficient to uh, securing that somebody will um, cease working if uh, once like if they're in the informal conference process, for example. Yeah, um, they could um, they could run out the appeals process and be um, representing clients when you know we have our doubts as to their uh, the appropriateness of them continuing to do that. Um, uh, does anybody remember which what the rule number is for the PLL program? I yeah. was going to look at that. Um, I have that uh, pulled up here. It's a four point four seven point one. Okay, I'll take a look at that while you're talking and. So, okay. you, so I can remember what we did there. Oh, I have it up if I can share that. Um, oh, okay. All right. So let me share my screen. Here. So uh, can you read that? Um, I'll read it. Upon uh, initial issuance of an adverse moral character determination by the state bar, if the provisionally licensed lawyer requests a review of the adverse determination under that rule, or, um, or appeals the adverse moral character determination of the committee under that rule of the rules of state bar in lieu of termination, the provisional license uh, shall be suspended until final resolution of the review or appeal. But this, I don't think still addresses the issue that you have, because this is a, upon the issuance of an adverse moral character determination. Well, it says initial. So um, that would be when um, staff has come to the, maybe we have to define it more precisely, uh -huh. but that's where staff uh, isn't unsure about what they think, uh -huh. but they've, um, uh, yeah, maybe this isn't as precise as we'd like either, um, uh -huh. but, um, uh, but it's way before the final outcome. Uh, for yeah. instance, if, if they, um, it could be, uh, they require an uh, informal conference. That's that's probably the earliest stage mm -hmm. where we can uh, say that staff, you know, staff suspicions are are sufficiently arisen. Um, I'm not sure, but but it's way before you know we rule on their appeal mm -hmm. at our level. All right. And so and it simply said, you know, we're not going to kick them out of the program, but we are going to suspend them. And if it turns out that they're okay, then they can start to work again. Is that kind of where you're going, Alex? Um, you'd like to see that level of um, protection? Correct. Oops. Um, can I share my screen one more time? So, cause I, I will, I'll go to that part of the rule. Um, I know I wanted to do a broad um, review, but perhaps I could just show you here. Uh, we could change the language here. So instead of a, 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 upon receipt of a negative moral character determination, um, I think you, changing the language to um, that initial notice, right? Um, initial issuance 
of an adverse uh, moral character of application. And then you include all the suspension aspect. Um, but if there's another section that speaks to suspension, uh -huh. um, it might more appropriately be placed there. Okay, so here's the suspension reasons. Um, yeah. Okay. okay. All right, so we, uh, uh, we'll look at that. So let, that might let, be a solution. Okay, so and, let's- and, Frankly, that comment would apply to all of them, uh, the different types we're dealing with today. Correct. I just happen to pull uh, one up. Right. Okay. All right. So then um, the uh, next uh, set of uh, proposed uh, rule changes are specific to um, all the MJPs. So this, uh, can we go to the next slide six, please? So this is, um, uh, really specific, like I said, to registered in-house counsel, registered military spouse attorneys, and registered legal aid attorneys. And this has been a challenging area for staff. Um, so these three uh, category of attorneys are required to report to the state bar within 30 days of uh, having terminated employment uh, with the qualifying institution um, or their employer. And this doesn't always happen. Um, in fact, state bars sometimes um, learn uh, about somebody's termination only because the MJP attorney submitting a new qualifying institution or a new uh, supervisor declaration um, and, and, and discover that uh, the employment terminated many months prior to their submitting this new uh, update. So, um, and the rules do not provide a mechanism for uh, currently for sanctioning an MJP who fails to report employment terminations. So um, the rules require also um, right now that an MJP maintain an address of record with the state bar, which uh, must be the current California office of the attorney employers and current email address. And so, um, you know, we're concerned with the failure to report this termination uh, of a, in a, or of an employment change. Um, and that creates the oppor opportunities for someone to engage in unauth the unauthorized practice of law, um, which uh, threatens public protection. So um, in response, what we'd like to do is to develop forms and more applicant instruction uh, aimed at guiding applicants on how to make employer, uh, employer changes. Um, and but uh, if staff subsequently learned that a termination of employment, learn about a termination of employment that has not been reported, uh, the, the idea is to terminate uh, those applicants from this program. Um, we anticipate that this change will pro uh, improve compliance considerably. Um, so here the recommendation is to uh, terminate those who uh, do not report their uh, termination within 30 days. Uh, the next item is uh, clarifying the state bar rules, making sure that they conform with the rules of court. Uh, so right now, uh, the state bar rules um, note that, uh, that somebody um, can be suspended upon voluntary transfer to an active status or uh, the uh, functional equivalent uh, needs to be corrected because as I noted before, the California rules of court note that Somebody needs to remain uh, active and now eligible to practice law in at least one jurisdiction so that um, going into inactive status should not be a reason for, um, for uh, suspension. And so we want to make that correction uh, to all the MJP rules here. That's, that's when they have multiple um, licenses, and but they do have to keep one active, correct? At least one active, correct. Okay, gotcha. Okay. All right, any questions about these then? All right, let's go to the next uh, slide then. So these are changes that are specific to registered legal aid attorneys and to registered military spouse attorneys. So right now the California rules of court uh, note that uh, both of these uh, attorney categories cannot have taken and failed the exam within five years of the initial application. Um, this does not uh, apply to registered in-house counsel. And this is one area that we've uh, received significant stakeholder feedback um, about the negative effect it has on participation. 
we uh, staff researched the origins of this rule to determine what, what the intent was and whether this intent continues to be uh, justified. So in, 2022, in 2002, uh, a, a committee was implemented and uh, the committee is uh, was charged with drafting the rules that would expand the circumstances under which a, a, an attorney licensed to practice law in another jurisdiction uh, could come and practice, um, how they could be permitted to practice in California. And this formed the rules for the registered, uh, for legal services attorney, which is the category we're talking about here, registered legal aid attorneys. And um, the idea was that the program was built around the, the notion that um, these attorneys could come and provide legal services to indigent clients on an interim basis before taking the bar exam and under the supervision of an experienced member of the state bar at a specific qualifying uh, provider of legal, uh, for a uh, qualifying provider of legal services. So the original rule um, you know, limited the practice to three years after which an attorney must take and pass the California bar exam if they wish to continue to practice law in California. So the original intent of the program was for out-of-state uh, attorneys wishing to uh, come and work here temporarily in the capacity of RLAA. Um, and that may no longer be uh, an applicant's intent. Um, some applicants wanna continue beyond um, the five years um, as a long-term career providing that service here in California. When we discuss this with the working group, um, you know, the members discuss that this requirement may no longer be relevant and may be creating an unnecessary barrier uh, to participation and may not be necessary for public protection. Um, so, you know, we talked about the fact that perhaps this was a public protection, it was established because the idea was this individual was unable to pass a bar exam and now they're working, uh, now they're being allowed to practice in California. Um, but I think we also have to recognize that it, they're doing so in a limited environment and under the supervise, under the supervision of a licensed attorney. Uh, so opening the program to out-of-state attorneys, um, regardless if they've taken the bar exam, we don't feel poses a threat to public protection. because so we also have the other mechanisms in place, such as remaining in good standing and now eligible to practice law in their home jurisdiction, as well as the moral character uh, uh, the moral character requirement and the supervision of working under an attorney. And so uh, the proposal here is to eliminate that. Um, I mentioned that um, the registered military spouse attorney program started in 2019. The rules were designed to reflect the other um, categories. So this change would also uh, be implemented for the registered military spouse attorney. And uh, because also we don't want to disincentivize some applicants from taking the exam itself. Um, so uh, here uh, we think that removing this will allow people who want to take this exam, you know, either pr prior to coming to California or, um, uh, you know, while they're in this, um, uh, well, it doesn't affect uh, while well, they're in the position, but anybody who's taken it before should not be deterred from participating in these programs. And so, um, yeah, that is a proposal here is to eliminate this requirement um, in an effort to eliminate unnecessary uh, hurdles that per could be um, impacting uh, program participation. Uh, the other area here that I wanted to highlight is uh, the supervision requirements. So this is an area that we've heard a lot of concerns um, about the onerous supervision uh, requirements um, for uh, these areas. Um, so right now, anybody who's working with uh, in a registered legal aid attorney and a registered military spouse attorney, their supervising attorney must approve in writing any appearance in court, uh, de a deposition, arbitration, or other proceedings. And the supervising attorney must also read, approve, and personally sign any pleadings, briefs, or similar documents that they that the RLAA or RMSA prepare. And the rule was intended to protect public prote protection uh, for um, from the non-California licensed attorneys who may not have the requisite skill in certain instances to practice California law without supervision. And so. 
when we also discuss this with the military spouse network, they report that the supervision uh, uh, requirement may also be contributing to the low participation rate. So I mentioned that the program started in 2019, and since that program started, we've only received 25 registered military spouse applications. Um, you know, it, when we drafted the rules in 2018, the supervision requirements was an area that received a lot of criticism. Um, it compelled the board to direct the staff to revisit this rule in a year. Um, it's now been four years and so we're coming back to it now. Um, and so what we're proposing here for, um, and um, what the working group, uh, what we landed on uh, is, you know, they recognize the burden that this level of oversight has, but also uh, some level of supervision um, is uh, still required. So the, the proposal is to add a safeguard that exists in the registered military spouse attorney rule um, into the registered legal aid rule, which is that the supervisor agrees to assume control of the work of the RLAA in the event that uh, that RLAA is terminated, but that we that we for both of the rules for both of these uh, classifications that we remove and eliminate the oversight of approving and writing and reading, uh, approving and personally signing all of the pleadings, briefs, and so on. So the idea is to remove that portion of the supervision component. Um, again, the working group believes that this change is necessary, is, is unnecessary, it creates an unnecessary hurdle, and that with the additional requirement that the supervisor assume control for the RLAA in the event of a term, termination, that um, it will ensure that uh, there's a, a public protection safeguard in, the, in place as well. All right, now uh, the last item here for both of these rules is about the uh, limiting participation to five years. So California allows longer participation in the RLAA than many other states. Um, there aren't that many states that have a registered military spouse attorney program. So uh, I'm making that comparison here. So the working group um, discussed whether the limitation to five years um, is necessary uh, for public protection. And the recommendation is to eliminate it, um, to allow uh, registered legal aid attorneys to work beyond five years um, and, and to provide more uh, legal services in California. And for registered military spouse attorney is to um, eliminate the five-year rule because there could be instances where a military spouse is, or uh, yeah, is stationed in California beyond five years. Um, and so that it's tied to their, uh, the um, spouse's uh, um, condition uh, as being stationed, a military person, military personnel stationed in California. Um, the idea is, um, you know, the, the working group um, think that the, the benefits um, are, are vast. And that also that the it does not, it would not threaten public protection again because the other safeguards exist and that includes the good standing and eligible to practice law the moral character clearance and uh, working under a licensed attorney uh, and so uh, here the proposal is to eliminate uh, the five year rule for both of these uh, attorney classifications. Amy, this is Alex. I, I have a lot of questions, actually, and I okay. wish I wish we went through each one of these individually because I, I think each one of these issues could have been addressed. You know, uh, each one of them will probably warrant several hours of discussions. But um, we can go through more of the red lines too, if you want to, Alex. Go ahead. Yeah, but I, but I but I think at the at the conceptual level, I want to make sure I personally understand. Uh, let's just start with the last one, limiting participation. By eliminating the participation to five years, are we saying that the, the military spouses and legal services attorneys can practice beyond the five years, meaning they don't ever have to take the bar exam again? Correct. I just want to make sure I understand. Okay, that's understood. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and, 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 and for the supervision requirement, am I understanding that what is being proposed here is basically remove the requirement of having a supervisor because of what is believed to be um, a protection me mechanism in place to assume services when, if and when, <clears throat> either the military spouses, attorneys, or, or um, legal services attorneys are suspended, right? So by, by assuming those services, 
you know, by someone within either the legal aid or, or, or someone else, that in itself is what we believe to be a protection mechanism for the public. Am I correct? Um, no. Uh, so I want to correct uh, one thing. So Alex, you said that um, this is the elimination of supervision altogether. It's not. It's um, eliminating uh, some of the components to that supervision, which include that uh, written uh, um, per permission to appear in court, um, right. the uh, need to re review, but it doesn't eliminate um, supervision. And I'm pulling up the um, uh, specifications of what that supervision okay. looks like to see what's left if we take that portion out. So give me one second. Okay. Because I'm also looking at the rules. Obviously, the qualifying supervisor has to sign a declaration, mm -hmm. you know, making sure that you know, sufficient supervision, you know, has been provided. And so I don't know if we're going to be itemizing each item. I, I do agree, you know, some of items seem to be extraneous, meaning it's really not necessary. But at the same time, I, I, I certainly have a sense that the, the, the requirement is in place, not as a matter of formality, but more to make sure that supervision has to be properly rendered. I think that's the spirit of the rule. If we want to go through each one of the things that the supervisor has to sign off on, happy to talk about it. But if the spirit is to eliminate you know, sufficient um, uh, safeguards to ensure the supervision has been provided, then that's a big no for me. Yeah. But so, uh, so Alex, let me um, uh, may, let me make it easier by pulling up the potential, the um, uh, proposed revisions to uh, Rule of Court 9.45. So um, can I uh, share my screen, Viviana? Um, all right. Thank you. Here we go. So uh, let me know if you can see my screen. Can you see this? Not uh, yet. Not yet, Amy. Okay. How about now? It's starting. There it is. Okay, great. So, um, Alex, it's not to get rid of the supervision requirement altogether. As you can see here, it's uh, there's still a supervision. So. Um, the supervisor must is must be someone who's uh, practiced law, a full time occupation for at least five years in in the U.S. in a U.S. Jur jurisdiction. Uh, they must have practiced law in California for at least two years immediately preceding the time that they start the supervision and be in good standing with the state bar. Assume professional responsibility responsibility for any work that the registered legal aid uh, attorney performs under the um, attorney supervision. They must assist counsel and provide direct supervision of the registered legal aid attorney in the activities authorized by the rule. Here you can see that uh, the, the proposal is to remove uh, this, these activities um, and they may in his or her absence designate another attorney in, the, in some of these requirements. But, but again, the idea is, um, you know, as you suggested that the spirit of the law is still to keep a supervisor in uh, overseeing uh, both of these classifications. Yeah, so I, I, I'm, I have some issues with the crop house, and I can start with the, the, five, uh, the fifth one, and, and okay. this is all for the full committee. The fact that we're crossing out must read, approve, and personally sign any pleadings and briefs. So by crossing that out, the, the net effect is that now we're saying these attorneys who are coming from out of state can sign all the briefings and motions and pleadings, all without the supervisor confirming that whatever they're signing is appropriate. I think that's the issue I'm having is crossing that out basically puts the burden simply on the applicants and not on the supervisors. Am I reading this correctly? Yes. Yeah, so, so a supervisor would not have to um, uh, uh, read, appro approve, and personally sign. So, so that's the issue. Let's just give you a quick scenario. Someone just graduated from law school. In fact, you, you know, there are jurisdictions where you don't even need to take the bar exam and you can practice law. And one of them, I think we talked about this at the Blue uh, Ribbon Commission is New Hampshire, right? You just graduate from, from the school. Um, as long as you're in part of the Daniel Webster program, you can graduate and you can practice law right away. Let's just assume for a second, you have a spouse and now you move to California without having any practice under the belt, coming from a different state with no bar exam previously uh, taken, mm -hmm. coming to practice here in California. And under that assumption, we're allowing this applicant 
with no previous experience, they're just graduating out of law school, to write motion, to appear in courts, to jab a pleading, all without having any kind of responsibility taken by the supervisor. Now, is that the scenario that we want to contemplate that would say, yep, it's okay, not a problem at all? That's the net effect that I'm seeing by, by this cross out. And that's well, the issue you should have. But Alex, I just want to correct something. So they're not, um, it, it's not just a law school graduate. You have to be an active licensee in good standing in another um, jurisdiction. So they sat yeah. for the bar exam, possibly, and passed it and become licensed. And so um, that is just a distinction I want to point out. Can you go back to um, to, to, to the process, to sure. the amendment? Sure. Let me go back. And there's, they remain responsible for the work of the lawyer. So, so to the extent that they're worried about um, adverse consequences, they would perform some of these things, but they would do it at the level they thought was appropriate. But where does this say there are still going to be, they could be disciplined if not, if improper supervision or insufficient supervision is being provided. It's where I, I, I just don't see it under supervision. Well, there is it's, it's, no accountability. Um, Amy, there was language to that effect in the PLL stuff again. Maybe there's a better um, version <clears throat> of paragraph three there that we could uh, we could steal from the PLLs. Um, yeah, yeah and so point point out to me where is the accountability if something bad happens? Oh yeah, here it is. Number five, must agree to assume control of the work of the registered legal aid attorney and may in, in and so on. So there is that. that that's not accountability, Amy. Mm -hmm. If someone screws up and say, okay, I'm going to assume control now that something has been screwed up, that's not accountability. That's to protect the client, right? Okay. That's to protect to say, hey, someone has to fill in that spot anyway. So I'm going to either I assume control or someone else and a different attorney assumes control. But that doesn't take what away about, from their responsibility for well, not what about number, sorry what about number four must assist counsel and provide direct supervision of the um re, registered legal aid attorney in the activities authorized by this rule right and and this is what they're authorized to uh work in hold on amy what's the yeah. What's the rule for the PLLs? Again, I'll take a look there while you're- 9.4.1.1. 9. 9. Yeah. And that's a rule of court, right? Yes. Okay, I'll take a look, thanks. Okay. And I believe it, that it's uh, more broad for PLLs, but you'll take a look at that. So, um, so Alex, what would you suggest uh, would address your concern about, uh, I guess, more accountability on the part of the uh, supervisor? The second one, check the rules as well. Okay. <clears throat> what number? 9.51 or 41? 41. 9.41. Oops. Oh, that's military council. 949. It's yeah. 9.49. Yes. Okay. That's it. And 9.491. So I, I know when they sign the declaration, they have to consent to them being subject to the discipline authority of the Supreme Court or any disciplined uh, ruling if they improperly um, or if they, if they didn't properly supervise those attorneys who later are suspended for you know rendering um, incompetence or improper legal services. Am I correct? I think that's sort of stated in just give an example. I think for registered legal services attorney programs, I think rule number four under registration to apply to practice law as one of those attorneys they have to sign a declaration or they have to get a, a declaration by those supervising attorneys. They do. You're correct. Um, I can share the the two paragraphs from the PLL that I don't think they're 
as great as I was hoping, but might be a little better. And is that too small? No. We can see it. Okay, so it'd be um, be these two here, be F. I'm not gonna highlight it all because that might make it harder to see. And then G. I don't know if that's any better for you, Alex. Yeah, I, I, I maybe it's just me. I failed to I fail to see how this uh, is for paragraph F that you're highlighting, how that provides any sort of accountability. And well, look at this the, is more of a look at the next ahead. one. I, I guess it's a similar concept. Yeah. yeah. And so go ahead. And and I just want to say so G is in uh the current supervision rule. And then uh, F is one of the suggestions that we're adding here um, about uh, assuming um, control of the work uh, in the event it becomes necessary, right? But, I think but again, this, F is a better way of saying it, I think. Okay. Yeah, but it, isn't it common sense though? If an if, if an attorney gets suspended, the supervisor has to find someone to replace, you know, assume responsibility anyway. So F is just basically telling you what a common sense will look like. Mm -hmm. Right. Alex, is what you're asking for is the strike throughs in that rule to, to not be, is that that would meet what you're asking for, not to rewrite something else, but to take out the strike throughs? So, you know, if, if I'm remembering correctly, you know, during the Blue uh, Ribbon Commission, I think one of the concerns among other, some of many of the commissioners is that supervisors are not providing proper supervision attorneys that really need supervision and so the burden is really on the supervisor making sure they're spending the time and the effort and the energy to grooming or supervising those attorneys especially those that are just coming out of law school that's really the key and so uh, to me the spirit of the rule that is being crossed out ensuring that they sign off on everything is really to reinforce that theory or that that theme which is you know, the supervisor really has to check, you know, every single box. Now, I agree for, you know, the more experienced attorneys, this seems a little extraneous, onus. I absolutely agree, and it's tedious at some point. But at the same time, you, we have to strike a balance between whether this is a matter of formality or whether this is really a way to protect and to ensure proper supervision. And for me, I do see the crossed out portion as being the latter and not the former. Mm -hmm. Right. And, 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 and I don't know if that's really the spirit of why we're crossing this out, especially if we're already saying all the supervisors have to assist and counsel and provide direct supervision, right? That is just another way to further nail the scope of what that supervision looks like, right? And, and so that's what I'm having. That's why I'm having so much difficulty understanding why we're crossing this out. If this is just a formality, well, we are not taking things out for the sake of formality. We're, we're taking, we, we can't take things out because of that. <clears throat> so anyway, if, if, by the way, um, Audrey and Amy, if you're you know, representing to me that the cross out portion is already subsumed in the, in, in the language where they have to provide direct supervision, then by all means, and I agree with you. But I'm just saying that that's not what I'm seeing or feeling. Um, and I would defer to everyone else since I seems to be the one that, that has the most uh, issues uh, with the crossed out portions. Yeah, but and Alex, it's not subsumed in another portion or in, in the uh, uh, supervisory, uh, dec supervisor declaration, um, just, just to address that part. Yeah. Okay, thank you for confirming that. Can we go back to the, um, to the strikeouts? Uh, sure. both amendments. Mm -hmm. Can we zoom in? Sorry, I am. Sure, no problem. I will. How's that? Figure yeah. Out? Okay. Yeah. So, as a committee, well, I would recommend just going through. You know, if you're looking you're looking at five, there are a couple of things. There, 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 there are pleadings and there are briefs, right? And then there are maybe some. I don't know what similar documents really mean. Um, and we can talk about those, what that entail, you know, we can go through each one of those, whether it makes sense for supervisors not even have to sign off on those things. And I'll be remiss for any courts to, <clears throat> to 
you know, not to have a supervised response during those periods. It's pretty dangerous. But that being aside, you know, also under four, you have courts and depots and arbitration. It's, I agree, deposition, it's meaningless. There's no reason for, for, for them to have to sign up on a depot. But for arbitration, where um, an arbitration ruling could be binding on a client and any legal proceedings, those I would assume have, should, be, um, over, should be supervised by a proper supervisor. So again, I, I just, all of these strikeouts are telling me we're just trying to relax the rules so that the supervisors don't have to do their job. That's sort of the sense I'm getting. Yeah, uh, the report is that um, that this task could be deterring employers from recruiting registered legal aid attorneys and registered military spouse attorneys. I'm sorry, Amy, I missed that. Can you say it one so, more time for me? So this task, this um, the the it's it's an onerous assignment for supervisors, and so that could. Contrib that contributes to the lowered number, uh, low participation. Um, I mentioned uh, for registered military spouse attorneys, you know, since the program started, we've only received 25 applications. So this contributes to uh, some of that low participation rate. It's a lot of work for a supervisor to do this. Okay. But do we have any um, empirical evidence or study or report that demonstrates that the low number of participation is primarily attributed to these rules? Well, we uh, we wouldn't be able to get data. So, um, but we've been to meetings. We've been to um, uh, we went to a hearing in uh, Cal in um, Sacramento soon after this program launched, and also. Um, uh, like I mentioned, we met with stakeholders in preparation of uh, in, in preparation of getting these rules together, gathering um, ideas, and that has been reported is that this is, um, uh, it contributes, at least for the registered mil military spouse attorneys. Yeah, and that's also common sense, right? If you relax the rules, it makes sense for anyone to, to, to be able to do the same, right? And so you would increase the participation rate because the restrictions would no longer be there. It, it also, it's also common sense, too. So I don't blame you for not having any kind of um, uh, study or statistics. Um, mm -hmm. That being said, the, the, the other issue um, that I'm really having is how it runs afoul, at least, well, I wouldn't say runs afoul, but it's going to create a lot of conflicts with respect to what is already being considered by the Blue Ribbon Commission. The, the, the one being the last, uh, I think, proposal that you have, eliminating the five-year participation requirement, mm -hmm. right? I, I think right now, as we have it, is after the the fifth year, you have to take the bar exam. And so by eliminating that rule, essentially what we're saying is, you know, those legal aid services attorneys, as well as legal um, uh, um, military spouse attorneys no longer have to take the bar exam. I think you already alluded to that. Am I correct? Correct. Mm -hmm. Right. So now, again, this is just for the, for, the, for the full committee. What we're saying is we're going to allow those two types or categories of attorneys to practice law in California without ever having to take the bar exam. I'm not really certain. One, I think this is something that um, uh, uh, that is really important. And I'm not really one. I'm not certain that the committee can make that decision. But two, if you look at the statistics and the public comments that we received um, for the Blue Ribbon Commission that Amy alluded to earlier, there are at least 385 comments received with respect to out-of-state attorneys. And I would, and, and more than half of those comments received. Um, and in fact, none of the 50% comments received, well, no, let's just take it back. 30% of the comments really advocate for some kind of bar exam. And another 30% requires some kind of reciprocity with really some certain condition. But you only get 4% where, you know, the commenters advocate some, you know, co-media, no bar exam whatsoever. So it tells me the, the public as a whole really wants these attorneys coming from out of state or out of country to pick the bar exam precisely because this is a, one state where we have a lot of really weird case law and case precedents. And so for us to now tell the world, hey, if you're doing legal aid services or part of the military, then you don't have to take the bar exam. I just fail to see the logic behind that. Um, if the issue is to increase participation, well, I don't think we have a shortage of applicants taking the bar exam or wanting to practice on California. So I wouldn't really look at that issue as we're trying to expand the program to increase or encourage participation. Um, but again, I'm, I'm just thinking from 
from from the side of, of public protection on one hand, but also it's striking the balance to, to understand what makes the most sense. Mm -hmm. Those comments on the Blue Ribbon are about um, how out-of-state attorneys might get admitted on motion. And I, I think maybe for these these programs, they'd still be limited to, to the constraints of the program. We're not talking about admitting them on motion. Right. But 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 I think the I think mean, this is a matter of semantic, but am, am I correct, Audrey? But the, still, they don't have to take the bar exam, correct? Uh, assuming they, you know, pass the more character um, and, and, you know, and, and be able to... Pro whatever the rules are, are, are now enumerated here, but the fact remains, they don't have to take the bar exam. In, in these rule revisions that, yeah, but they would still be in the confines of the program that they're admitted to, right? These are the special admissions program rules. They would still be constrained um, by the boundaries of these programs. And I see Ashley has her hand up as well. Well, and, oh, go, go ahead, Ashley. Oh yeah. Um, so I, I also wanted to just confirm that it's not that they would have indefinite access to practice, right? Because both of them require a limitation of no more than five years of practice. So regardless, if they wanted to stay in our jurisdiction, they would have to take the bar after that five years. Is that, is that correct? Correct. Well, the proposal is to eliminate that restriction though, correct? Mm -hmm. There's a right. Yeah, the proposal is to eliminate that. Um, but an alternative is to, you know, uh, you know, we're presenting this to the um, CBE um, to weigh in on that. We could um, remove that, uh, the elimination of that five-year uh, uh, rule as well. And I also want to point, point out to Alex, sorry, Ashley, I don't know if I've been no, that, okay. um, Yeah, I, I think most of my point was that I think realistically the big issue seems to be that five years. It seems to provide that, that um, consumer protection that we're concerned about and um, and also allows for at least, you know, my, my assumption is for the military spouse, specifically the five years is useful because the point of the military spouse is that they move so frequently, correct? Like with, the point is that they move for their spouse's service. So five years to me makes sense. Um, it, just by, by nature of the program. The legal aid attorney, I feel, has more of a drawback to getting rid of that five years because then they would feasibly be practicing indefinitely um, with, you know, obviously under the same restrictions that we have already outlined, but I have more of a concern for, do, I guess, getting rid of that five-year requirement for you know, positions like the registered legal aid than I do for the military spouses, which could have, you know, their own set expiration dates more likely, I guess. Mm -hmm. that's, that's kind of my point. Okay, thank you. And um, and, uh, go ahead, I'm sorry. Alex, one thing I want to point out that's um, really important is that um, your concern about this, um, uh, the, um, this somebody practicing from out of state and the supervision, um, and as well as um, like not having a um, a, um, a limitation, um, registered in-house counsel now can practice without. Uh, there is no um, uh, expiration in terms of they don't have a five-year limit as 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 do the registered legal aid attorney, registered military spouse attorney. So I right. just want to highlight that that policy. Right. And Correct, those, but, yeah. but the huge distinction is that they don't really practice law in courts. They can't appear in courts. They can't sign off pleadings, mm -hmm. right? That's that's something that these out-of-state attorneys, mm -hmm. these military spouses attorneys would be able to do because they'll be practicing in private practice or in public sector, right? Whereas in-house counsel are not allowed to do that. Mm -hmm. So for in-house counsel, there's really not much protect, public protection that we have to think about because their client and their only client is the company for which they represent or for which they're employed. Whereas these attorneys actually represent either the general public or private clients, right? Mm -hmm. Two separate distinctions. But another thing I wanted to allude to, um, uh, Ashley brought, brought up a pretty good point. When I think of military spouses where they move around constantly, they would be advocating or at least agreeing or consenting to the five-year rule. So it doesn't make sense to me that they, they want this rule eliminated, right? Because it sounds to me that now by eliminating this rule, they have now the choice to stay in California for longer than five years, 
right? Which seems to be contrarian, I think, in many, in many, in many ways, that this would be something they would advocate for. Are you referring to the registered military spouse attorneys? Correct. Yeah, but we are um, noting that um, the five-year rule would be eliminated, but it, but their ability to work here would be contingent on their spouse continuing to be stationed in California. So rather than the deadline being five years, the deadline would be um, as long as your spouse is stationed here, then and that's a condition of your ability to practice here in that in that limited basis. Understood. I, I think that that's what I was trying to say earlier. Okay. Is that if, if the thought is they move around so much, this rule would be something that would have no issue at the beginning. But anyway, I think we may be talking past each other. But okay. um, I, I don't know where so where else to go here. The one recommendation that I, I think would be appropriate here is you know as the Blue Ribbon Commission is actually considering this issue, and this you know, this is the recommendation that the Supreme Court will have to consider anyway in light of the report and recommendation that the B, uh, BRC is submitting. I think what would be more appropriate is let the court decide on that before we go on and, 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 and see how we can further amend the rules because the Supreme Court may literally make a lot of these issues go away. A lot of these issues would likely be muted. If the court says, yes, let's allow out of say attorney's practice, you know, based on reciprocity or the no bar exam, whatsoever, a lot of the court decision will have a direct effect and impact on, on these amendments. So Alex, um, is your suggestion then to keep the rules as is until that happens? I think that is what Alex is saying is it's so broad. If we, if we broadly go for reciprocity, a lot of the um, applicants who would fall into the special admissions categories could just get admitted on motion. Mm -hmm. Is that what you're saying, Alex? Yeah, and and, and at the and, same and, time, this will put you know, if, depending on how we go go with this, you know, it could create conflict with the Supreme Court's uh, ruling ultimately on our recommendation on BRC's recommendation. So, you know, just in light of all of these issues, and just to err on a side of caution, I certainly personally believe that we should just table this, you know, until the court decides on these recommendations, including reciprocity. And when you say table this, you mean all of the proposed rule changes for military. No. For just for, supervision. The supervision pieces, just the supervision, right? And um, and it sounds like well, you well, it's not just supervision, but I, I think we we talked about eliminating the, the five year particip participation requirement, right? Mm -hmm. I, I think they're all tied together. Okay. And I'm not sure how meaningful or fruitful for us to proceed without first, you know, cementing these two issues uh, unless you want to you know do things in piecemeal which i'm fine of that uh, which i'm fine with um, well, but i think sense do you think go ahead Amy. can i suggest one thing because I, I totally understand what you mean so i think that you want to do more of a comprehensive view of the proposed changes to see if reciprocity comedy policies might affect uh you know how we're changing those rules right now or Correct. what the net effect is of all of that. So uh, what if I propose finishing the presentation and going through the rest of the recommendations, and then we could walk through what you're suggesting, and that is right now, it looks like supervision and the elimination of the five-year term limit are uh, up for uh, potential revisiting, um, and then uh, we'll flag other ones as I finish a presentation. Does that sound okay? That is, that is acceptable. And then Thank Amy you. and the, and. Paul, the chair, we might also take a lunch break maybe after you do the slideshow. Yes. All right. All right. Uh, so can we open the presentation and go to slide eight, please? I'm almost done. I have two more slides, I swear. Sorry, folks. Um, here we go. So here, uh, the idea uh, I mentioned earlier that um, we're registered in-house counsel. Uh, these attorneys have to work for a qualifying institution. Uh, in 2019, um, uh, or prior to that, uh, each of these qualifying institutions had to have at least either uh, 10 um, employees um, and or one California attorney. In 2019, we lowered that to five. Here, the um, uh, proposed uh, is uh, rule change is to reduce that from five to three. The idea is that um, in most other states that have a registered in-house counsel, that there is no minimum uh, number of employees. Um, and also, you know, 
the working group discussed the fact by, that by limiting the number of employees, it limits the opportunities for smaller companies to uh, participate. Um, but the group is also concerned with removing the requirement altogether um, it, it, because it, it may be maintaining that number of minimum uh, number of employees preserves um, it'll it preserve the uh, integrity of the program. So here the suggestion is to reduce that um, to three and uh, believing that that does not pose a threat to public protection. Um, and then also uh, this is a bigger, uh, 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 more impactful uh, rule change. Currently, um, both the state bar rules and the rule of court require that a registered in-house counsel must reside in California. Uh, we investigated how this works in other jurisdictions and the practices varied. So in, in New York, for example, registered in-house counsel are allowed to work um, as registered in-house counsel in the state, but they don't, they don't have to reside in New York. Other jurisdictions like Colorado require in-state residency as does California. So uh, we discussed the fact that, you know, uh, legal and business transactions are being handled very differently, especially post pandemic. Uh, there's an increased amount of telecommuting, teleconference, video hearings, electronic court filings, um, and this is done, you know, nationally. And so uh, the idea is to remove the residency requirement. Um, uh, and so that uh, registered in-house counsel could work from uh, their home state. Um, and this is, you know, recognizing that uh, technological advancements um, will, uh, you know, permit individuals to participate in this way. It exists for registered legal aid attorneys that they could work out of state and participate as registered legal aid attorneys in California. The idea is also that this would open uh, the possibility of increased legal services in California. And so uh, that is the recommendation here. Uh, and that's a big uh, policy decision, I understand. I don't know if we want to take more time to discuss that uh, at this moment. Amy, so I want to understand personally. So by lowering the number of employees, um, and by the way, uh, looking at the um, the attachment attached to the, um, to the agenda, I think it says employers, but thank you. This is employees. So by lowering the number of employees, do we know how many institutions would be qualified versus, you know, with just three employees versus five? Uh, no, we don't have, uh, we, people don't, do not submit applications, right, that we could look at and say they were rejected uh, based on the number of employees, right, because people might call and inquire and they don't apply altogether. Um, but we did not find a risk, like when we moved from 10 to 5, so I think that is the thought process here, and the fact that the working group didn't want to eliminate the um, uh, employees altogether, because as I stated, in other jurisdictions, that is not a, a that's not required. So how do we come up with the number three? Um, you know, we have Kareem on. He's only uh, this is uh, also part of the challenge here is that um, uh, we had three working group members. Jim and Bethany are not here, but Kareem is here. I'm wondering if he could help weigh in on this. Yes, uh, thank you, and uh, thank you for the spirited discussion. I didn't want to. Uh, interject too much. Um, I think a lot of uh, concerns are being elevated, but I guess from the side of the working group, we were looking at streamlining and kind of identifying um, ways that we could kind of simplify some of these processes that we have in place. So uh, in regards to this one, I, I think we were looking for brevity and kind of simplicity. So uh, for the most part, there wasn't too uh, big of a uh, more convoluted response for that, but but hopefully that provides some background. Got it. So it's understood. So the number three, it's just the number that we just came up yeah. without any. Pretty much. Okay. Yeah. Like five. Okay. And, and and maybe I'm not understanding. Um, can you elaborate a little bit more again, the spirit of lowering this number? Is it just so that we, you know, we would anticipate more institutions being qualified, meaning more nonprofits and more legal aid would, would, would be able to participate in these types of program? Uh, this is for registered in-house counsel. This is not registered legal aid. I'm sorry. So, yeah. Thank you. Corporations. Yeah, so for corporations. Uh, we have a lot. Um, uh, the majority of um, participants in registered in-house counsel are large corporations. So um, idea is uh, by lowering this, it would allow smaller ones to be able to um, uh, practice uh, 
those who have an office in California, the eligibility to practice. It wouldn't be limited by this five employees if we lowered it to three. Um, you know, we do have uh, startups that want to apply uh, for something like this. Um, and they either needs, uh, like I said, either California attorney or at least five employees and people have uh, are challenged to meet that threshold. So by lowering it to three, the idea is to allow these smaller organizations um, the ability to do that. Okay, understood. Yeah, and Alex, just to kind of uh, bring it all together, a lot of this was really focused on access and increasing access. Um, I understand you have some concerns uh, regarding some of the uh, uh, ideas or presentation that was provided, but uh, for the most part, Jim, uh, myself, and Bethany were really um, unified in, in most of these proposals. So just to provide background on that, that that's kind of um, what was probably the consensus, which is uh, pretty interesting, uh, considering sometimes I, I, I am not in line uh, with some of these proposals, but but I think for the most part, we're looking at scaling and then understanding how do we um, increase um, access uh, for for our for the public and also for those looking to practice. Thanks, Graham. Yeah, I agree with you. I think it's very important for us to focus on fair and accessibility. I think this is something that the BRC um, has focused primarily when it comes to reports and recommendations, and 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 so. I, I, I certainly am a huge proponent when it comes to uh, diversity and equity inclusion as well. Um, but also at the same time, I want to make sure we strike a balance. We can't just personally, I can't, you know, put all the eggs in one basket without understanding how, you know, those changes, you know, protect the general public as a whole. Right. I, I think for me, I just want to make sure everything is balanced. But thank you for for yeah, totally understand. Uh, highly respect your opinion. I, I told uh, Amy this is a huge undertaking, so I really accredit her for taking this on and being willing to uh, go to bat for us this early. Um, but 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 I think what you're seeing is kind of uh, really um, intricate work that I think you know we were prepared to open to the committee and uh, we're thankful for your feedback and uh, your balance that you're looking to strike because I think we're all pretty um, in the same boat and and we do want to find a consensus on how to move forward. Okay, so Alex, should I put this like uh, lowering the number of employees in that category of things that once we finish all of these presentations and go to lunch, maybe we come back come back and figure out what we do with these? Should I flag that one for you? Sure. Okay. All right. And any thoughts then also on the residency requirement before we move on to my last slide? Okay. All right. So can we go to number nine? I think Dolores had her hand raised. Oh, uh, sorry. Yeah. All right, I missed that. Hi, Dolores. Yeah. Oh, you're on mute. I, there okay. I go. I, I'm off mute. Um, back to the two previous issues, um, and I'm glad you're going to flag them for later discussion. Um, but I, I think I, I will want, one of the things I will want to hear is a, um, an, an explanation of how those uh, two previous changes, the uh, um, removing the residency requirement and lowering the number of, uh, of employees uh, in an organization, how those two things um, help our um, local, our California attorneys who are coming through the system um, and, and back to the, the diversity issue that Kareem is concerned about, it seems to me that um, when, when uh, organizations hire uh, attorneys from out of state, or who don't have to pass the California bar, they're not local people. So I just I just want uh, I guess a discussion about how how that helps us. How that you know it's it's sounds to me like yes it it helps organizations. It maybe helps some startups, um, but I'm not sure it helps us in the protection, not only the protection of public, of the public, but the protection of our own homegrown attorneys coming through 
the all the variety of law schools that we have available in California. So I, I just that's just a, um, a a question. And that was on the prior slide about registered in-house counsel, right? Yeah. Okay. About whether or not it takes opportunities away from California barred attorneys. Mm -hmm. That's it. Okay. All right. So um, I'm noting that as a discussion item. And so let me, um, we are on the military spouse attorney. So here we have a um, suggested change to uh, basically, um, it, it, it's a process change. So one of the challenges that has been reported to us um, that uh, from registered military spouse attorney applicants that have not been uh, successful um, is the fact that the declaration that's signed by the supervising attorney um, and, and that supervising attorney uh, declaration is a declaration where the supervising attorney has to attest that they will supervise the applicant and assume responsibility for the work that they perform. That, that, uh, that uh, declaration is due very early in the application process. Um, so uh, they have to submit that declaration along with their application and fees and so on at the initial onset of uh, applying. And so um, what that means for the registered military spouse attorney is that they either have to seek employment without being approved for the program in order to get this declaration, or they have to um, uh, identify an employer um, and apply before. Um, so they, they either have to do that or they apply for the program and have this outstanding component that they, still doesn't give them approval into the program because the de declaration is required for approval. So um, so the idea is uh, this rule change is to help address that situation. And what we are proposing, the staff proposed to create a, a like a two-step pr process. Step one is where the applicant establishes that they are eligible to participate in the program. This is when we get all of their uh, paperwork to ensure that they have a military spouse that's stationed in California, for example. Uh, we do their moral character background check. We get their certificates of good standing in their other jurisdictions uh, where they practice and so on. And so what we would do is collect that and conditionally approve that applicant um, before they get started. And that way they would have documentation when they go to an employer or uh, a, at least a status where an employer would know that they are uh, conditionally approved, conting contingent on getting this declaration from the supervising attorney. So, um, and then that's the second step. Once um, they find an employer, then they would submit this um, declaration and fully meet all of the requirements in the rule. So here, the suggestion is to um, add some language to the rule that would reflect this two-step process. Staff would work on that process um, behind the scenes if we approve this, so that, um, you know, for example, whatever notice an, an, a, an approved registered military spouse attorney would have, uh, we would work on that language um, so that they would have some kind of documentation when they go out and seek employment once conditionally approved. So uh, we talked about this with the working group. Uh, we talked about whether it posed a public protection risk. Um, and, and we think it'll help actually and strengthen because it would mean that someone wouldn't have to begin practicing or, um, or reach out as if they were approved already in the program when in fact that may not be the case. And so, um, uh, we also will uh, provide clearer material in the process. So that is what the um, request is here, is to approve language that would support this two-step processing uh, of the application. And the last item here is a correction. So in the registered military spouse attorney rules, I mentioned that they were uh, designed to reflect uh, the other uh, MJP category. And somehow in 2018, uh, we failed to add the language related to uh, suspension. So here we are adding uh, that language. And um, and so anyway, so that, those are the two proposals. That's um, everything. Uh, the last slide here is related to the motion. But it sounds like, Paul, you wanted to take a lunch, then we could come back and revisit some of the bigger issues, bigger policy issues. 
No, you're on mute. Yeah, I'm also wondering if we're going to have to start triaging what we can get done today. Um, so, um, yeah, so let's, uh, if we can come back, uh, does it look like we're going to have to send this back uh, to come back in June anyway? Sure sounds like it. This particular item. If, if that's what you're thinking, do you, are you saying you want to table the, maybe it's three or four areas of discussion to June? Yeah, um, I, I'm, I'm just worried about uh, triaging. Um, let me ask the group. Um, how many people can can say give us another half hour until 530 today is anybody who cannot. Okay, that's helpful. Um, uh, but I think we're going to have difficulty completing everything. So, um, uh, Audrey, we may have to have a conversation about um, mm -hmm. you, know, you know, what we need to do today and what can be put off. Um, because I, I don't feel like we've been wasting time at all. No, um, no, not at all. And, uh, a really great discussion. But, um, but we need, to, there's probably some business we do need to conclude. Um, and some that could be put over. Um, so let's, um, let's see, uh, can people live with, uh, I presume nobody's going to be going out to lunch, um, going to so be preparing something locally. And, um, and what if we take 20 minutes for lunch, come back, if you need to leave your video off because you're finishing your sandwich at your desk, um, we'll understand. Um, does that work? For, does that cause a problem for anyone? Okay, hearing none. So I have 1256. So how about if we come back, I'm going to, I'm going to take a minute out of your, your lunch, if we come back at 115. And Audrey, would, yeah. would you like to converse on the telephone about triage? Yeah, that's fine. I'll, I feel like Amy was trying to say something, but. Okay, go ahead, Amy. Well, uh, my thought was, um, in the sake of time, if if it helps to um, triage mine, we we go move to eligibility. Given that I'll, I'll I'll be bringing this back for further discussion, but I also don't want to lose sight of um, really good ideas right now. So um, I, I leave that up to your discussion with Audrey. Okay, we'll talk about that at one fifteen. Um, and you've got my cell number, Audrey. Uh, Amy's gonna message it to me right now. <laughs> Okay. Um, okay. See you back at one fifteen, everyone. Okay. Thanks, Paul. Okay. Lunch time. The time. Uh, there you go. It's on the screen.
Okay, um, let's get started again. I'll um, give you a little bit of time by explaining how we decided to rearrange the schedule. Um, it looks like David Lane will be off the hook for his presentation. Um, and because um, Ashley um, Silva Guzman was one of the um, working group members on the um, uh, eligibility standards package, and she has a has to leave uh, for a brief meeting or for a meeting this afternoon. We were going to put that towards uh, later in the afternoon, after all the educational standards items. Um, uh, hopefully, Ashley, that'll help you um, uh, to be able to be back um, to participate in that discussion. Yep, sounds good. Thank you. So, with that, Amy, if you want to. Um, uh, sort of uh, vacuum up the um, the feedback that you need to help you with the item we were just discussing. Uh, prepare that for a future meeting, uh, for the June meeting. Um, go ahead with that. Okay. So I'm gonna share um, this PowerPoint. I just wanna highlight <clears throat> the areas that I understood uh, required either further discussion or potential changes. Um, can you see my screen now? Okay. Um, so um, I think uh, the eligible to practice law was not an issue. Termination as part of the suspension sounded like as a uh, uh, didn't have um, any issues. I think Paul asked about, um, you know, what it served. Um, also clarifying when an applicant could start an application. I think there were no issues around that. Um, no issues around um, the failure to report um, a termination within 30 days becoming a reason for termination. Um, and it could, making sure that the state bar rules conform with the rules of court due to inactive status. So that's a clarification. Um, here, uh, the requirement that an applicant cannot have taken and failed the bar exam within the preceding five years of applying. So um, uh, I, I wanna bring that up. So um, I, I think that this is not suggesting that uh, what happens after, because I think Alex, what you've raised is somebody will not have to take the bar exam. This is very different from, uh, from what is being proposed here. Uh, what's being proposed here is that right now there's a requirement that uh, for both the registered legal aid attorney and registered military spouse attorney that they cannot have taken and failed the bar exam uh, preceding the five years of the initial application. And, um, and the idea was to eliminate this rule. Um, and I, I don't think anybody had an issue with that component. Okay. Now the supervision requirements, this is where uh, we are at. So supervision requirements for the registered legal aid attorney and for the registered military spouse attorney. Here, I think um, the issue that's being ex expressed is um, the accountability on the part of the supervising attorney. I think Alex has pointed that out and whether all the removal or the current proposal of eliminating some of the language in that rule, uh, whether or not that is, um, Sorry, I don't know how to do this without, um, uh, uh, oops, um, whether that is um, acceptable to the group. Um, what, no, sorry, whether the elimination of um, the uh, other parts of the supervision component for both of those categories, if that poses a, a concern to the group. So um, I, I bring that back to you, uh, Alex, I'm not sure if you've had more thoughts about ways to remedy this. Uh, one proposal would be just to remove the, the proposal and leave the rules as they are now. Because um, part of what the context you're providing um, and you're saying is that we should wait to see what the BRC uh, report recommendation, uh, the impact that it has um, with the um, with the uh, Supreme Court recommendation, if the uh, specifically that if the Supreme Court uh, response by uh, seeking either reciprocity or comedy that this might address some of the issues in this rule, or that's another pathway for some of these applicants and, and changes here do not make sense um, or are not necessary. Correct. Um, 
Okay. And the only concern with that is, you know, the timing, right? Um, it, it will take some time if, if, if that were to happen, right? Um, for all of this to come, uh, to spring into action, right? Um, for us to be able to, um, between operationalizing what that policy would look like to implementation would be some period. So um, in the interim, the question is, and what do we do? Should we keep that portion of the rules as is? Let me, um, uh, so I'm, I'm gonna sh pull those up. Sorry, I don't know why I closed them. And I will, um, it's okay. And I will share my screen again, just to remind everybody about the specific um, areas that we are talking about. Um, so here, so under supervision, um, the proposal was to remove uh, the supervision requirement that uh, uh, the supervising attorney approve in writing uh, here are the different um, documents um, and also that they must read and approve personally sign and these are other uh, legal documents. And so uh, this is a proposed rule and what I'm suggesting based on Alex's feedback is potentially just eliminating this rule from the proposal package. Um, how does that sound, Alex? Yeah, that's fine. I think also um, another sort of overarching issue here we sort of need to talk about, and, and I would defer to uh, to um, Paul on, on how to best proceed with this, is whether we should, you know, uh, vote on all of these as an omnibus motion, or should we vote, you know, on a per uh, proposal basis? Uh, what is what is the process going forward? Are we just thinking about well, here's all the all the changes, and then just vote them as a whole or in piecemeal? The motion has them as a whole, um, which is why I think it's important that everybody's comfortable with all the co components of this rule package. Yeah, I think the risk of doing that um, is that you know there could be changes where I I you know I personally would advocate for, but at the same time there would be changes where I just don't believe to be appropriate. Um, and, and, and so if we were to vote all of these changes together as a whole, um, it would take away my ability, for example, to clearly decipher the ones that I really, you know, support versus the ones that I don't. Um, again, I, I, I think that's really the risk, right? I, I think, as I indicated before, a lot of these changes really could warrant multiple hours of discussions because the ramification is so large that, you, you know, I, I can't just take that risk of just voting them as a whole. I do believe that a lot of these provisions make sense. Mm -hmm. At the same time, some just don't. But okay. when you put them and lump them together, um, it becomes very hard, at least for me, to support that provision precisely because you're right, it may contain something that I don't agree with. Okay. Um, well, and this is that forum then, maybe to identify uh, which ones you don't agree with, because if we were to separate those, we would need to know which ones um, you you have in mind that that you think should not be part of the rules packet or that need to be parsed out. Well, I like how um, I'm just looking at the agenda item. I like how everything is delineated based, you know, by topics. Right, you have one topic about clarification requirement, and then you have another topic on termination for not addressing suspension matter. I mean, each of that in itself is a motion, I believe. Right, instead of just lumping all of them as a single motion. Are we talking about, is somebody contemplating voting today or I thought we were just giving uh, direction and feedback to staff so they could <clears throat> come back to us maybe with a oh, okay. set of alternative um, proposals for a vote the next time. Uh, is that where you were coming from, Amy? I mean, I thought so, but then uh, based on what Alex, how Alex was responding, I thought, oh, maybe there's been a change since lunch, but, but. Um, I'm, I think we're both trying to do the same thing, which is trying to get at, um, so which areas, um, you know, regardless of whether we move with a motion or not, but which areas do we um, think that we, um, that re require like revisiting? So obviously there's the uh, supervision. Um, and is there another one? Trying to think. Um... And Alex, sorry, yeah. I just, want to follow, oh. follow up on the supervision as well. Sure. Um, what So uh, what about my suggestion of um, not making these changes? That is leaving the what's been redlined out, uh, in. leaving it out, leaving it in. 
I, I, I think until the Supreme Court says otherwise, we just leave it, forget the changes, because okay. what I don't want to do, and personally, this is my humble opinion, is I don't want to create a conflict between what we decided and what we passed and improved, and somehow the Supreme Court says otherwise. You, the, the risk really outweighs the benefits here. I mean, I, I don't see how hastily making a, a, a motion and passing it would do any you know, good for the public. Uh, when it really creates a lot of confusion if somehow you know what we passed through is not what the supreme court has in mind okay doesn't the court have to review and approve these changes they do well yeah. it goes to the board of trustees first i will believe right but it they does. so they would um it they would tell us if we got it wrong like they did recently um well and, and um and alex another question then um so Oh, ignoring these changes um, and putting it back in. Oh, sorry. Uh, you were going to say something, Paul. No, no. Okay. All right. So Can aside I, from... Oh, yeah, ahead. there's there's one more thing we didn't talk about, um, but but uh, during the break time, I, I did some homework. This is the provision on limiting participate. Oh, excuse me. This is on reducing the, um, on the number of employees, a qualifying institution. Yes. We call, I, I think, Kareem... Um, mentioned about the, the the rationale behind reducing from five to three employees. So I always wonder, you know, why there's a, a, a specific formula in terms of how many employees a qualifying institution has in this instance is five. So I did some research. Uh, apparently, I think, you know, part of me, I'm not an employment, I'm not an employment lawyer, but it is illegal in California for employers of five or more employees to discriminate against job applicants and employees. And so the fact that, and this is my speculation, um, is the reason why we have five minimal employees is really as a presumption that the qualifying institutions do not discriminate over these attorneys coming from out of states or military spouses. So, and, and this is just not a California thing. The, um, the, uh, uh, the Fair Employment Housing Act, as well as the Equal Employment Opportunity Act also require um, institutions with five or more employees to not harass or, or discriminate their employees. And so that's really the reason why there is a five or more employees in that provision. And so the net effect of changing, reducing the number from five to three basically would be that now we're allowing, now we're allowing institutions um, that don't necessarily need to adhere to these, you know, federal law to discriminate these attorneys coming from out of state. I don't think that was the intent but that is exactly the effect by lowering the number from five to three. Okay, and that's um, interesting because um, also remember the rule itself is one or, or the other. You could also have zero employees as, as long as you have a California supervisory attorney, but this is um, a very, it gets to your point though, Alex, which is this is the effect, not the intent. So um, right. the effect is that uh, that protection uh, would uh, would cease if it was lowered to five, less than five. Yeah, and I would never advocate putting any attorney applicants in that situation where they would have to, you know, work for a qualifying institution where they don't have to abide by any of the California discrimination law. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, that's a good point. Um, we can all bring this back. And Amy, I think on the list of things um, that are in a little bit of in question would be the five year limit if I'm okay. Does that sound right? That's what I seem to be hearing earlier. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And then and that was also Dolores's concern, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Um shall we move on? Okay. Thanks so everyone. So this will come back in um June. June. All right. Natalie, are you ready to present the ed educational standards items? Yes, I am. Hi. Hi. So, uh, so today I am on my own and I have materials, so you might see me looking right and left. It's just uh, to be prepared for you. Uh, Jim was involved in preparing the materials today, uh, just is not available to attend. Um, so I will go through and uh, try to do the uh, wonderful job that he would have done if he was here. Uh, so the first item is an item of notice uh, regarding uh, staff and administrative changes. 
And uh, there are not, um, there were not any personnel changes when the meeting <laughs> began, but uh, during the meeting, we learned that a permanent registrar was hired at People's College of Law. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit more uh, during the people's item. And then in addition, uh, two other items. The first one is that Irvine College of Law, uh, which transitioned to the distance law category this fall, um, has completed its most recent deliverable set of the um, fall syllabi for its classes. It's also already evaluating the courses that it first instituted based on piloting them and uh, trying to bring more improvement to that. You'll see Irvine College on the agenda in a short moment as well uh, regarding a move for their headquarters. And then following up on a motion from last month regarding Glendale University College of Law, uh, that school is closing and beginning to execute a teach out. At that time, there were several outstanding staff questions. And uh, fortunately, uh, shortly after the meeting, Glendale was able to complete those answers. And in addition, is working collaboratively with us on a question related to the annual report demographics. So we had questions with several schools about that. We expanded the categories this year. Um, a number of students did accept uh, Glendale's generous offer that you may remember um, for some students in the first year to take a refund and then begin their study elsewhere. Others decided to stay on and complete that first year at Glendale. Glendale will continue to operate until the end of next year. Any questions about those administrative updates? Okay, and there's no motion attached related to that. It is informational. Um, so for the next item, um, that is related to um, Irvine College of Law and under Rosenberg's rules, would it be possible to put up the motion uh, to focus the discussion and then I'll provide a summary. And I do believe that we have our Dean here. Yes, I see him in the audience. Thank you. So as I just mentioned, Irvine College of Law is uh, historically a fixed facility unaccredited law school located in Cerritos, California. This fall, they transitioned to um, in distance status. They're going to be permanent distance status. And you can see the motion here. They are requesting permission to change their headquarters and to move to a temporary location. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit more about that while we keep the motion up. So right now they're in a 6,000 square foot facility in Cerritos, California. Um, they propose uh, to move to Irvine. So Irvine College of Law will actually be in Irvine, nearby city, about uh, 20 miles away. Uh, because of the move to distance, because everything is online, um, they are proposing to move to um, essentially a, a hoteling hive, the airport executive suites. They'll be renting one office there, and they'll also have access to conference room or other shared facilities. Uh, the timing that they recommend, uh, they've executed a lease uh, already in principle. Um, it would begin uh, with this new occupancy on May 1st and would continue through um, about 10 months um, in total. Part of this is because the same owners of Irvine College of Law are also involved with West Cliff University. And uh, that school has additional space nearby in Irvine. So for the first time, those two, uh, those two groups will be close together. You might recall that West Cliff University uh, purchased the former Argosy related school, Western State College of Law, which is an ABA approved school. So it's operating that ABA approved school in a certain entity and then uh, the registered and accredited distance school in another. Um, and there may be a, an ability to share space in the future. Um, one thing that we noted in the staff memo is that if that takes place, it will be important for students to understand the difference in which school they're choosing, uh, but that's a future state, not now. Um, and then in addition, just a reminder that moves should be pre-approved. And in this case, the school has not moved, but it has already executed um, a contract with plan pending committee approval. Um, so since we know that uh, the school will be here in less than a year, we just remind the school and a proposal is to encourage them to let you know by the beginning of January, which would give you time to comment on the proposal, which is helpful just in general for workload, but maybe particularly important here if you are differentiating between two different schools with a single owner um, located close together, if that is what the school should choose to do. So um, 
With that, uh, I, I would like to recognize Dean Leal, the Dean of Irvine College of Law for up to five minutes of public comment, if he uh, would like to. Uh, yes, Natalie, thank you so much. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Yes, this is George Leal. I'm the Dean of Irvine College of Law. And I don't think I need five minutes, but I first want to thank staff for their uh, always very diligent effort to uh, confirm that we were um, consistent with the process that the committee set up in, in seeking this um, prior approval. Um, I just wanted to make one, a couple minor uh, corrections. Uh, the uh, law school has signed a, a full 12 month lease. Um, so we'll be uh, at this new location for at least a year. And in terms of uh, the status of the um, location that we're moving into uh, as an executive suite, I would, one, just like to point out that we're not the first um, first registered school and now a uh, Cal accredited school that operates from uh, uh, an executive suite situation. And in some ways, it's actually very much to uh, staff and faculty and most importantly, students um, benefit. Um, we learned during COVID, of course, that um, it was difficult to keep the doors open. We didn't have a receptionist. And so um, receiving mail wasn't an issue, but it was an issue from time to time uh, when students um, or applicants would submit things through FedEx or UPS. Uh, at our new location, we'll have you know, a, a receptionist uh, on site, um, regardless of whether someone's actually in the office uh, every uh, day during normal business hours. So that alone is a significant uh, improvement in the way we operate. Um, and we have access to all the uh, necessary, um, you know, the internet connection, frankly, will be better. And, and uh, so it's, uh, it makes a lot of sense in the world. You know, we live in an age where global mega corporations operate virtually almost with a remote, um, uh, well, a remote workforce. Uh, we will be doing something like that. I will be, this new office is significantly closer to my home. So I should be on site um, much more regularly than I have been over the last three years during the uh, pandemic. And, um, you know, for purposes uh, looking forward, um, yes, we hope uh, to perhaps um, work out of a Westcliff uh, campus uh, that would give us uh, a bit more space and, and, and access to, to classrooms. Uh, in the meantime, it's not really an issue. Um, in the last three years during the pandemic, we've only had about four or five classes that actually met on our old campus up in Cerritos. So that is the rare exception versus the reality that we now, as the committee does, operate you know, wholly virtually. And um, we're very appreciative of the Zoom technology. Um, and so with regard to uh, timing, um, we'll certainly um, abide by the staff's request. Uh, it is, uh, to be honest, if you've run a business or a law firm, you know, any kind of an entity, um, you know, knowing, you know, three, four, six months in advance of when, um, where you might be when your lease uh, expires and ours would expire next April, um, you know, you have to work with that limitation. But uh, as soon as we know, if we do, that we would have a new permanent home, uh, set, uh, different from the current new location, we would certainly uh, advise staff and submit the um, the same uh, request that we did this time in regarding and asking for the committee's prior approval. Uh, so I also wanted to thank uh, Natalie and staff uh, going back uh, with regard to our uh, transition from fixed facility to um, uh, our now distance learning program. I, I believe uh, through her able efforts uh, uh, and others at the at the state bar, you've uh, come up, I think, with a very um, workable, um, if a bit, um, if not onerous, certainly, uh, I certainly as a former regulator believe in the adage of uh, trust but verify in terms of having the committee and staff uh, keep a relatively close uh, eye on where we were during the transition. So with this move, uh, once it's complete, um, it'll be effective, uh, we hope by May 1st, depending upon getting computers hooked up and, and the like. Um, we will finally, I think uh, this is the last uh, element of this transition and will now for the foreseeable future be able to operate compliantly, of course, and effectively and much more economically uh, as a distance learning school. So thank you all for your time and attention with this matter and uh, I'll leave it at that. Okay, anything else to add, Natalie? Um, nothing further, available for questions. Okay. Um, Hey, can we put the motion back up? Natalie, yeah. this is this is Robbie. Can you can yes. you hear me, Natalie? Yes, yes, I can. Yeah. So I, I'm a little 
for a, a school that goes entirely distance learning like like this one and thank you george for your comments of course but now what a, it, what is the requirement is there a requirement that the school have a fixed office address i mean if george leal had said that the office location is going to be his dining room in his home would that be acceptable? I, I'm not sure. What What is it required? It requires a headquarters in California. And, uh, you know, we're doing the unaccredited rules review. And uh -huh. I think that you'll, you'll be hearing um, some more discussion about some choices about what the committee feels comfortable with in the future. Um, we are learning, um, as is most of the legal education community right now, uh, with distance programs. Um, and as schools choose smaller spaces like this, uh, we're learning about what's required for service of process, how they can properly represent their facilities, uh, what it means to be a more mobile school. Um, and so those are live questions that you'll be talking about very soon. Uh, but right now what they're required to do is uh, to have that headquarters here in California. Um, and uh, though this is a single office, um, huh. it appears to meet those requirements. Okay, so because uh, truly this is no more than a single office in a rent a suite floor with you know fifty other, and I guess they're 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 either sharing that single office or adjoining to a non law school that has the same owner. So that I mean it 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 it's barely a law school. I mean you certainly couldn't have a class here or. Uh, you know, it's it's renting a, a single office in a suite. But I, I, and Natalie, I just wanted to confirm with you that meets our current requirements for for a law school. I understand it to do so uh, because it is the headquarters in California and it does meet the needs for their students. They have been able to demonstrate that they can deliver their their um, their classes and also their student support online. Um, it might be a different issue if uh, the students were not getting full information, uh, but it is a choice as to what the committee wants to do uh, going forward when we consider in the future rules. But I, I would say that um, yes, right now it does meet the rules, but it then is become is incumbent upon the state bar as a regulator to make sure that our rules are properly applied to the school in the cloud. And that's Thanks. part of the reason, too, why we are um, spending a lot of time encouraging that timely registration required by the rules um, for, to register within 90 days of law studies so that we do have a way to reach those students uh, where the state bar can do so directly. Um, Natalie, in this case, they also have access to a shared conference room among all the, the suites, right? They do. Mm -hmm. And they provided, they were very candid about uh, what they were providing. They provided a flyer about the program. They provided a flyer of the optional services that they can purchase as they need. And you can see that conference room on the floor. Uh, the conference room appears to be large enough to hold a typical class uh, for that school, um, if not a full class load. I, I'm not sure what the specific availability is, but right now they, they don't have a need. Um, to use that classroom. They have been teaching fully online under a waiver um, since almost fully online since 2020 and their distance program is fully online. Uh, but it is something to think about. What is the presentation of a school with a smaller headquarters like this? What is the mobility? Um, and, and that may be a question for the near future. Uh, yeah. Mr. Chair, I have a question. Vince, go ahead. Uh, this kind of goes along with what Ro Robbie was asking. I I'm kind of curious, uh, not just for this school, but all distance learning. Uh, and well, especially uh, one like this where you're, it's kind of a shared uh, office space. Uh, what about, uh, you're talking about uh, student support. So that requires a certain amount of infrastructure like um, records and things like that. They need to be easily accessible if somebody has a question or you, you, you've you got to go back and look something up. Is that all kept online because you know, space is limited in these sort of uh, hive type uh, environments. Right now, most of the schools are storing their records online. So a challenge would be um, if the school stayed in its Cerritos headquarters, 
might do so. Uh, but Dean Leal might actually literally be working out of one office in Cerritos. So um, yes, those materials are online. Um, they're fully online. And for staff, for um, student support, we see office hours being online and anecdotally not necessarily specific to the school. The feedback I'm getting is that the utilization of office hours is actually up now that it's remote. Um, a challenge is that when there is an issue with a school, and I don't mean to suggest in any way that there's been an issue with Irvine College of Law, with everything in the cloud that way, it does limit our access. And um, it could be that the first thing that we find is an inability to access the records. So that's part of why one of the discussions that's going on at CS Bars right now is how to preserve records in time of crisis or um, in anticipation of possible crisis, some sort of a tuition recovery or data storage for transcripts, things like that. Um, because we do have that concern. It's not necessarily tied to the size of the school specific office, but right, right. it is tied to uh, being in the cloud. And if we were, if you were to ask the schools to also have a backup paper set um, in this current world, um, it might be almost challenging for them to do unless they had a specific subset, for example, keep a paper set of transcripts available. And that could be one of the recommendations from CS bars. Yeah, no, thank you. It just seems that the, uh, the you know, the tech has to be pretty robust in order to have uh, immediate access and, you know, storage space and that, that sort of thing. So th thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, any further questions for staff? Uh, Okay, somebody want to make the, this motion or an alternative motion? I'll move to uh, <clears throat> I'll move that the uh, law school provide enough. I'll move that the committee of bar examine the receiving file. The College of Law, Irvine's College of Law, request for a major change to the approval committee. David, I can save you from reading the whole thing. Okay, I move just, the motion on the screen. So move. Is there a second? I'll second. This is Robbie. Okay. Um, any further discussion? And let's take the roll. Dr. Bolton? Yes. Robert Brody? Yes. Dr. Cow? Yes. Alex Chan? Yes. Jim Efteen? Absent. Kareem Gangora? Yes. Judge Guerra? Yes. Dolores Heisinger? Larry Kaplan? Yes. Alex Lawrence? Yes. Esther Lynn? Absent. Bethany Peake? Absent. Ashley Silva Guzman? Vince Reyes? Yes. David Torres? Yes. Dr. Wilcoxon? Absent. Paul Kramer? Yes. Uh, so Natalie, the next item, if you can just describe it and then go ahead and present it. You're muted. So, so sorry. Okay, sure. If we could put the next item up on the screen. This relates to Pacific West College of Law. Um, this is a fixed facility law school that's located in Southern California. Uh, that law school suspended its operations as far as teaching on its own choice at the beginning of COVID. And prior to that, it had a very, very small student body um, in recent years. And uh, the closure discussions were, were considered, uh, but it was, it was just suspended um, during the time of COVID. Uh, they continued to file their annual report. We did check in with them each year and ask them if they wanted to go back into fixed facility setup or if they wanted uh, to use a waiver during the emergency period with COVID. Um, they did not. Uh, in 2022, something different happened. Uh, the school did not provide an annual fee or an annual report when it was due in November. Uh, we had spoken with them in September, let them know that was coming. Um, and then they also uh, stopped responding to email for a period of months. Um, you were notified of this in January and February. Um, we spoke with them. We were able to reach them in January. We urged them to come into compliance or um, to explain why they were not in compliance. They have since filed the annual fee, but have never filed an annual report. 
Um, they indicated they would do so by the end of March, but they never did. Uh, just prior to this meeting on Monday, the Dean contacted me and said that he intends that the law school will close, but he did not provide a date. Um, he also indicated that he wanted to know the options for the two students that had been enrolled at the beginning of COVID. And um, in describing their postures, it seemed that it was appropriate that the next step was um, an eligibility evaluation. And so we don't uh, believe that he has sent that evaluation in yet, but we, we want him to do so, uh, to be able to understand how to answer his question and present a recommendation to you. Um, also, because the closure proposal does not have a date, um, it cannot go forward as a closure proposal. We've asked him to provide a date or to provide a conditional date um, that would reference the two students, but he has not done so. Um, therefore, I would urge the, the committee to go forward with the staff recommendation. Um, the school has had ample time uh, to provide the annual report or to provide a closure plan, um, and it has not done so. So I would urge the committee based on the non-filing of the annual report to issue a notice of non-compliance to the school in the hopes of getting the answers we need um, to help these students go forward and to have certainty as to the status of the school. And I'm going to check and see if the Dean is in the audience. Um, there is a, I, I don't see a person with the name of the Dean or the registrar in the audience. I see a name unknown to me. Um, in an abundance of caution, uh, Audrey and Amy, should we check to see if this person is connected with the school? And this person is identified as Evans. Evans, if you are identified with Pacific West College of Law, please keep your hand up. Um, if you are not, would you at least temporarily please lower your hand? Okay, I, I don't see any. Right, so. Yeah, uh, if, could we just recognize Evans for a brief moment to determine whether they are connected with Pacific West? Thank you. And then uh, if you could unmute Evans. Hello, Evans. Are you connected with Pacific West College of Law? No, no. I'm sorry. I'm just trying to follow you. I studied UK law in UK. I have a master's degree. And uh, I okay. want to, uh, I'm just asking a question because I just follow Is you from the list. Is it possible he or she stepped away from their computer? OK. Thank OK, you. well, Evans, thank you so much for letting us know. We're going to return you to the audience, and then we'll continue on with our item. Um, are there any questions regarding Pacific West? Um, just why was I unable to hear Evans? Oh, I, I was able to hear I Evans. I was able to hear him, yeah. Me too. Interesting. I, I'm not certain. Perhaps keep us apprised, Paul, if you cannot hear any of the other speakers, because there will likely be speakers associated with People's College of Law the next item. Okay, are there any questions about Pacific West? And if not, is there a motion? Yeah, I'll, I'll, this is Robbie. I'll make that uh, motion that's on the screen regarding uh, non-compliance. I'll second that. Uh, I think Paul dropped off. I must have that it was his connection then. Oh, it may have been. We still have so, a quorum? Uh, we do. So can we, uh, I, this is Michael. Um, since Paul dropped off, hopefully he'll uh, join us in a minute. Um, can we take a, a roll call vote on this motion, please? Yes. Dr. Bolton? Yes. Robert Brody? Yes. Dr. Cow? Yes. Alex Chan? Yes. Jim Efting? Absent. Kareem Gangora? Yes. Judge Guerra? Yes. Dolores Heisinger? Yes. 
Larry Kaplan. Alex Lawrence. Yes. Esther Lynn. Absent. Bethany Peak. Absent. Ashley Silva Guzman. Absent. Vince Reyes. Yes. David Torres. Yes. Dr. Wilcoxon. Absent. Paul Kramer. Yeah, I'm back. Um, yes, I froze there for a minute. Thank you. Um, with 11 yeses and zero noes, the motion passes. Okay, so Natalie, if you want to describe and introduce the final item. Sure, thank you. I'd like to put up the motion for People's College of Law. It's a rather lengthy motion, but we'll be discussing the parts of it in pieces, and uh, we, we can leave it up for reference for the group if, if they so choose. And I'll note that there is a representative from People's College of Law here. So after I give an introduction, I, I will turn it over to People's College of Law for five minutes of comment or up to five minutes of comment across uh, their speakers. So uh, People's College of Law was placed on probation back in December. Uh, you discussed the status of People's College of Law back in the March meeting um, at the request of People's College of Law, which requested some clarification. And uh, based on that, uh, you're bringing it back this month for a couple of reasons. Um, of, one of the first things that you did was to impose the need to put more specific timelines on the actions that People's College of Law was taking. And this appeared to be a, an effective strategy in a number of ways. So for example, related to the law school's website, um, there have been issues with that being timely and uh, the school indicated that that was in part because volunteers were maintaining the website and it was in a rather challenging format. So uh, they are looking to hire an IT consultant and uh, redo that in a more user-friendly Squarespace platform. Um, this was discussed without action or without a completion um, since November, but by adding the timeline, the school did go ahead and engage a consultant. Um, they hoped that it might be done as soon as last Friday, so I'm sure that when we speak with the school today, they'll let us know what the status is and if, if it may even be finished. Uh, to be fair, that was an estimated date, and, uh, and they can let you know. Uh, another issue that you heard a little bit earlier, another issue is that there is a student who was allowed to take an alternative program. Uh, they were going to do an independent study potentially in their fourth year, um, but that fell through and the school did not have other courses to provide for that student. Um, after discussing it for quite some time and receiving many uh, requests verbally and in writing from the state bar, uh, for the first time in this report, we see syllabi for several of the courses um, and additional courses still under development. And the school has been urged to contact the student. Apparently they haven't been in contact with the student since uh, September. Uh, but they are creating the courses, and this is the first time we've seen that progress when those courses were needed uh, back in the fall of 2022. So we were, we were very glad to see that. Uh, there are still a number of issues uh, that I wanted to bring to the committee's attention today. Um, the first one is how to be clear uh, with the law school. Uh, we are trying very hard, as is the committee, um, but we are receiving repeated questions from the law school Throughout the compliance process in terms of the format, um, the committee has asked them and staff has reinforced to look at each element in the inspection report and provide an update as to that. Uh, we, uh, the committee documented that in December, we documented that as staff. It was discussed again in March. Um, the, the school came back and double checked uh, to see what was required, but this report does seem to be a little bit more in line regarding that. Uh, the committee gave an additional uh, several days for the school to file the report by April 4th, uh, but the report came back by April 5th. It's just a day. Um, and in other cases, I might not raise it to the committee's attention, um, but here it's just a matter of um, a series of issues of repeating questions or um, having miscommunications on basic issues um, that appears to delay their overall compliance. Um, so we wanted to make you aware of that. We've reminded the school that in addition to the discussion, it's also webcast and we do send follow-up notes 
And this particular month, um, it took a little bit longer to get the follow-up note out, but the school did participate in the discussion and the school did have the webcast available. Um, so I think that that is helpful to know. Uh, we also are receiving a large number of complaints regarding the school relative to the student body. Um, they have 14 active students and we've received an employee complaint. Um, we've received two student complaints, a continuing third complaint and a fourth complaint is alleged. Um, just the issuance of a complaint doesn't mean that the school is non-compliant in any way, uh, but this is a very large number of um, issues and concerns at a time when a school is uh, working hard to demonstrate its compliance. Uh, finally, before we get to the disclosure issue, uh, there are some overall concerns looking at their progress report holistically. Um, the first one is understanding what the long-term plan will be for the school, um, understanding if the finances are adequate, um, given the enrollment that's been in the neighborhood of just over 20 and now 14, um, the need to purchase books for the library, previously funds were identified, but more recently we understand they are not available. Um, also looking at the governance of the school, uh, we've always had a concern about the large number of students on the board. Uh, there's not a specific prohibition, but with a student body of 14, and um, five or more students on the board, um, then there could be a conflict of interest issue or a privacy issue. Uh, so that is important to know. And then finally, um, we need the committee's, uh, we need the committee's input regarding disclosures, but I've covered a lot of ground. So are there any questions on either of the major areas I've hit, for example, timeline, student complaints, a communication or future viability. Uh, Natalie, this is Vince. Are you at liberty, liberty to say uh, the type of uh, complaints? Um, just generally, they involve um, employment issue, um, questions regarding testing accommodations, uh, questions regarding fair treatment, or in the case of the student, who is requesting classes, um, having classes available to finish their fourth year. Okay, thank you. Okay. Okay, and then um, the final issue is related to student disclosures. So you made specific requests last month regarding disclosures um, and in two ways. The disclosure process is the most basic and most important element of the accreditation and the, and the registration process to inform students of the options and the limitations of attending a registered school. <coughs> uh, this is codified in statute. It's also codified in state bar rule and guideline. Um, it is the only such provision that discusses that the need is so important that if the requirements aren't met, students are entitled to a refund and the school's registration should be withdrawn. Uh, we talked a little bit earlier about records and keeping records. And uh, this is the sort of request that I would imagine for most schools, if I would call for these records, if I were to call in the morning and it were not an exam day or the bar exam, I would have all of the records by the end of the day. Um, here with this school, we began requesting a subset of records in December. Um, and at this time in April, we have many more records and this was the best submission so far, uh, but we don't have all of the information that we need. Um, and we're still not certain uh, why there has been such a lag in um, getting these disclosures back in certain cases. At least one is not signed. At least one to three were not distributed to students before they paid. Um, and changes in the report from last month to this month are not described. We sent a follow-up, uh, but the follow-up answers came today during this meeting. And so I've been reading them during the break and lunch. Um, and it's hoped, it was hoped that by giving the school additional time up front, that the disclosures could be very complete um, and this wouldn't happen. Um, and it's good for us to have a, lot, a collaborative conversation, but it's, con it's concerning when something is delivered during the meeting um, and might make the committee decide to delay um, when the schools really should be timely at this point. 
um, the school has been under notice to, uh, to make sure that it stays in compliance and demonstrates that since 2020. So uh, though the Dean is new, starting on September 27, um, rather than looking at the tenure of the Dean, please look at the tenure of the school working on this issue with a lot of success in 2020, uh, but less so in 2021 and 2022. I appreciate the um, improvements that were seen from last month. I think that you will too, uh, but taken in that larger context, um, there, there are serious concerns and we need some guidance from the committee as to how to go forward. Um, in addition, when they distributed their disclosures this month, um, they did so either on November 30th or December 2nd. They've offered both dates without evidence. And they did that just before the committee decided whether to impose probation or close the school. Um, so they're not required to issue those disclosures again. And we really wanna make sure that they have informed the students fully of the status and what they need to do, that they have not minimized it, that they have not limited it to saying we're working on it so that the committee, the students really know what's needed. Um, and hopefully we can get some information from the school um, about that. So that's what I have in, as an introduction and, and we have a representative. Now just can we hang on us. for one second before we recognize someone for people, uh, two of our uh, committee members need to exit because they're recused. Ah, okay. So just hang, we'll just hang on. Are you gonna take care of letting them know when they can come back, Audrey? I sure will. Okay. <clears throat> Just consistent with our past recusals, um, uh, I believe it's Alex Lawrence and Larry Kaplan are recusing themselves from this vote due to a personal conflict or the appearance of a personal conflict. Thank you. And with that, I'd like to recognize uh, People's College of Law. The speaker is unlabeled. I, I believe it's likely to be Dean Edith Pomposo. And so the person we're looking to promote is actually called People's College of Law. And they possibly may have brought with them the new registrar today. Can everybody hear me? Hi, this is Edith Pomposo. Good afternoon. We can. Yes, fantastic. Hi. Oh, thank you so much, um, Natalie, for um, a very comprehensive analysis and report. Um, I am quite impressed. Um, so I, I think this is um, uh, um, this is great progress. Um, this what it was in essence what I had been asking for all along. Uh, feedback, uh, specific feedback so that we have a measured progress of where PCL is. So I really appreciate that. Um, yes, there was significant progress made. Um, uh, curriculum development is one of my fortes. And so um, I, um, I I just uh, sat down and um, I just um, pumped out all the, the curriculum. Um, the other thing um, I also want to, um, I guess it could, I'll touch upon the different points that Natalie um, wrote. Um, let's, let's give you an update on the committee, an update on the website. Um, yeah, it was um, the, the website. We have two um, status reports from our consultant. And um, the website, we do have a finished mock-up of the website. It was transferred to Squarespace. And that was um, a decision we we decided would be best in order so that if we have any um, updates, rather than depending on volunteers, um, any of the administrators could go in, in and actually do the updates themselves because Squarespace is a user-friendly um, website that is is set up for this purpose specifically to do it yourself. So I believe in, in about, an, they just needed, as of two days ago, they just needed like one or two edits on the website. 
um, I'm, uh, I'm thinking it's like no, by this weekend, it should be ready and should be live uh, next week. We also transferred the, um, we had a problem with the hosting because the host was iPower. So now with this new host, the website won't go down. And I know that Natalie had, um, had um, uh, pointed that out before that our website kept going down. So we switched that, we fixed that problem as well with this new transfer to Squarespace. Also our email accounts were being hosted by iPower. <clears throat> Sometimes they were inconsistent, there were delays, but now um, all the emails are transferred to G Suite. Um, I made a collaboration with um, Google. Google for nonprofits allows uh, free email accounts for nonprofits. So all the students will be will have access to um, uh, their emails, all, all the staff, all the administrators without having to incur that $5 fee. So that's for technology. Uh, progress reports. Um, I apologize over the dispute of the April 5th deadline. I um I thought it was April 5th. Um, I well, I, I guess uh, the, the committee could now see my deficit. Um, I I would appreciate so kindly, please, as to get the instructions in writing. Um, I, I do have a, um, a deficit. I, I thought I, I had uh, transferred the notes in writing, but apparently they were incorrect. So I would really appreciate those. Um, uh, anything that I'm asked, I'm asked to do by the bar, if I could please get that in writing as well prior to the deadlines. And um, in terms of progress report, um, to provide a more specific timeline, and um, I will absolutely do that, and I will further incorporate evidence of uh, the sustained compliance per every category. Now that um, Natalie and I are on the same page with the attachment E, thank you, Natalie, for uh, emailing me the attachment E. Um, and um, I will, I, I have analyzed that. And um, if I have any further questions, I will make sure that I have, uh, I get those questions to you before the uh, deadline of May 1st. Uh, in terms of board organization, okay. Board organization. Um, the um, president of People's College of Law is not here to speak to that, but I can reassure the committee that um, that is uh, something that um, they that the board is looking into uh, taking um, um, uh, perhaps uh, um, looking into the restructuring of the board, taking uh, uh, leadership classes um, or self-development classes in terms of figuring out how to more adequately organize the board. And um, with the sale of the building, um, I'm not sure how much to divulge, but I um, we are getting close to moving. And um, that um, I'm not on the sales committee, the, um, but I can tell you that an offer has been accepted on the building. And um, we are now um, going to, we're looking into purchasing a new building. And um, the hope is to be able to do that quite quickly. So, um, and have the summer to get everything ready, including the library as well. So while in the past, the funds were not you know, readily available in, in liquid, um, you know, uh, in, in liquid form, but now with the sale of the building, we knew that these, these funds would be available. Um, and so, okay, that goes to, I guess that um, leads into the next topic of the funds and having the appropriate staffing and, um, the funds, the um, working capital needed to uh, run an organization like this. Um, so uh, the board president, the board have been working with a budget to be able to um, carefully uh, designate a certain amount of money for working capital and to hire additional staff. I know that um, we have what has been in discussion was um, well um, as as you know we we just at hired. this time I'll just ask you to please um, wrap it up or slightly over the five minutes. Oh, absolutely. So with those funds, we are looking to hire additional staff. Further disclosures, uh, we have been in and the next topic is disclosures. We've been in um, uh, 
we've been working with Natalie, I owe you um, a response um, to the next um, set of questions that you had in regards to the disclosures. The reason it takes a little bit longer is because we're very careful to submit the information. And um, I do not do things as a silo, but we have a model of shared governance. So I apologize if the responses to the bar take a little bit of time. I'm working within the constraints of the organization. And uh, um, so we have a shared governance model and my power is limited at times. But I do want to reemphasize that the PCL continues to work consistently and collaborative, collaboratively with the bar. And um, we are excited to um, stay in our compliance and to be more um, forthcoming with evidence and timelines where we're necessary and to continue to work with Natalie. All right, thank you very much. So the, so the motion is designed to address um, some of the issues, the key issues that we talked about today, uh, making sure that timelines are provided and in particular timelines are provided on priority items, such as a student unable to finish their education. Uh, making sure that all of the disclosure information is put forth. And for those who may have received a disclosure before the school was placed on probation, that they're clearly notified. Um, if there are any questions, I'd be happy to entertain them. This is Robbie. Uh, I wasn't trying to cut anyone short, but I'm happy to make that, that motion. Uh, no, actually, you can still make the motion and then we can have our discussion. I'm... Uh, under the new protocol we're trying to get used to. I'm, I'm really, I'm floored at just how much time the CBE has spent with People's College of Law. Anyway, I'm going to make the, the motion that's on the screen. Is there a second? I'll second that. Well, Dolores, thank you. Yes. Um, do we have any further questions for staff uh, or uh, discussion? Sounds like we're ready to vote on the motion then. Dr. Bolton? Yes. Robert Brody? Yes. Dr. Cow? Yes. Alex Chan? Yes. Jim Efteen? Absent. Kareem Gangora? Yes. Judge Guerra? Yes. Dolores Heisinger? Yes. Larry Kaplan. Abstain. He's recusing. <laughs> recusing, excuse me. Alex Lawrence. Same. Esther Lynn. Absent. Bethany Peak. Absent. Ashley Silva Guzman. Absent. Vince Reyes. Yes. David Torres. Yes. Dr. Will Coxon, absent. Paul Kramer? Yes. With 11 yeses and zero noes, the motion passes. Okay. Um, Paul, before we move on, um, yes. I'm, I'm not able to start my video and the no notice I get, it says that the host has stopped it. Okay. Yeah, I had to reboot finally to get my connection be consistent we can get we can bring that back i think there you are laura thank you I, I thought i had been bad and had been banished for a while <laughs> we're not that subtle you should be so lucky <laughs> okay so um i think we, we were trying to hold the um eligibility regs for Ashley's return. But I think that's, um, well, let's see, we could go through to the report from the director. Uh, chair, um, chair, chair, before you go further, can I ask um, uh, Natalie a quick question? One of the public comments relating to Northwestern, uh, um, the School of Law, I don't know what's going on, but can I put that on the agenda for the next meeting just so that I'm um, informed about what's happening with the school? Yes, absolutely. Thank you. So you're asking us to put that on the agenda so we can discuss it? Yeah, 
That's right. Okay. There's a public comment. And other than the school has issues, I have no other information as far as what those issues are. Uh, and I think the uh, committee needs to be informed about those issues. And so thank you, Natalie, for uh, for putting that on the agenda. Okay. <clears throat> Does that cause any problems for staff, Audrey? Uh, to put it on the agenda for June? Yeah, because there, there would not be, you'd just be reporting back to us, I guess, on your understanding of what's going on in light of the public comments. Yeah, I don't think so, Natalie. Yeah, I wouldn't expect any problem. We'd be happy to provide an update and we've already been in contact with the school and the student. Okay, and, and we'll notify the school that it's gonna appear on the agenda? Yes, as well okay. as the student. Great, but I mean specifically rather than just expecting them to read the thing. Yes. Yes, cool. we always do. Okay, um, so let's go. Um, let's go to the director's report. Um, we've we have basically decided that, in the interest of time, we're going to um, uh, move David Lane's presentation on unauthorized practice of law to our June meeting. But thank you, David, for all the preparation. It'll keep. <laughs> huh. Absolutely. Okay. Um, I will share what was posted of the reorg for admissions. Hopefully you can see this. Okay, so after months um, of looking at the work in admissions and, and Amy was uh, very heavily involved in creating this reorganization, so she's free to jump in. This is kind of the new high level structure of the office. Um, you'll notice that I'm now the director of the office. Um, Amy did send a note to everyone on the committee of bar examiners um, explaining her reasoning for wanting to take a step back. So she is now an assistant director. Um, Tara Clark is now um, an assistant director as well. And we have a vacant assistant director for policy data and aims, which is an entirely new um, new area um, looking at policy, high level policy and making sure that our student database, which we call AIMS, um, and our data and reporting out to you, to the public, to the board of trustees is clean and accurate. And under that area would be Natalie, obviously law school regulation is uh, highly involved with policy. So just making sure you see where everyone involved with the committee is now uh, reorged. So under Amy, um, Tammy, Campbell, um, who you know, of course, very well from formally titled operations and management is now in administration examination. So this area has sort of all of the aspects of the exam, exam development, the deployment of our exam at facilities or remotely, and then the grading of the exam. So Tammy is going to be over the exam administration. So that's, uh, like I said, how we deploy the exam through our facilities, uh, test centers or remotely, and then also grading. And then Lisa Cummins uh, is still in her same position over exam development. Um, Tara is now over Christina's area, which is uh, eligibility and testing accommodations now. And then there is a vacant position, her position that she just vacated with her promotion to assistant director for program manager of moral character. So this area, um, and maybe you can into it by looking at the three areas of eligibility, testing accommodations and moral character is involved with um, applications and case processing. So sort of moving all those day-to-day -day operations, um, things that can get very standardized and streamlined and hopefully even uh, more quickly uh, resolved um, under one umbrella. So this is the reorganization. I do want to say in light of what we've talked about extensively in prior meetings that this has no impact on the 2023 budget. It is a cost neutral proposal due to salary savings with staff vacancies and other operational costs. So if that was a concern, I would want to say that this is not going to affect the 23 budget. But it, it does create um, uh, an additional two assistant director yes. positions, which ultimately would cost more, wouldn't it? Yeah, but we are cutting some operational costs, and those are, were positions that were upgraded. So they were FTE that were accounted for, um, yes, at a higher level, but 
um, with our salary savings and other operational costs, this is um, a cost neutral proposal that doesn't impact the budget. Um, th this is Robbie. If, Hi, Robbie, if I can jump in. I, I wanna say two things. One, Audrey, congratulations working with you. You're, you're, you're awesome and uh, I'm excited to continue to work with you and I know you're gonna be great uh, in this role. Uh, I, I want to say something about someone who you know I'm proud to now say is my friend, and that's Amy Nunez. Amy replaced someone who had had the job for 30 plus years. And within six months, she had so grown into this job and was such a dynamic leader that uh, it was the best thing that ever happened to the Committee of Bar Examiners. Amy has shepherded the bar through some of the most harrowing and challenging things, whether it was a reduction in our cut score, COVID, the very first administration of a remote exam, changing our vendors, changing our general counsel, a return to an in-person bar exam, the introduction of alternate pathways, the Kappa group, the Blue Ribbon Committee. Now, the, each one of these things, I think would have been uh, jaw dropping for anybody. And these are things that Amy was handling all at the same time. So I, I just wanna say that for those of you that uh, have not even met her because of its uh, our remote uh, practice of late. She is the most personable, thorough, dynamic, smart person who will drop everything to answer a question. She's the most responsive listener, and she's just been such an awesome asset to the bar. I just want to say, Amy, best of luck in your new role and. Congratulations on just being so awesome. So thank you. Well, thanks, Bobby. I was going to say that, um, you know, I'm not going anywhere. I am still going to be part of admissions. I'm going to be wearing a different hat. You know, I've explained uh, to everyone, you know, um, uh, I've had to shift a few priorities for my personal life, but I am really, really um excited for Audrey. I'm excited for what's to come. I think, you know, what you hear today, it's evident that uh, the, there's a lot that is coming down the pike for the Office of Admissions. Uh, there's a lot of work. Um, we're hoping that this reorganization will help us uh, strategize a better way of approaching the work um, with uh, some leadership and finding ways of um, finding efficiencies of, of all of the assignments that we're bringing forth. Um, I, you know, I hope we haven't worn the CBE out with all of the rules proposals because there's more coming down the line, not so much for rules proposals, but assignments, as you've heard um, here today. Um, and you'll see in our work plan when we get there later. But um, Robbie, it's, you know, it's a bit a pleasure to work with the CBE. But as I suggested, I'm not going anywhere. So we'll, we'll continue on these. And thank you so much for your kind words. Yeah, I think uh, really reflective of your words, Robbie, is that Amy is not holding any, she's so invested, helped design this reorganization herself, including her own uh, stepping back. So I think that, um, yeah, it's a real tribute to Amy uh, and it only works with her involvement and continued involvement that the transition uh, period will be very smooth. So thank you, Amy, very much. I just want to uh, jump in here and say that I think all the, all the words true words that Robbie spoke go for each and every one of us on the committee. And uh, we don't have the time to each take our turn and say all the wonderful things that should be said about you, Amy. But uh, you, uh, I, I've been on the committee for a while and before you, and then you came on. And I know that you inherited a wild tiger and you took that tiger by the tail and you tamed that tiger. And so Audrey has the benefit of, of uh, inheriting a, a tame tiger now compared with what it was like when you came in. So uh, I'm sure she's grateful for that. And again, so I, I think I'm going to speak for all the committee members right now and say thank you so very much. And uh, we're happy that you're going to continue with us. 
Yes, thank you. So my pleasure. All right. Um, thank you. Is it maybe it's easier for me, Amy, just to quickly talk about because um, you have to share your screen with the work plan, right? Yes. So just a reminder that um, to all the CBE members, if you're interested in serving as chair or vice chair next year, the deadline to submit your resume and letter of interest is July 1st. Um, I'll be sending out an email after this meeting to remind you all interested applicants will need to submit a resume and letter to state bar staff and to the principal attorney to the chief justice, Sunil Gupta, and I'll share that contact information in my follow-up email, but just to make sure that everyone knows that's coming up and hopefully you're considering um, chair or vice chair. All right. So um, we skipped over the work plan. Yes. Because I was already talking and Amy has to share her screen for that. So she's back, back to Amy, sorry. Okay. I'm back and I will uh, share my screen right now. And Amy, let me just note that I was when I was looking at the minutes from the last meeting, mm -hmm. it just says we discussed it, but it says we didn't take any action. So if it's important for you to have some official action from the committee, um, we need to do that. Okay. Um, I don't know if it is, but. Yeah, you know, what we didn't do um, uh, last time, Paul, is approve um, the uh, work plan. Um, so I will um, uh, ask for that of the group now. And it's it's been agendized that way. So it's a discussion and approval. And the reason we didn't approve it is because we were looking at the list of the one-time assignments and trying to determine which ones we were going to tackle. So what's reflected in this uh, revised work plan is uh, the items that we decided uh, to tackle um, based on the last meeting. So um, bear with me, I'm going to pull them up here. Um, so one of the things that uh, we've talked about is um, this work plan is reflective of uh, a work plan of uh, initiatives that we're going to take on in the coming year, as well as uh, the goals. So it's replacing the goals. And what you'll see here is a combination of um, of that, the, most of the goals lie in the area that's called the annual assignments. That is things that we just take on as as part of our business um, here at, in the with the committee of bar examiners. So under one time assignments, uh, here are uh, you know under moral character, the rules revision, the two set, different sets, uh, the trainings. Like for example, we had the unauthorized practice of law training that's scheduled for today that will now move into June and bump some of these. Uh, to a later time. Um, and then as an our ongoing assignment, we um, conducting the, uh, for the CBE to conduct administrative reviews of adverse moral character determinations is on here. Um, so that uh, you can read along uh, here of the one-time assignments. We have the testing accommodation rules. We have, uh, this is the CBE response uh, to uh, this, uh, getting uh, comments in to the final report of the, the BRC. Uh, we have the examination uh, rules review. Uh, this is what has been added. Uh, this reflects the um, developing recommendations regarding certain components of bar exam delivery. This is related to the access Lex grant. This is something that we probably won't need to uh, make uh, recommendations on until 2024 when that project um, uh, is uh, comes to an end. But in the meanwhile, I will be bringing uh, updates on the Access Lex grant as, as that uh, study develops. Um, uh, and then here, examine specific testing accommodations to ensure that they meet applicant needs, uh, that they ensure uh, that we ensure they meet the ADA requirements and are cost effective. This is from that one time list that we decided to add here. So uh, that is what's included here. Under exams, I won't go through all of them. We have the same uh, uh, assignments that we talked about um, at the last meeting. Um, and they are things like, for example, the Supreme, Co uh, Supreme Court uh, report for each of the bar exams, our waivers that we see in closed session, testing accommodation appeals that we see in closed sessions and the like. Under o &M, we have the elimination of, um, I'm sorry, the review of the um, special admissions of uh, rules, review of the um, uh, rules related to exam administration. We heard these two today. We also have the eligibility rules that are forthcoming at, the, at today's meeting. 
We have the law office study and practical training of law students that has advanced uh, to uh, the board or will be in May. Amy, if you want to, do we have a sense then of the new timeline? Do we need to revise all those timelines then? Uh, yes, I, we will be revising those timelines. Um, and so um, we also uh, provide input, oh, uh, input on the board on the review of exam fees. And then we have the uh, uh, typical assignments that we have under O&M, the waivers, um, reviewing the reports related to the bar exam and the first year law student exam. Under ed standards, we did not have any uh, uh, new additions that we added as a result of our discussion at the last meeting. Here we have, um, in terms of one-time initiatives, is uh, the drafting of, uh, wait, uh, so, uh, oh, the recommended rule changes, I think, for registered law schools. So this is, wait, yes, unaccredited law school rules. Um, and then input on the performance of accredited and unaccredited schools. We have a few trainings that are coming up this year. Uh, the maintenance of um, law school engagement through participation in CS bars and law school council, as well as the law school dean newsletter. And then reviewing petitions under consideration as we do here at our CBE meetings. Um, regulating the law school uh, by monitoring compliance looking at progress reports and reviewing the minimum uh, cumulative five-year bar passage rate, uh, the MPRs. And so that is what um, we are proposing for um, a work plan for 2023. And so um, uh, if we could get a motion to um, approve these uh, for submission to the board, that would be great. Somebody want to make the motion? This is Robbie, I, I will make that motion. I'm, I'm looking at my notes from the last meeting, and I think this uh, is very accurately uh, includes that. Great. What we talked about last time, it's it's exactly dead on how we prioritize things. So uh, I'll, I'll make that motion. Second. 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 Uh, Mr. Torres, Second. Uh, does anyone have any questions or discussion? Amy, I have one question because yes. uh, I think you would be the best person to comment on this. You know, I, I might have been back in Appendix I days where we reduced the number of CBE meetings by one per year. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that was back when our meetings were in person. And mm -hmm. uh, uh, as I recall, there was an idea there was a significant cost savings involved, but gosh, I feel like we're doing so much and now that our meetings are remote, I wonder if if as part of this plan, do you think there's it's worth considering restoring that ex that meeting that for well for the whole existence of the CBE we had? Mm -hmm. uh, I feel like you know there are a lot of things going on. We're doing a lot, you know, there's some fatigue to these uh, you know, all day online meetings, uh, I almost feel like it, it's worth looking at. Well, you know, um, Robbie, that meeting was the April meeting, right? So there was a, a couple of years that we did, uh, eliminated the April meeting, but we brought it back. So um, oh. typically we would go from March to June, uh, I think when we, we went away, but we're here in April. So oh, okay, it's back. Yes. But a corollary is um, that we used to have more two day meetings, I believe. We did. And so maybe um, uh, carrying forward Robbie's suggestion, maybe we should just add that um, in order to have more time to fully discuss the issues. Because I, I can see a problem with having them every month. Uh, Robbie, uh, staff just gets on this roller coaster, roller coaster of preparing for one and then, you know, documenting what happened and then um then we're here at the next one uh it's uh it was a problem this year between the the march meeting that got pushed back by a week and then this one so um we can especially when they're via zoom it's not that much of an issue to to add a day is it well i think oh go ahead robbie oh, okay. 
I don't know. I'd I'd almost rather uh, have another meeting, Friday meeting. You know, the other committees and boards I'm on, we meet once a month. Um, maybe to present things to be reviewed the following month, so we're not getting things one or two days before. I don't want to put any more pressure on staff either. But gosh, these meetings seem to be filled with value to me. I mean, they really do not to be a boy scout about it but you know we're getting a lot discussed and decided and I, I'm, I'm really proud of, but you know there's only so much you can do and I don't want the staff to have to to rush and uh you know my bird and <laughs> well let me just say this I think that uh, there's two things that I want to point out one is that we're there's an effort to make uh, to create uniformity across um all of the sub uh, board sub entities so uh, making uh, two day meetings are you know there's a there's a um we already have like I think three two day meetings when we add the question selection and also on the days that we have question selection and calibration and so I think those are going to be the exception However, I think we need to go back and potentially look at um, maybe adding another date, but I, I just want to make everybody aware of like months around the bar exam, especially the July bar exam, which is our biggest exam, are very challenging um, for the staff because we have just had also the June baby bar. So um, I, I just think we have to be conscientious, but I think one of the things also we're realizing and learning from our from today and from all of the rules revisions that we've conducted that we've uh, discussed at even previous meetings is that we should probably dedicate two meeting times when we talk about the rules. Um, I know we brought it up, um, you know, uh, our, our goal was like, for example, to talk about what we we're going to tackle to identify volunteers at that meeting and then the next meeting we bring the rule proposal um it's sounding now like maybe the strategy should be we announce and kind of give an overview of, of the um rules that we're going to tackle um to seek volunteers the next meeting would be a, a basic presentation of the potential rule changes and then maybe the at the following meeting is when the cve would approve because that's how this is actually panning out so um i think that would help um the committee a little bit so that um, there's less uh, to absorb all at once. Um, so that's one thing we should definitely add to our next meeting components. But in terms of revisiting an additional day or an additional meeting, we have to take that back and look at really what we have on our plate and also where the dates are right now. I think it's really hard to commit to something like that um, until we take a look at um, when this would land. So, um, you know, I think Audrey um, could start exploring that. <laughs> yeah, and I think you're right. We've had a lot of wonderful content at our meetings and we don't want the committee to feel rushed in their review and decision making um which we, it's been reflected all day today so far right if we don't want you to feel rushed into voting on these rule packages we will we'll we'll move them to june right so we we hear you it's not anyone any one of our desire to um push these things through arbitrarily without a lot of your input Did we okay. do a roll call vote on the um, work plan? Oh, I think no, we're ready I think for we're, it now. Okay. Yeah, we were asking for uh, questions and comments. Okay. So are there any more of those? If not, Devin, please take the roll. Dr. Bolton? Yes. Robert Brody? Yes. Dr. Cow? Yes. Alex Chan? Yes. Jim Efteen? Absent. Cream Gangora? Yes. Judge Guerra? Yes. Dolores Heisinger? Yes. Larry Kaplan? Alex Lawrence? Yes. Esther Lynn? Absent. Bethany Peak? Absent. Ashley Silva Guzman? Absent. Vince Reyes? Yes. David Torres? Yes. Dr. Wilcoxon? Absent. Paul Kramer? Yes. With 10 yeses and zero noes, the motion passes. Um, are there re any recent developments? 
I think you cover what I would have said about the Blue Ribbon Commission next week already, so. Okay, uh, the one you might wanna mention is um, the uh, arrangements for accommodations and travel oh, for the yes. June meeting. Thank you. Devin is working on a room block for the June meeting. Um, so we'll be working with general services and we'll send you information about how to get on the room block with a hotel close to the state bar in Los Angeles. Okay, and for those who wanna fly, um, the dates are firm. So if, if you make your reservations sooner than the last minute, you'll get a better price, save yeah. us some money. Oh, and the room block will be just for Thursday night since it is a one day meeting. Okay, and uh, I'll try to, um, to make, if you can make your travel plans so that you get there early enough on Thursday so that we can all go out for dinner. And I'll, I'll put a, you know, out a feeler at the appropriate time to see who wants to, to uh, sign up for that. What's Thanks for the, dinner, Kramer. What's the next meeting day? June 23rd. June 23rd. Um, Alex, you may have overinterpreted what I said. <laughs> um, in fact, I think, Alex, it's your turn to buy the beers. Oh, I can do the beer. You can do the entree. Not a problem. Happy All right. <laughs> Okay, um, so that takes care of the director's report. Um, we can go back at some point. We're going to have to start on. Yeah, it's okay. Maybe we start without Ashley and, and see when she joins in because yeah, I, what her okay. commitment was run over. Let's go back to the open session minutes, because um, I have um, I have just um, I think it's one correction, and that is that um, Devin, you've got Judge Herman as attending. And he was off the committee by, I think by January, but certainly by March. So you need to take him off the list of uh, attendees. Otherwise, I didn't have any other corrections to the open session minutes. Okay, thank Does you. anyone else have any? Okay, can we have a motion to approve the minutes? So of moved. I'll second. second. Okay, oh, that no. was Vince, Vince and David. Okay, Devin. That wasn't me. Oh, no, it, was, it was David and Kareem. Oh, okay, sorry. Mm -hmm. Dr. Uh, who, was it Kareem that made the motion? I did. No, it was David that okay. made the motion. Kareem David and seconded. Kareem. Okay, thanks. Dr. Bolton? Yes. Robert Brody? Yes. Dr. Cow? Yes. Alex Chan? Yes. Jim Efteen? Absent. Kareem Gangora? Yes. Judge Guerra? I wasn't here, so I'll abstain. Thank you. You don't have to if you don't want to. You can rely on our assertions that it's um, accurate. All right, then I'll vote yes. Dolores Heisinger? Yes. Larry Kaplan? Alex Lawrence? Yes. Esther Lynn? Absent. Bethany Peak? Absent. Ashley Silva Guzman? Absent. Vince Reyes? Yes. David Torres? Yes. Dr. Wilcoxon? Absent. Paul Kramer? Yes. With 11 yeses and zero noes, the motion passes. Okay, um, so let's go back to um, item C under operations and management, action on the eligibility rules. Uh, who's gonna take the lead there? I am, I'm going to take the lead, Paul. Um, okay. So this is, this is the motion that is in the item in this um, fun way of sort of reading the last page of the book first, we are <laughs> looking at um, this rule set going out for a 60 day public comment. There's a policy written there also about uh, rule 4.17, which is about the um, five year expiration of the bar exam score. And there's a couple of amendments to family code and to the business and professions code proposed. 
And then there's um, an older committee of bar examiners policy that actually is already in the rules um, that we could repeal since that policy does not actually need to exist. Um, but also in the spirit of what we were talking about today, I am going to do the rest of my presentation as an overview of what um, the working group uh, Donna and I have put forward, um, but that it is the eligibility rules are arguably some of the most important rules uh, in the Office of Admissions, eligibility for licensure, for the California bar exam, for the first year exam, um, tied into our accredited and unaccredited law school rules. And it's a lot to um, go over. And um, there's a lot of input that we need from the committee. So I'm going to do our high, a high level presentation that I have. And then um, we are going to go through some of the different specific uh, rule changes more in depth at, at our June meeting. So let me get to that. Oops, that didn't work. No, whiplash. Um, okay, so this is a little bit of background about how we got here. So as you know, we've been talking about this in all the rule packages, right? We looked at the rules, the guidelines, the statute, procedures, the website. Something interesting that we um, also did a lot with this rule set, because obviously the eligibility rules are quite large and go across many different areas of the office. We looked at a lot of the old CBE motions and um, policies over time going back um, going back I think the farthest thing that I was looking at was in from 1997 um, looking at things that we have, or have not approved that have moved forward into the rules or have not moved forward into the rules or legislative changes as well um, in December um, staff gave a high level overview request for volunteers uh, Ashley Silva Guzman and David Torres uh, formed the working group that we met with over time from January through March. And then we have this package with the role revision proposals that we're discussing now. Um, initially, uh, before um, coming to the realization that it is quite a lot to have the committee review, um, going to ask the May Board of Trustees for a 60 day public comment period. Uh, now based on their schedule, that might have to wait until their November meeting. Um, just high level uh, looking at certification to the Supreme Court. That's part of this rule set that we looked at. So eligibility for certification. So for being admitted, uh, things like have to be 18 years old and you know, you know, have a positive moral character, pass the examination, et cetera. It also in these certification roles talks about compliance with um, California court ordered child or family support, which is part of the family code, and then also not to be behind on tax obligations, which is part of the BNP code. So in this sort of comparison for statutes to rules, um, part of family code provides for the issuance of temporary licenses for 150 days. That's in the that's in the family code already and something that we are already not doing, it sort of lends itself more to licenses like a temporary driver's license, not really contemplating a temporary law license. Um, so people who might be on a certified list for being in child or family support arrears uh, could be provided a 150 day temporary license. So the recommendation that is in the attachments uh, to this item is to actually um, recommend a modification to the family code section with a carve out for the state bar thinking that it doesn't serve public protection to have these temporary licenses. Um, and it's, it would be really administratively difficult for us to give 150 day temporary licenses and track and monitor those folks as well, whether or not they are not meeting their obligations. And then also um, the professional competence to them as well as uh, their conduct while they're having these temporary licenses. So the recommendation is to modify the family code section on the rule itself, recommendation to change compliance with California court order, compliance with tax obligations, to be not, um, oh, someone's got their cell phone ringing if they can, thank you, um, to not be identified on the certified list. So the family code itself talks a lot about this certified list and the lists are what the staff actually check to withhold people from the motion. So for transparency, better to change Compliance with with not be identified on the certified list. And please stop me. I can't see anyone's hands, but I can hear everything. So say something if you want me to stop um, at any time. Uh, legal education, rule 4.26. 
both in this rule and in the statute, it talks about studied law diligently and in good faith, but doesn't give any parameters as to what that means uh, for interpretation for our staff and for also for the applicants. So um, for registered law school,